my lovely, lovely, lovely imps. How are you doing today? I hope you all have had a wonderful week. I certainly have had a very, very interesting, fulfilling, and wonderful week myself. Page Punk Corp, Saul Gracchus, Baphomet, Glitch Master, Comrade Girl 2018, Nerodia, Roko Rance, Pedanticon, Louis Boy, Gay Fetch, Uncle Gumball, Shrazley, Token Brazilian, JS Masochist, Louis Boy, Ritcon 404, the one and only. Bakamono Dragon, Mistress Lynn, Ashmar, Dank, Catlord. I don't think that's correct. I think my camera is on. Girl with a guitar. I'm pretty sure my pretty sure my camera's on. The Spit Take, Nerium, Buck Moon, another board person, Zach Fletcher, Daniel Bullris, Felix B, Ron's KFC. Great to see you. Hope you're doing well. Marina! Love of Lyrics, Brady HD, Knights of Me, A Good Dog. What a good cover. Nasty Redacted! Aska! Great to see you both. Gaming Blows! That's correct, it is. Here you go, here's the source, Gaming Blows. Bam! What a great track, huh? Fabricio! Al the Healer. Gaming blows, you can fix that. Thank you so much, the spit take. I like this outfit too. I'm about to do, I'm about to shop for some new outfits. It's time to change up from the winter lineup um, for some summer stuff. What a great song. all for being here. If you are here and you have not yet pressed the like button, consider pressing that right now. see where I am. Wonderful. John Kick says, are you in Dune Messiah? I am. So I finally got, oh, really? Oh, what a terrible, what a terrible start. Ow. Um, so this one has Dune, Dune Messiah and Children of Dune. You can actually see on the back here. 
and it says, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I wish they had the whole thing, but still, it's pretty nice. And the cover is incredibly nice. The binding is beautiful. The print is beautiful. Um, these are... And they also have it has all of the appendices. It has all of the uh, has all of these um, the little glossary or terminology of the Imperium. It's great. So it's it's really wonderful. But yes, I am in Dune Messiah. I also have right over here the second set, which you can see. This one is also really beautiful. And that one has uh, God Emperor of Dune, Heretics of Dune, and Chapter House Dune. And it says, seek freedom and you become the captive of your desires. Seek discipline and find your liberty. A little bit of a, the, I, I find it interesting that the little bits that they have on the back is a little bit of a spoiler for the direction that the series is going to go. Um, but yeah, that's a... Uh, they are nonetheless very, very beautiful books. Um, those, book looks, those books look amazing. Yeah, so far it's been really wonderful. Um, I've been really enjoying Dune Messiah. I'm not super far in. I was waiting to get my copy of Dune Messiah. Um, I actually have two copies of Dune, two copies of Dune Messiah, but I was unable to find hardcovers of any of the other books. So I had to go with these options, and I didn't want to, like, I didn't want to sit down and start reading Messiah and blow through it really fast and then not have anything to move on to. And I didn't want to buy a bunch of crappy looking paperbacks because I don't really like paperbacks. Um, so I just waited a little bit and now it's all good. Oh, that's awesome. I've heard really good things about the Expanse universe retcon, but I've never gotten into the Expanse yet myself, but it, it's definitely something I'm considering for my next uh, big read. Uh, once I'm done with all these Dune books, which is going to take me a while for sure. Um, Violet91 says, I haven't even started the Dune books. I need to. I know the movies will be subpar compared to the books. Well, I mean, it's hard to adapt something. I mean, th people feel that way about the Lord of the Rings uh, movies as well. And I still think the movies, I love Lord of the Rings. I read the books before I saw the movies or I read one of the books, two of the books before I saw the movies. And I, of course, still love the movies. And I think the Dune movies are a really enjoyable watch. They make some decisions, you know, they're, ad they're adaptations. So they're going to have to, you know, they have to make some adjustments and whatever. But um, do you like the Bene Tleilax faction? Um, I don't know if I like them, but I find them interesting for sure. I find them fascinating. That's for sure. Um... Hold on. I'm going to actually change something. Hold on. I want to change my poll. I'm not happy with my poll. Let's do a new poll. There we go. This one's better. Much better. I think the movies are great ad adaptations, but Lord of the Rings will require several seasons long TV show versus the movie to get genuinely everything. And TV show adaptations are hit or miss. Yeah, that's true. I think the movies are better than the books. Some newer adaptations aren't good in regards to Lord of the Rings. Oh, I think the I think the Lord of the Rings books are amazing and the movies are great, but they're not better than the books. That's for sure. At least in my opinion um the movies of I, I highly recommend if you're out there and you like the dune movies read the books just read them they're in every library everywhere they've been around forever it's fairly easy to get a copy of dune and it is so worth it um there is so much to bite into uh it's a it's like it's like hooking the biggest sandworm you can possibly imagine and uh you should you should hook that sandworm. Get onto that grandfather worm. Uh, it's a truly enjoyable read. I've been having a blast reading them. Um, yeah, so do it. Um, there was another thing I was going to say, which is that... Oh, yeah. For Everybody's been talking about the eclipse, okay? Everybody's been talking about the solar eclipse that is going to be happening... Um, 
very soon, in fact. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to just give out a little PSA. Back in 20... What? Oh, crap. Was it 2017? Yes, it was 2017. Back in 2017, I went with my partners to a total eclipse zone. So we drove quite a few hours out into the middle of the woods here on the West Coast, and we went into the total eclipse zone. And um, I'm if you can get to the total eclipse area, if you can do it, you should go do it. This is a firm recommendation from me, okay? The experience of a total eclipse, it was so worth it. We were so tired. We woke up. We, we kind of planned it last minute. We didn't know if we were going to go. We got up super early, piled into the car, and took off. It was so freaking worth it. It was absolutely incredible, okay? Um, the experience is... It is eerie and rapturous, and uh, it is it is incredible. Okay, um, yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, you got to go do it if you can. It, it, obviously, if it's like not feasible, you know, don't stress it. But but if you can get there, and especially if you're gonna go see the eclipse, but you're in a partial area, drive over to the total area. I'm telling you, it is so worth it. It is like, it's so hard to describe. The world goes quiet and then the world goes dark and it's dark that is so eerie. And and you can't, it's, it's almost impossible to recreate, you know, just retelling the story because um, nothing can really prepare you for how weird it is for the lights to get turned out on the entire world. Um, you're just sitting there in broad daylight, like nothing normal. And then you, you just, the lights start going down and then it's gone and it's pitch. And it is a wild experience. Uh, if you can do it, go do it. Alora with the two gifted tier one subs. My goodness. Alora says, too tired to watch tonight. Hope you have a great stream. Looking forward to have the energy to do certain things with you and the imps in the future. Looking forward to it, Alora. Rest up. And thank you very, very much for supporting the show. Thank you. In more than one ways. Thank you, Alora. Shrasley says, I don't recommend coming to Niagara Falls to see it. They've been canceling hotel reservations en masse and charging triple to rebook. Um, yeah, maybe not Niagara Falls, but um, for us, we literally just stopped in the middle of, uh, on the side of the road in a national park. And there were other people stopped in that area. Um, we just kind of like parked off the road a little bit, got out of our cars and, and watched right there in like, we found a field. Okay. So it was like, we were driving through woods, woods, woods. And we said, okay, when we find the first like field area with a nice view, we'll stop there. And we found like, uh, the forest kind of had a break and there was a big plain on either side and then more forest. And we just parked near the little fields. And it was amazing. So, yeah. It's a pretty good idea. And and I'm telling you, you won't ever forget it. Yeah. For sure. So maybe maybe not go to directly to Niagara Falls, but just Niagara Falls is in a fairly flat area. Just find a place on the side of the road, get comfy, bring some uh, little folding chairs or whatever. And uh, make sure you get some of those those sunglasses that they sell everywhere the ones that are like the super uv protectant ones uh don't look at that shit straight on it'll melt your eyeballs mistress lynn says i've seen hotels all around here have stopped taking reservations our county is calling a state of emergency damn expecting a woodstock like event yeah, I do too, Gayfesh. Actually, we were we didn't um, we didn't get the shades because they were sold out around us. Someone gave a pair to us. They had a whole bunch of extras that they bought, and they said, "Hey, here's some," and we kept those. It's really nice. Yeah, I I don't know that it's necessary to book a viewing site or anything like that. Like I said, we just went to a random field.
Um, anyway, tonight, I wanted to give you all a little itinerary for what we're doing tonight. Um, oh, thank you so much, Chariot. That means the world to me. I really appreciate that. I'm feeling very high energy right now. I had a terrible migraine yesterday. Yesterday, I went out, uh, me and all of my critters, uh, we all went out to the Seattle Aquarium yesterday, and we had a really good time, but I started getting a migraine towards the end of our viewing experience at the aquarium, and it ended up being pretty debilitating. So I, like, basically crawled into bed and curled up into a little ball and then passed out for, I don't know, like 16 hours or something. I don't even know. I was so conked out. I, like, and then I woke up this morning and I was like, oh, it felt like I had been born anew. It felt so fresh. I felt so good. Nothing like a migraine to make you uh, appreciate your passive life. <laughs> anyway. Um, anyway, tonight uh, we have three things on the itinerary, okay? The first one is... We are going to be doing a little bit of politics, but politics in, an, in a different way than we usually do. We are going to be reacting to a video by a very, very, very large and very successful YouTube channel known as How to Cook That with Anne Reardon. Um, one of my favorite channels on YouTube, but Anne Reardon has uh, done an expose on an aspect of YouTube that I think is fairly important that we discuss. So we're going to be reacting to and watching and talking about Anne Reardon's YouTube algorithm expose. So that's going to be fairly fascinating and interesting. I have a lot to say about it. Um, I, I wanted to share this with you all. I, uh, I watched it on my own time and then I was like, we gotta talk about this on stream. So I'm gonna share it all with you. Then we're gonna have a discussion about it. It's gonna be awesome. Then, I'm going to be doing a long form review of Dragon's Dogma 2. I did a first impressions dragon uh, first impressions video on Dragon's Dogma 2. And then this week I sat down and I made a gigantic document about all my thoughts on Dragon's Dogma 2 so that I could do a long form structured review on Dragon's Dogma 2, and we're going to do that tonight um, because I have a lot to say about the game. I care about the game a lot. I really enjoyed the game, but I also had a lot of things that really drove me kind of kind of batty. And uh, so I wanted to do a very detailed, thoughtful review where I talk about all the issues that I had, the things that I liked, the things that I didn't like, why I liked them, etc. So we're going to do that. Um, this was what I promised you all I was going to do. And then finally, we're going to do some, at long last, we're going to do some Dark Souls 2 together. It's been way too long since we've done Dark Souls 2. We got to beat Dark Souls 2 because we have a whole bunch of other games on the way. Um, we've begun setting up. We've begun, we've begun getting the organization necessary to be able to play Demon Souls on stream when we eventually get there. But we got to get through Dark Souls 2. And I've been having a good time with it. We just haven't played recently. So we're going to do that tonight, which should be pretty great. Um, yeah. Let me just read this one real quick. Niana with the tier one sub. Thank you so much for supporting the show. It really means the world to me. All right. Got your links, Mr. Krabs. Niana, thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. And also, definitely, you should clean up your room. It will make you feel really good when it's done. Um, I know sometimes it can be really hard to get over that, like, initial hump to start a task. But once you get started, it'll be done quick. And when you're done, it's going to feel awesome to have it done. It'll be out of your mind. Why does the video always freeze on Demon Mama's channel? I don't know. Um, it sounds to me like you might be using a ad blocker. Um... Uh, YouTube has been cracking down on ad blockers um, and we have to run ads on the show or else we don't get any visibility. So uh, consider whitelisting YouTube for uh, so you don't have the freezes anymore. That should be the only reason I can think of. I can't think of any other reason. Um, yeah, I don't know. 
Connor54 asks, would you consider playing the Remedy games on stream? Yes, actually. I've really wanted to do that. That Maybe we'll do that after. We have to do... We have a bit of a lineup. We're going to do Dark Souls, then we're going to do Metal Gear Solid, and then maybe after that we can do Remedy. But then we're talking like a year or more down the line. So we'll see. Um, we definitely should. Fortnite says, nah, I'm getting freezes and I have premium ad block and plus ad blocker turned off. Huh, that's concerning. That's really concerning. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I, it could be something on my end, but I don't think so. I don't have any dropped frames or anything like that. Let me take a look here. Let me see if there's anything getting dropped. No, nothing, nothing in the, uh, nothing here. I don't know. Stream health seems fine on YouTube side. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, it seems to be maybe a YouTube problem. Don't know. I wish I had full control over it, but I don't, unfortunately. It happens with all YouTube lives. Okay, that makes sense. I didn't hear about that, Joseph Bros Tito. I don't even know. I didn't hear about it in the first place. I didn't even know there was a monkey torturer. That sounds uh, terrible. That sounds pretty bad. I, I mean, I guess good that they got stopped. <sighs> hmm. I don't know. Maybe maybe there's a maybe YouTube reacts to certain bit rates, but I set my bit rate ex at exactly the YouTube recommended. So if this is them, maybe maybe clearing cookies or something might help. I don't know. I don't know what to say. Anyway, um, yeah. Anyway, um, whatever. Um, Timestamp? 33 minutes, 25 seconds? Anyway. Uh, what else was I going to talk about? Oh, yeah. I was going to talk about Bellatro. I played the awesome Bellatro um, uh, a song at the very beginning of the stream, the one by Dom Palombi, which if you didn't, if you didn't check it out, go check that out. It's uh, you can just, it's really great. Um, Bellatro, I've been playing a bunch of Bellatro. Um, Bellatro is the, they call it the poker roguelike and I love it. It's amazing. It has an incredible visual style and uh, it has really good, it has a really good song. It doesn't have a whole lot of music, but it's one theme is really, really good. And I finally achieved some things. This won't make a whole lot of sense for most of you, but for those who have played Bellatro, when I first started playing Bellatro, I, uh, I set out with a goal to, cr to figure out how to w make a working and winning high card deck. Meaning, uh, you're basically playing one card that scores. You know, like a poker hand, uh, you might have, you know, two pairs, three of a kind, four of a kind, full house, flush, straight, uh, royal flush, that type of stuff. And then there's a, a, a card called high, there's a, a hand called high card, which is basically you don't got anything else. You just got one card that's the highest. And uh, I made it happen yesterday, no, day before yesterday. I figured out how to make a deck that lets you win the entire game just playing high card. And it was sublime. It was, it felt so good. It felt so good. Uh, if you haven't played, um, 
if you haven't played Bellatro and you're interested even a little bit in like uh, card games uh, with with roguelike elements, you should check it out. It's super fun. The basic idea is that you're playing video poker, but you can cheat basically in all kinds of different ways. You can get Joker cards that modify basically everything you can imagine about the game. Um, they do all kinds of special effects. They let you break rules and all kinds of stuff. And you can add cards to your deck. You can stack your deck. You can you can get tarot cards that let you do all kinds of special effects. It gets very chaotic. Um, and your goal is to keep winning against more and more ridiculous challenges uh, in, in the game of video poker. And it is... It's amazing. It's really, really good. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I've, I've really been enjoying Bellatro. There's not much else for me to say about it except that it's, it drips with style. The game looks and sounds and feels amazing. Uh, and there's so much to it. So it's a really, really good game. I've put probably, I don't even know. I've, I've played a lot of it. Uh, it's a, one of those games you can just kind of sit down and, and play while you're doing other things. Um, are the tarot cards better in Binding of Isaac, though? Well, Binding of Isaac is a completely different game, but, I mean, they're pretty awesome in Binding of Isaac. Um, yeah. Gila Monster says, Hey, Retcon404 just dropped his Budokai video. Put it on your watch later. Yes! If you have never gone and checked out my, uh, my amazing friend, Retcon, we have been friends for over 20 years. Uh, and Retcon runs an amazing channel uh, doing video game and anime retrospectives um, called Retcon 404. Uh, if you have not checked out his channel, you, you should go right now. And if you are into Dragon Ball Z, Budokai, any of those games, or, or uh, that anime or any of the related games, you should go check out his video that he just released on Budokai right now. Because it just, oh, I mean, put it on your watch later and check it out because it's a video. It's not a live stream, so. And we go do that. Uh, Retcon's channel is amazing. Retcon puts a ton of work. Yeah, actually, I can just link it right here. Hold on. I just got the notification for it just a second ago. Here we go. There you go. Here's the link. Bam. Everybody, go put this on your watch later. Bam. Bam. Ian M. asks, what was the game that you were talking about called? Balatro. B-A-L-A-T-R-O. Balatro. Uh, it is very popular right now as it just released into full 1.0 release fairly recently really good game go check it out you'll enjoy it it's like it's also a very cheap game it's like 15 bucks or something uh you'll get a lot out of it yeah Bellatro's incredible i've been having an amazing time with it i i, I have a feeling they're going to do some uh i i have a feeling they're going to do some updates to it in the future to add even more but there's already so much in it yeah very very good Awesome aesthetic, by the way. The video poke, they go, they lean 100% into like a vaporwave esque uh, video poker aesthetic. Incredible game. Mr. Inedible says, Can you tell Retcon it's time for Iron Blooded Orphans? Uh, you can tell Retcon. As last I checked, Retcon was here. So, you should do that. I don't know what Iron Blooded Orphans is, but but I but I'll I'll let your let your word get delivered. It's a Gundam. Okay, that makes sense. M maybe Retcon four hundred four isn't here anymore, but anyway. Um. Niana says, I've never wanted to make a mood more than to do a skin for Bellatro into Leshy's cabin. Actually, very fitting. Very fitting, in fact. Now, I don't know if this is any good, but there's another game that came out recently that's called Bingle Bingle. And Bingle Bingle is, is a roulette roguelike. With a slightly different aesthetic, but I do think it's funny that they came out like fairly close to one another. And I might, I, I haven't played Bingle Bingle yet, but I got to check that out because um, it sounds fun. And it's a funny name, Bingle Bingle, right? Yeah. 
Here, I'll make sure that uh Here, I'll make sure that message gets to Retcon, okay? There you go. I'll deliver it since I don't know if Retcon's still here. Brianna Huffman says, I love how Demon Mama introduces us to so many interesting games we'd probably never find otherwise. Well, it's one of the things I truly like the most. It's not like the heart and soul of my channel, um, I guess, but uh, gaming is really important to me and it makes me feel really good when I hear that someone played something that I recommended and then they ended up liking it, which has happened a lot. Um, so I'm more than happy to share and I play them. So I figure may as well tell people about it. Bellatro is one that I've just been enjoying quite a lot. Gravel Queen says, uh, Pathologic 2 is just nine bucks right now, by the way, which was a great Demon Mama recommendation. My ultimate recommendation, perhaps. My favorite game of all time, Pathologic 2, and it's only 10 bucks right now. That's pretty amazing. Andrew Blood with the $10. Thank you so very much. Andrew says, I'm so sorry. I tried to donate on your site. I need to figure out what the problem is. In the meantime, have what Google will leave for you. Well, thank you for supporting me regardless. I really appreciate that, Andrew Blood. I don't know what the problem is. Um, if if you're still having issues, please email White Forest uh, via the support button on the website. If you're having a technical issue like that with the website, just shoot them an email and they should be able to figure out what's going on. Um, there have been some changes to the PayPal API that have led to some glitches that we've run into um, with, but it, we have, we fixed some of them. There might be ones that slipped by. Of course people like you, you do, you, you, you're amazing, Retcon. Anyway, Pathologic 2 is incredible. And if it's only nine bucks, you should go play it right away. It is uh, like like literature, okay? It is the literature of gaming. It is a true masterwork. Um, a true masterwork, okay? By the way, if you are here one more time and you have not pressed the like button, now would be a perfect time to press like. Perfect. Joseph Bros Tito says, you and Vosh are my top two favorite streamers because you not only do politics well, you both give great life advice. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that a lot. Um, I, I don't do that much life advice, but I when I do, I want to make sure it's something I actually know what I'm talking about with. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that it lands home for some people. I've been through a lot in my life. Uh, so, you know. Um... And, uh, yeah. D DM with the elusive gem of clean your room. I mean, I did technically say that today, didn't I? Calliope, great to see you. Hope you're doing well. It is Saturday, isn't it? This week flew by. Honestly, I felt like this entire year has been flying by out of my control. Uh, I feel like I'm not on top of anything, but, but yeah, I've been doing a lot, not to say that I haven't been doing a ton. I've been doing quite a lot this year and, uh, but it just feels like it's like whoosh, blasting, blasting through too fast, way too fast, but such is life. Some years move so slow and others move so quick. This is a quick year. Last year was a slow year. I was just like, wow, I can't believe 2023 is still going, you know? Pathologic Classic HD is amazing. It is incredible. It's just harder to recommend than Pathologic 2 because it has so many quirks and it's an a significantly older game there are a lot of people who have who just won't 
can't access that in the same way. I still will recommend it to people. Um, I really had a great time with Pathologic Classic HD, but it it actually it operates on very on very different design principles, and also, um, you know, it's it's a it's a pretty goddamn hard game. Uh, more even harder than Pathologic Two. Pathologic Two is very punishing, but not necessarily the hardest game on the planet. Um, Pathologic Classic HD is really difficult. It's really really difficult. The Eurojank is real for sure. Mayfleet DX3 says six more weeks of evangelical Christian college, college and six more weeks of conversion therapy. I am overjoyed the school year is almost over. I, well, in that case, I hope that the year goes even faster for you. That sounds terrible. And I'm really, really, really sorry you have to deal with any of that. That is, that is terrible. Uh, yeah, I, I do not blame you for wanting the year to move quicker. That sounds agonizing. Stay strong, okay? You'll make it through. You'll outlast them. I know you will. I think it's the election 2024 anxiety that's making it seem quick. Weird thing. I don't have a whole lot of anxiety about the election. Um... Certainly not more anxiety about the election than I do about society right now generally. Um, I feel like my political anxiety, like the, the, the parts of politics that have been stressing me out, has much more been um, Morbin. <laughs> Morbin. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> Guys, remember Morbius? Morbin? <laughs> um, no, but... Uh, my political the things that have been stressing me out politically has been significantly more focused on uh just the way that that the right wing is increasingly obsessed with trans people and pushing even harder that that makes me more nervous uh the way that the right wing of america right now is behaving generally has me more concerned than the election itself and of course uh alongside all of that uh the 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 general disdain for the fact that the American liberal uh, establishment has completely dropped the ball on Palestine um, and that there are still people starving and dying en masse and it is this country's fault um, in a very big way. Like, uh, like Israel is obviously the perpetrator, but that America and the American government and the current ruling liberal establishment are the ones making it possible. They have aided and abetted to an incredible degree. Um, yeah, it's pretty bad. Holy shit. Brianna Huffman says, in the past week, I've been F-slurred in public twice and had an evangelical trapped tract dropped onto my table at a coffee shop. Feels bad. I, I'm really sorry about that. It's, some of these people, they're, they're really getting activated. Um, the, the right-wing culture warriors are freaking the fuck out. Uh, and it's been really upsetting me, the degree to which, uh, you know, and maybe, maybe, I think part of that, I guess, is downstream of election of it being an election year. You know, they get extra activated when there's something like that on the table. I guess just for me, I haven't been thinking about the election portion that much. I've been thinking more about the right wingers going crazy and uh, ramping up a culture war against people like me. Part of it, you know. Retcon404 says, lol, I got called the F slur at a yarn store and I just stared at them because I was a foot taller. Good based. Chad move. Lykeen says, 
it seems like there's a lot of proselytizing in general lately. Half my YouTube ads are for local churches. Very annoying. Yeah, there has been. Um, I mean, there is a there is a huge surge of um, Christian nationalism, which is largely uh, the purview of evangelicals. Um, and they've been very activated recently. Um, and uh, yeah. I, I, it makes sense that they're going really hard and that they're proselytizing a lot and that they're probably going to reach some people and pull them into their uh, cultish and nightmarish worldview. Um, I think we should push back against this and that also we should learn uh, how to uh, help people uh, recognize and become resistant um, to these things in advance. There's also a, a big problem, which is that... Um, Cults and manipulative, horrible religions do very well for themselves when times are hard. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, they, can, they can amass material needs and hold them behind recruitment. Um, churches are able to move incredible amounts of money, especially big churches that are already established. They can move incredible amounts of money. They can provide material needs for people who are hurting, who are uh, starving, who are cold. And they can provide that and they can have it so that you get that, but you have to listen to their world worldview that even if they don't literally say, we won't give this to you if you're not a Christian, that it's sort of implied that there's a a fist hidden underneath the hand. You know what I mean? Um, and yeah, it, it, when, when the, when people are struggling, when there's a lot of uh, fallout uh, from an event, like say a pandemic, um, even if there is some, even if the, you know, economy in some regards has managed to bounce back, there's still tons of people who are severely struggling and whose world has changed. And churches are, many churches are in a position to start recruiting, uh, to uh, offer people a, a uh, uh, you know, a, a, a Faustian bargain that they can't necessarily turn away because they have needs. And I think that one of the things, one of the reasons why, you know, when I talk about politics, I have a huge focus on people building networks of material aid for one another, of building social frameworks by which they can help one another, by which they can empower one another, is that that alone um, makes people resistant. Um, people having a social network around them that can help them when they're in need, that can help them when they're hurting, that can provide for their needs means that, they'll, they, that they're much less likely to fall into a position of seeking out the aid of these manipulative organizations. Yeah. Retcon 404 says Maine just narrowly passed a provision outlawing militia training camps after an open neo-Nazi tried to open up a camp in Springfield, Maine, where he advertised training in firearms and bomb making. I actually heard about that guy. I actually heard about that guy. I didn't hear about the provision. Uh, that's great. Um, holy shit. Another board person with the $5 super chat. Thank you very, very much. Another board person says, uh, the standing tension going on in my country gives me the same pit in my stomach that you get playing Dragon Age 2 the first time. Underrated game. I I have not played Dragon Age 2, so I don't know exactly what you mean. Uh, but I believe you. That sounds really tense, I guess. <laughs> That's wild, Mr. Krabs. I didn't know that. Retcon 404 says, yeah, one of our state senators said, well, we have to protect the neo-Nazis' free speech. Fuck you, bitch. No, we don't. And teaching people to build bombs isn't free speech. Conservatives are freaks. Yeah, it's wild, right? Um, <laughs> it's the First of all, the double standard on free speech is incredible, right? It, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the protesters... Who was, who was protesting Stop Cop City just had their bail denied because they owned a book 
that is sold at Barnes and Noble. No joke. They owned a copy of his, of an invisible committee book, um, and that was used as justification to deny them bail. And then you have politicians, on the other hand, on the flip side, they're like, okay, lefties protesting a, a flattening a local wetland for a cop military training facility. Oh, you have the wrong book. You're staying in prison, bitch. And then on the other hand, you have a, 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 a bunch of politicians going, well, you know, we can't impinge on their free speech, their free speech to organize a radical militia with the goal of overthrowing the U.S. government. Ooh. So stupid. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And yes, uh, no, people should not uh, play nice at all with these psychopaths. Uh, Neo-Nazis uh, do not deserve your respect. Uh, they do not have a respectable worldview. Their worldview is one of uh, demented uh, violence, uh, conspiratorial nonsense, and uh, ultimately a, a, a complete opposition to everything that anyone who isn't them believes in. Quite literally. There is... There is no one who has shared interests with neo-Nazis other than other neo-Nazis. They are the, like, the ultimate domineering faction. They, it is their way or the highway. We do not have to play with them. No, we don't. Chariot says, wow, serendipitous Dragon Age 2 reference? Literally getting research material for an essay about that game right now while uploading my playthrough. Spooky. I'll check it out. I've never played it, but... A lot of apples with the gifted tier 1 sub. Thank you so very much. That means the world to me. Thank you so very much. Arguing the bad faith free speech thing is so exhausting. Oh, you mean like where, uh, where, where right wing, far right people will be like, oh, it's, it's my, it's my right, it's my right to to construct a genocidal agenda that damages real people. That's my free speech. And then while at the same time they're like, it's not your right to free speech to say I'm gay in public. It's not your right to free speech to talk about your life experience as a gay or trans person. It's not your free speech to wear what your free, free speech and expression to wear what you want. <sighs> yeah, it's, it's terrible. Yes, it's because right-wingers don't believe in free speech. None of them. Not a single one of them even remotely believe in free speech. What they believe in is domination. They believe that there is a correct order to the world and that you or anyone who disagrees with them are the ones who are below and they're the ones who are supposed to be on top. And if, and they'll say whatever they want. They'll bend anything they want to that worldview. It's very, very pathetic. Pedanticon says, hope, hope this is a long stream. I've got sewing to be done. Well, yeah, you'll, um, you'll, you'll be happy to know this is probably going to be a stream on the longer side of things. So there you go. Bribble says, hey, Demon Mama, my dog will be 16 in June and she just got diagnosed with dementia. The vet says she has about six months left. I got her when I was five and I'm 21 now and it's making me really, really sad. How is Yoda? Yoda is doing very, very good. She's taking her medicine regularly. She has not had any more episodes. I'm really, really hard. I'm really, really sorry to hear about your dog. That is not easy to deal with at all. Um, but it sounds to me like you have lived a wonderful life together. And at 16, your dog is a venerable old age. And uh, just make those six months or more as wonderful as possible. Um, yeah, thankfully my dog is is doing pretty good. Yoda's doing great. I I know that it, you know eventually it will pr she'll probably start having issues again, but for now the medicine is helping her a lot. So yeah. Well, that would be good. I, I hope that it does, Bribble. I really hope that it does. Grady HD says, I am the gay world order. Based. 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 
Mr. Krabs123 says, Demon Mama, have you heard that a bunch of GOP members are dropping out of the Republican Party and making their majority slimmer and slimmer after Trump officially took over the party? And yeah, their party is basically broke. Um, yeah, um, I, I haven't heard that there were a bunch dropping out actually yet. I don't know. I must have missed that story, but um, it doesn't surprise me. Um, the Trump cult runs the GOP and it will run it into the ground or it will. Uh, or it will run it into a position of um, ridiculous, uh, dangerous desperation, or both. It will likely be both. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uncle Gumbold says, I think a couple of House members resigned, so now their majority is won. Hopefully, they'll, pi they'll pitch their own majority into the trash. That'd be amazing. Um... Yeah. The the thing is, the more desperate that the Republicans get, the more dangerous they're going to be for a while uh, before they tire themselves out and flop on the ground panting and uh, and pathetically exhausted. Uh, but the reality is that, um, I mean, Donald Trump was just, I just read an article earlier today about how Donald Trump is talking about how he will deport um, students, uh, that are here on visas, uh, if they participated in any, uh, like pro Palestinian or anti Palestine, anti Palestine genocide, uh, protests, like just outright, just, yeah, if you're here on a visa and you, uh, you, appeared in any sort of demonstration whatsoever that disagrees with me, I'm going to deport you. It's just craziness. Like, and of course there's the whole project 2025 thing, which we still need to do the full segment on that. There is the, the Republicans are getting more and more brazen and their options are dwindling. And so they're having to resort to just say, yeah, our goal is to get enough energy to try and take over by force punish everyone who ever disobeyed us whatsoever, make your lives hell, damage you, kill you, anything like that. That's where the Republicans are at right now, and it's only going to get worse as they uh, as they damage themselves more. Um, the reality is that Donald Trump was a uh, an obviously corrupt, extremely unpopular, uh, grossly negligent, incompetent moron, and everyone saw that. Everyone in the goddamn world saw that, but his cultists, they can't, they, they can't accept that. Remember the copium huffing? Remember when we did the, 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 the unbelievable copium huffing stream, uh, where we just went to the Donald and other right-wing subreddits immediately after the election, and we saw how deranged and desperate they were they cannot they simply cannot deal with it it's funny they always they always use those clips of like the screaming sjw going no but imagine that but times like a thousand all of them were the screaming crying sjw it and they have been they haven't stopped being the screaming crying sjw that they so hate since the election it's wild okay um, and my God, uh, <laughs> they're, co they, they can't cope with the idea that Donald Trump wasn't popular, that people didn't like his style, that people didn't like, uh, the, the decisions that he made, that his, de the decisions that he made were foolish, dangerous, outright in violation of the, of the documents that he swears to uphold. Um, yeah, uh, so of course, um, you know, they, they have to double down. They have to just be like, oh, it's a conspiracy against us. Actually, it doesn't matter. We have to figure out how to write things because there must be an evil force. Um, they, they'll say things like, oh, well, the fact that Donald Trump isn't winning must be because of Satan. It can't possibly be that Donald Trump was a screaming buffoon who an openly and obviously corrupt uh deranged buffoon with most of the world's interests not in mind and that people don't like him it has to be that satan is actually pulling the strings it's pretty bad
Mr. Krabs123 says, also, since the conservative Supreme Court took away Roe versus Wade, it's been hitting Republicans where it hurts, even in deep red states. Yes, it has. Um, as it turns out, uh, for all their bloviating, uh, the right to abortion in the United States was a fairly popular right among uh, an enormous portion of the population. Um, you know, conservatives have always been very loud about it, but that doesn't necessarily reflect reality. And the truth is that people like the ability to have bodily autonomy. And the Supreme Court uh, going so far out of the way to uh, dissolve that protection uh, lost them a lot of popularity. And it's, it's, it's interesting that it might just lose them the election regardless of how unpopular Joe Biden is. Um, Joe Biden has been dropping the ball nonstop in 2024 since the uh, since since October 7th, when he's just put his foot in his mouth constantly over the very important issue uh, of Israel Palestine. Um, uh, he's it's still possible that he just completely obliterates Trump purely because so many people are like. Yeah, we don't like Biden, but Donald Trump and his cronies got rid of our right to have basic bodily autonomy. And yeah, yep. As it turns out, that might just be enough to do it. Who knows? Hard to say for sure, but seriously. Anonymous Platypus says, also fuck the Dems for not um, not enshrining Roe v. Wade into law like they promised for years. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good sign then. That's a very good sign. Oh, really? Could it be that? That would be so silly. <gasps> why would it be doing that? I've had that issue before, but why would it be doing that? That's so interesting. Okay, I'm gonna have to look into that. I've had that issue with other applications, but why would it? I wonder. Wouldn't that be a driver-related thing? Anyway, I'm going to think on that. Thank you, Danny. appreciate that. Nerodia says, A couple of swing states have people putting abortion rights ballots initiatives on the 2024 ticket. It could be very bad for Trump in those states. The Dems need to go so hard on that, it's unbelievable. The Dems should be talking about it literally endlessly at every opportunity that they possibly can. It is one of their biggest strong points, and they should be talking about this constantly in every swing state. I did hear about that. Joseph Bros Tito says, Demon Mama, did you hear about Trump's takeover of the RNC? He's basically bankrupting the Republican Party. Yeah, he's saying that like the, the GOP has to help him pay his legal bills, which is incredible. Um, and uh, But also totally in line um, with what happens when a, a deranged fascist cultist takes over. Yes, the, he, and he's right. If they don't, if he ends up in in enough finan in enough financial and legal trouble, um, they're done. They've bet all they they bet all of their shit with him years ago. They bet everything on him through the entire Trump presidency, and then they bet everything. They doubled down uh, with all the January six stuff by backing him in all of that in all of that nonsense. By not by refusing to like distance themselves, they threw in and they're stuck and they are reaping what they sowed. Um, yeah. So. Yep. Yep. His daughter-in-law oversees the RNC now? I believe so. Hold on. I want to make sure I get the position correct. Um, RNC votes to install Donald Trump's hand-picked chair. 
That was earlier this month, or that was last month, sorry. Michael Watley. And then Lara Trump, yep. Lara Trump is, uh, is uh, Donald Trump's daughter-in-law, is the co-chair of the RNC. So it's his own daughter-in-law and a hand-picked loyalist are now the the highest positions in the RNC. They are, it is a Trump cult. There is no difference. And, and anybody who tries to tell you that there are, that are, there are like Republicans that are like not members of the Trump cult, yeah, that's great. There are Republicans who aren't members of the Trump cult, but literally the the Republican National Committee, the, the, the heart and soul of the Republican Party in America is completely eclipsed by Trump. So uh, either they got to adjust and stop being Republicans or, um, yeah. Yep. It's pretty bad. What if uh, Steel Griffin says, what if this is just a whole big op just to destroy the Republican Party? Um, it's not an op. It's just what they do. This is what this is what fascists do to themselves. They are incapable of grappling with reality. They are so lost in their mythos, in their great man theory, that they can't adjust. And as a result, they uh, make incredibly dangerous, pricey, and st most of all, stupid political decisions. Um, yeah, that's just how it goes. The, every fascist movement in history has struggled with this aspect, and they will always do so. Because as it turns out, um, betting everything on one guy who, one, like, syphilitic maniac uh, is not a good idea, even if he appeals to your most, uh, uh, you know, fervent aspects. Yeah. It's just, it's a question of how far and how bad things will get. Like, if Donald Trump manages to win the presidency, can you imagine what that would look like? Can you, first of all, can you imagine what that would, what that would say to everyone everyone worldwide about american democracy um but secondly what that would uh, what that would allow him to do and the fact that he could if he wins the presidency again there is no questioning his power whatsoever uh he will believe um that he can do literally anything without without any consequences and he's not getting any sharper okay so I want you to think about what a guy who already has a God complex given unbelievable power uh, would do. And the answer is fuck up everything really bad as hard as possible in the most deranged ways imaginable, often tinged with very specific cruelty uh, directed towards racial minorities and sexual minorities. I do think that is, um, that is something that... So I think that if Joe Biden wins in 2024, uh, the Republican Party is going to have a reckoning. And one of two things are going to happen. Either the party is going to completely explode and there won't be really anything functioning left out of it. Um, or uh, the party will basically go into a cocoon and change into a completely different party that looks nothing like the one that we recognize now, but just bears the name of the Republican Party. I think, at least personally, I think the first option is a little bit more likely. Um, and I think what's going to happen then uh, is that the Democratic Party is going to get full up of a lot of deranged conservatives. And what that's going to mean is that and, and the reason why I think that this is the case is because I've been watching something similar to this happening over the last few years on online, on the sort of cutting edge of politics. You know what I mean? Where 
uh, or of political discourse, not politics itself, but in the cutting the cutting edge of political discourse, where the most politically interested people all engaging and talking about one another, something that you've seen is more and more liberals becoming extremely conservative while still insisting, no, I'm not a conservative. I'm a Democrat. You, how dare you say that? I'm a progressive even. Um, there are, in fact, fairly recently a... Um, a fairly well-known uh, progressive political candidate recently announced that they no longer believe in progressivism. It, was a, it wasn't even a how I left the left. It's a how I left progressivism because progressivism is too woke or whatever. Um, when in reality, it was people just getting mad at the fact that they continually were going out of their way to do genocide apologia um, uh, uh, by their own volition. Um, and I think this is something we're probably going to see. I think that uh, if Donald Trump loses, which is a possibility, uh, I think it's a very real possibility. I don't know, you know, I, I think there's, I think it would be horrible, the worst outcome if he wins. Um, obviously, I think giving power to uh, Donald Trump in his current state after he lost, after his party has further radicalized uh, is terrible and a horrible outcome uh, a possible outcome. But if he loses, um, I think something that the that the left of the political sphere, the, the act, act, people who are actually thinking about how to take politics beyond neoliberalism are going to have to become a lot better at, at conversing with and identifying differences under the liberal umbrella. For the last four years that I've been online, there's been this like perpetual... Um, like cool kid desire for every liberal to call themselves a leftist, no matter what their politics actually, re you know, reference. And it's because they identify that there is an increasing amount of people who identify with a left label. They, they believe themselves to be left. They have a politics that is more than just neoliberalism. And so now there is this internal to the Democrat, internal to the leftosphere, including liberals. There is this, uh, this attempt to, um, I don't know, to build a conservative leftism. It's very silly, but it's a real thing. And I think it's only going to get worse. If the Democrats become the only meaningfully viable political party in America because the Republican Party blew themselves up, which it's looking more and more like they're doing right now, um, then lefties are going to have to learn, first of all, how to grapple with a... Uh, uh, conservatism that is dressed as liberalism, conservatism that is dressed as leftism, and and also know how to, not just know how to um, argue with that, but also how to just actually meaningfully identify it. You know what I mean? Which right now, they are not good at that, okay? Uh, the left has, one of the biggest problems of the left uh, in the last few years is getting taken advantage of by a, a fucking grifters and i don't just mean grifters in the sense of they just are there for money but i mean people who are deliberately attempting to exploit a left label in order to sell a politics that is completely doesn't resemble that for their own gain um i would say I, the most extreme example of this is fetterman you know what i mean where fetterman uh but fetterman is too obvious um there are so many other examples of this um, that I can think of, uh, right away, but, but yeah. Fetterman was more like a Trojan horse. He's, he's almost too obvious. You know what I mean? Where Fetterman just said everything that progressives wanted to hear, got into office and immediately started changing course. Um, that's a little bit different. I'm talking about people who continually try to sell themselves as progressives, um, to try to sell themselves as like, yeah, no, we believe in the same thing. That's why, you know, I think that, um, you know, like we should be, you know, uh, torturing drug, you know, drug users. You know, I think, uh, I think we should, we should expand prisons and expand the police actually. And we should crack down on civil, civil, civil rights protests. That's really common. Have you guys noticed that? Like how common that's gotten in the last two years of progressive personalities just suddenly becoming law and order types pretty interesting right
Hypno Amber says, I don't think we can count Fetterman quite like that. He's a totally different person after his stroke, and I'm a neuroscientist and stroke advocate, so I know this is a thing that happens. I don't think he's a completely different person. Um, and one of the things that I do think that people overlook because they were wooed by his other progressive positions, uh, Fetterman has been a Israel advocate, like really hardcore pro-Israel advocate for a really long time. It is true that some of it could have been due to his stroke, but I don't know him personally, so it's really hard for me to say if he actually became a totally different person. The reality is, though, that he, he does have a political history of supporting Israel. So he's been a Zionist for a really long time. And people looked looked the other way because he had other pr progressive positions. But we have to be a little more careful than that. Th this happens all the time. The left especially has been really bad about being willing to look the other way on really important issues. And I'm not talking about, like, being super purity testing or whatever. Like, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Um, I'm talking about just very, very cut and dry issues that a progressive, a person who's genuinely progressive or, or, or left should be able to go, that's a big red flag for me. And the left is bad at it because after the Bernie burnout era, the left got desperate. The left felt, ah, oh, no, shit, it's the end. I guess we got to start, I guess we got to, I guess we got to lower our standards really low and look at what it's got us. Jack shit, jack fucking shit. So, yeah. Yep. All I'm trying to say is that um, a very real possibility for the future is the collapse of the Republicans by their own, by completely by their own volition. And as a political necessity, more and more conservative people will be wearing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the cloak of liberalism and Democrats. And we need to get better about that. Prosy Rosie said, what would you do if you were in office? Like, what do you mean? Like in what office? Um, I, <laughs> That's a very tough question. Uh, I would have to sit down and think about that very, very significantly because uh, I don't know. If I was in office all of a sudden, if I became the, the emperor of the known universe, uh, that's a pretty tough decision. I don't know. I, I uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a, like a fantasy situation for me, right? Like, I don't know. I, I don't imagine, I don't believe that I will ever be able to hold office uh and not, nor is it something that i seek you know what i mean that's not my way of moving in the world uh i think that the structure of, of institutional politics tends to bind people uh it it people who seek out office by necessity have to continue to shore off more of what they actually believe and the vision that they actually want because the institutions are designed for people to slot into a machine that that continues certain things i don't know I don't believe that if suddenly I, I gained office, like, I don't know, people, a bunch of people wrote me in for a position and I had a position, I would, I guess I would do whatever I could. Uh, and that's the only answer anybody has, right? Uh, if I became president tomorrow, uh, the first thing that I would do is uh, write um, as many executive orders uh, in favor of, of uh, the little guy as possible, okay? I would be writing executive orders, uh, government stipends immediately out to uh, all trans people in the country, um, government stipends um, out to um, any, any like all, every single public clinic and healthcare provider in the country. Uh, I would immediately outlaw uh, insurance companies uh, that would be an easy one, easy peasy. All of them go out and under. And uh, the faster that I could do that, the better. Uh, that way that they couldn't recover from their stocks crashing, uh, even if they assassinated me, which they probably would. Um, let's see. Yeah, poverty line raised so that everyone, like basically everyone is. I would uh, immediately dissolve the U.S. Mint. I would dissolve the, fe uh, the Federal Reserve. 
Um, and uh, I would uh, pass, I would, uh, by executive order, I would dissolve all patents on, uh, on medicine. They have it. Oh, I'd fire all of the, um, I would fire every single uh, federal employee on the border. Let's see, what else? Hmm. Ah, I would change the, uh, the I would change the national federal uh, bird from the bald eagle to the black capped chickadee. Um, let's see. I would change the capital of the country uh, uh, to be in Maine. No, I would fire the entire CIA immediately. No, actually, I have a better goal. What I would I would order half of the CIA to kill the other half of the CIA and the other half of the CIA to kill the other half of the CIA and whoever won would be awarded with the uh, rulership of the new CIA and in reality that would actually just be um, a, a trick and whoever lived would just immediately get dropped into a big fire pit. Yeah, CIA, the CIA, yeah. And, and the reason why I know it would work, by the way, is because one thing that CIA, the like, the CIA psychological profile, they're all been programmed to love promotions. So the I, they, they would sit there and they go, ooh, ooh, I, I, we should all be working together to take down this obvious threat to our existence. But I love the idea of a promotion. So then they would they would listen they would they would be tempted and enough of them would kill each other that it would work out in the end. Let's see what else. Any other interesting changes that I would make if I became president tomorrow? Um, ban all cars and mandate rail, rail travel for everyone? Hmm. Hmm. Banning cars. Uh, I mean, banning cars seems like it wouldn't really work. What I could do, I know what I could do, though. I could pass a, um, I could amend the tax code such that cars have an abundantly high tax and uh, so that you can write like 300% of all of your, um, all of your like public transit costs off on your uh, taxes. So um, yeah, so t cars would become unbelievably expensive and uh, you would be able to make money from the government by going, by supporting public transit. That'd be great. <laughs> yes, first and first says convert USD to mama coin. There would be one mama coin and I would have it. And everyone, the way that you get, the way that you like, that we budget from there on out would be people get a little shaving of the one mama coin. It's like, I, they have to come into my office and I go, Shh, and they're like, oh, thank you.
Can the American anthem be changed into all Nickelback albums playing at once? No, the national anthem will be the penis music. Oh, oh, we've already got dissenters, I see. Silver Tarot 25 says, so put a high tax on rural people who have no access to public transit and need a car to get groceries, go to work, to go to the hospital. Dungeon, 10,000 years dungeon. 10,000 years in the dungeon, executive order. Silver Tarot 25 goes in the dungeon for 10,000 years. Treason. Can't believe it. People offer me, people ask me what I would do with ultimate power and immediately start griping. Do you not understand? You gave me ultimate power. The emperor of the known universe is what you assigned me to be. Have you abolished prisons yet? Hmm. I've changed my position on prison abolition because I can no longer abolish prisons. I'll let everyone currently in prison out. But then I have to maintain prisons in order to put people who annoy me in YouTube chat into them. The drama frogs get their own wing, but the drama frog's wing would just be one of those spike traps from Oblivion. So you won't decriminalize all drugs? No, I'll do one better. I'll subsidize all drugs. All drugs are subsidized. What about bail? We won't need bail because the only people that will be in prison are people that I, that I say go to prison. So like they won't get bail. They won't need bail because they're, they're not getting out. Unless I decide, so, you know. Yoda gets to be the presidential pet. No, even better, uh, Yoda Yoda gets to be, be like 50% of the cabinet roles will go to Yoda. Celestial art time, I'll do one even more. Um, all of the food in America goes to Native American, to the Native American reserves first, and then they get to distribute it out to the rest of America. So basically Native Americans all across the country will get to decide who gets food and who doesn't get food. Just that's the rules. Um, and I have a feeling that a lot of people will, a lot of people will be more open to redrawing those boundaries Re renegotiating those treaties in favor of uh, in favor of the Native Americans once that's the case. Position granted, nasty. Yes, it would be incredible. <sighs> what about the millipedes? Mm. Mm. Gayfesh, I'll make you in charge of the Ministry of Cinema. Well, I was gonna say only, only if you ensure that all of the, that all, any person 
related to the creation of the MCU in like a leadership or executive role. Like actors are fine. The people who worked on the sets are fine. But all of the like executives, you have to make sure that all of them uh, work in coal mines for the rest of existence, for the rest of time. And Captain America's name has to be changed to Captain Mama. Okay, well, James Gunn, we can negotiate on, okay? I'll let that... James Gunn can get preferential treatment because he does other decent movies, but... But he's... Maybe he has to work in a coal mine for one day. Yes, you will, of course. Steel Griffin, you personally will get free HRT, transition care, and a comfortable UBI. Um, uh, trans surgeries will get preference in all hospitals, always. So it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, if, you are, if you are like a plastic surgeon, you have to do the FFS and all of that before anything else, before you can work on anything else. And if there's wait times for everybody else, well, that just means we need to get more doctors then. You're going to have to do more doctors, you know? Zoe Soft says, is that a tank top with buckles? It's actually a dress, believe it or not. Woo. Woo. It's pretty awesome. I love it. Holy mackerel is mandatory viewing in all schools. True! No, in fact, uh, C-SPAN will be replaced with Holy Mackerel reruns. So, like, if you tune in to C-SPAN, it'll just be Holy Mackerel all the time. Oh, another thing, too, is that uh, it will be mandatory. All uh, all cis people in the country who aren't cool with trans people. So if what we'll do is we'll pass a law where we'll subpoena everybody's social media history. And if you are mean to or transphobic or whatever, then um, you'll have to be subject to uh, the same level of, like, doubt and interrogation and distrust that trans people have been. So they'll, they'll have to do like a real life test uh, where you have to try living as the opposite gender first. Um, and we won't believe you if you're cis. We'll be like, are you sure? That doesn't seem likely. Um, have you tried correcting your testosterone and or estrogen? Hmm, it'll have to be two years and you need to be, you, you'll have to use opposite pronouns, names, clothes, etc. That's how it'll be, cisvestigation. Oh, you're fine then. Everyone who's cool with trans people is is a okay. You're you're clear. Holy mackerel has been fully archived. As far as um as far as the rights, I'm still working on the letter. I was exactly that in my anti SJW phase. If it's been a long, we're not, we're not, we're not insane. If you've converted since then, you're fine, okay? But if it's like, you know, yeah. You know, you, you just be cool. If you convert, you're safe. I haven't. I'm inside your walls. I haven't actually. And think about it like this. You know what I mean? There's not any harm. People might get mad at me and say, oh, you're doing revenge. This is just a revenge fantasy for trans people, Demon Mama. But think about it like this. If you're cis, you'll just go back to being cis after you go through the hormone therapy and you have to dress oppositely to how you do now. And you might discover that you're trans, which is very useful. 
which wouldn't we want to, to minimize that harm, right? Yes, Mr. Krabs, you'll be the head of the Department of Sonic Affairs. But that means that's a big responsibility because that means you got to keep the weird Sonic fans in check. Okay, I'll check that out. Thanks, I'm inside your walls. Anyway, if this agenda sounds appealing to you, vote Demon Mama in 2024. And forever. Always vote Demon Mama. We, we could bring back the stocks for crypto guys, Elon Musk, and prank YouTubers. Actually, it will just become law that prank YouTubers can only interact with crypto guys and Elon Musk. So they'll basically live on a preserve where people will do, do safaris. So like, um, we'll take like, say, a chunk of the state of Wyoming and all of the crypto guys plus Elon Musk and all of his simps and the prank YouTubers will have to live in there. And what we'll do is we'll empower the prank YouTubers, right? So because if, if the prank YouTubers are disempowered, well, then they'll all find solidarity together and they'll resist their, um, their enclosure. But if we give the prank YouTubers the power to basically, you know, they get like a budget to buy cameras and prank stuff. They can go do, you know, they can go do kissing pranks on Elon Musk fans. They can do whatever they want, you know. God damn it, gay fish. Can we get fast food with food stamps? Of course. In fact, fast food companies will be required to give out free food if you say that you don't want to pay. Like if you walk into a fast food place, like McDonald's or whatever, the employees all are going to be paid, so the employees will have no reason to fuck with you whatsoever. If you walk into there and you say, I'm hungry and I don't have the money with me to pay right now, they have to give you food. Because it only cost them like two cents to serve that slop anyway. What political party would you run as? The Demoniac Party. There we have it. Bam. Bam. Done. Done. Bam. Oh yeah, and um, if anybody brought any, um, if any, if anybody brought anything to my attention that wasn't interesting, I would simply reply to them. I'd prep a button on my desk and I would just say, "Looking into it." Tarpalicious says, I do think we should make the president wear a sash like mayors used to. Are you comfortable with this? No. However, I will pass a law that says all mayors have to have a curly little white mustache and a sash and a funny hat and they have to carry around a key that they give to people when they think they did a good job. Yes, even if they're women. Yes, of course. Haven't you ever just wanted to win the key to the city? Haven't you ever wanted to get that? I have. I've always thought it would be cool to get the key to the city. You know what I mean? Ah, oh, man. Somebody should give me the key to the city. If you're the mayor of a small town somewhere in the United States or elsewhere, I'll come visit your country. Um, 
you know, and you want to officially do a ceremony where you give me the key to your city for all of the good that I've done to the world, which is a lot. I've made a lot of people laugh. And as they say, you know, laughter extends your life. So I've actually made people live longer with my wonderful videos. So I feel like I've done some good. I've definitely done better than other people who've gotten the key to the city. Was, what is President Demon Mama's punishment for Matt Walsh? Uh, Matt Walsh will has to be he has to be like cast in wax and then made into one of his own plushies. So like that's that's his future. He gets to be one of his like weird, creepy, sweet baby, adult baby plushies. He will all of the other ones will be destroyed and he will be the last one. So he'll be stuffed and displayed. And that's that's his that's his fate. Brianna Huffman says, ew, and seriously, what the heck is that? Why did Matt Walsh make that think he was a good idea? Oh, um, for those who don't know, Matt Walsh used to do meetups with his fans that were called the Sweet Baby Crew, I think. Sweet Baby or Sweet Baby Crew or something along those lines. And they used to mud wrestle in diapers. It's where that image of the Sweet Baby Gang. It's um, it's where, uh, in fact, one of the there's a really viral picture of a, of a Matt Walsh meetup where two two guys are fighting in diapers in the mud, and one of them has a swastika tattoo. I'm not lying; that's real. Wouldn't be the first time deeply concerned. Were they not as employees? They might have been his employees. I thought it was a fan meetup, but it might have been his employees. Wasn't a fan meetup. Okay, my bad. Sorry for spreading misinformation. It's my presidential right to spread misinformation about Matt Walsh. <laughs> what happens to Lord of Patriarchy, a.k.a. Dave's Cooking? Uh, Dave's Cooking gets uh, Rachel Ray's TV, uh, like uh, HGTV slot or whatever channel she's on now. Oh, here's the clip of it. Yeah, here's the clip of it. Okay, it's his interns. Here they are. These are his Matt Walsh interns. They're in their little diapers. They're ready to go fight. Here they go. There you go. And what do you got right there? Whoa! Uh-oh! Uh-oh! Woo-hoo! And here's where they start getting all dirty and wrestling the dirt and mud. There you have it. You thought I was doing a bit? Nope, I'm not. I'm not. I wasn't doing a bit. This guy looks like he might have peed his. Not going to lie. So I, I did a small bit of misinformation. They were interns, not fans. But, you know. What happened to Liver King's muscles? That was before the liver diet, don't you know? Bill Portly, what the hell? <laughs> Bill Portly says, yeah, that guy looks like a soggy bottom boy.
Oh boy. That channel has a bunch of racist Matt Walsh clips. It's vile and no one knows about it. He runs it. Wait, just has it been confirmed that he runs that channel? It it is called Matt and Crank. It only has 337. Joined in 2010. Well, that checks. Leaked, don't ask, don't tell. Sensitivity training video. Matt and Crank at Right Coast Tattoo. Oh, yep, that's him. That's Matt Walsh. Holy shit. Here's him doing more weird stuff with his uh, interns. Shocking new DNC ad for the 2012 election. Do I dare? Do I dare? All right, we're going to, I'm going to save this one for later so that we can revisit this in the future because uh, I don't want to do any of these, uh, I don't want to do any of these blind, but I have a feeling we'll find some treasures in here. There we go. Got that saved for later. We'll come back to that one in the future. We'll come back to that one in the future. I think it's about time. I think it's time we uh it's I think it's time we do our first segment of the day. I think it's time. I think I'm feeling it. I'm feeling like it's it's time. The energy is the energy is pumping. Lots of people in here watching together. I think it's time for our first real segment. Although I'm not going to lie, I do feel like we could make a fun little segment out of my political promises for Demon Mama 2024. I bet like 20 people would cancel me for that if I did that as a video. Which, you know what? We should, we should let them cancel me. I've had a lot of people... Um, I've had a lot of people trying to like do weird cancellations on me lately. It's been weird. It's been it's been a little strange, I'm not gonna lie. I have to argue with people as if it's real. That would be pretty funny. I won't lie, that would be pretty funny. Okay, everybody, it's time. By the way, if you are here and you're not subscribed to my channel, this is the time to press subscribe. And if you haven't pressed like, it means a lot to me if you'd press like. Boosts our channel, gets more, more eyes on it. Uh, we've been having more and more live viewership, which is incredible, but we want the show to grow, which means more subscribers. So consider pressing like, subscribing, and sending to your friends would mean the world to me okay it really would all right we ready we got our first segment coming up today let me get this ready all right oh before we do that thank you glitch dash for joining as a member on youtube thank you so very much really appreciate the support thank you so very much thank you very very much all right here we go everybody my lovely, lovely imps. Today, we're going to be watching something together that is very special. And also very intriguing. And also a little disappointing. There has been a lot of talk in recent months about AI. There has been a lot of controversy about AI. But one way that doesn't get talked about all that much is the way that 
AI, aka various learning um, algorithms, um, have been incorporated into other parts of our lives. There's a lot of talk, and I'm guilty of this as well, uh, focusing on AI art, on chat GPT. Like, for example, that uh, more and more colleges are reporting uh, that enormous percentages of their papers uh, being submitted by students are very clearly and obviously made by ChatGPT. Uh, the fact that numerous scientific organizations have reported uh, uh, more and more uh, papers, scientific papers, being published using ChatGPT, some of which are even making it through and into publications without people catching it. Um, a lot of focus has been on ChatGPT and on the art side of things. And I think there's a good reason to focus on that. However, today we're going to be talking and reacting to a video uh, that focuses on a different aspect of the AI learning algorithm side of things, which is search engines and social media. You see, Google and now, more recently, within the last two years or so, YouTube has begun using quote-unquote AI as a part of their uh, search algorithms. So how you find content on YouTube and how you find websites on Google is now being driven and heavily impacted by AI algorithms. And a lot of these are very, very difficult to actually discern what they're actually doing. Um, and some of it, as it turns out, is not good not good at all. One of the recurring problems with AI of all types, both the art and the search types, is that uh, AI ten has a tendency to bake in biases, uh, sometimes very obviously, sometimes in more sinister and difficult to detect ways, uh, from those that create it and the data sets that they feed to it which is one of the things that's going to be touched on in the video that we are about to react to. You see, a really, really amazing, very successful, and totally, in my opinion, deserving YouTube channel by the name of How to Cook That, featuring Anne Reardon, um, has made a video exposing YouTube's bias. And this bias is actually pretty bad. And we're going to watch this video together, and we're going to talk about it afterwards. And I'm going to have some things to add in along the way here. But uh, Anne Reardon of How to Cook That uh, is very thorough with the sort of approach that she has to social media and to YouTube. And she reached out to YouTube with some questions, which we're going to see explored in this video. And I wanted to share this with everyone because... I watched this video and on my own time and I found it very compelling. And additionally, I have been on YouTube as a platform for about four and a half years now. And it's been a wild ride. And it's come with a lot of challenges, um, a lot of struggles. And in my time on this website, it seemed harder and harder uh, uh, to, to accomplish certain things that, that seem fairly necessary to make a living on this website. And additionally, it seems to be harder and harder to make a living on this website. And I have a feeling that some of what's talked about in this video is uh, ties into that. Additionally, I talk about YouTube generally. And I think that issues of bias on YouTube are fairly important. Anyway, without any further ado, I would like us to watch and react to How to Cook That's video, Exposing YouTube's Bias. I'm real quick just going to make a small change here to just reflect that that's what we are reacting to. If you guys have never watched, by the way, if you've never watched How to Cook That's channel, uh, Ann Reardon's channel is amazing. Uh, Ann Reardon talks about a whole lot of different things, a lot of cooking stuff, which, as you know, I'm a big fan of. We have a, a little sub show here called Cooking Mama, um, which we don't usually we don't usually make we don't usually uh, react to such beautiful things as the the stuff that Anne Reardon makes. But uh, 
we have fun anyway. Anyway, check out uh, how to cook that it's other videos, uh, which we'll talk about further. But let's let's react to this right away. All right, let's do this. Let's get into this. I have some big big questions for YouTube that they won't answer. And that, of course, made me suspicious. So I have spent the whole two weeks digging and researching and just trying to uncover the truth for you. So let's get into it. Question number one is shorts killing long form content on the platform. Shorts, the vertical videos that are less than 60 seconds long, were introduced by YouTube back in 2020. Prior to that, you could upload a short in length video to the platform, but no one was going to see it because it would have low watch time. So the algorithm just didn't recommend it. Nowadays, though, if I go onto YouTube and for example, search for cake, notice here I'm on the all tab, not the shorts tab. And I've got an ad followed by a row of shorts. And after that, we have a short, another ad, a short and a row of shorts and another ad followed by more shorts. This, that what, which, what Anne is talking about here with the, the way over pushing shorts is so frustrating. It makes finding videos organically through the search really, really difficult. Um, and I, I don't even dislike shorts. I don't, I think that shorts can be a lot of fun. I've published shorts on this channel. Uh, some of them have done fairly well, but it's so much. The shorts are getting pushed so hard that it's crowding out other stuff and it makes it hard to find when you want to sit down and watch a 20 minute video or something about a topic that you're interested in. And all you can find is shorts, often shorts that are questionably even related to what you're searching for. It's pretty bad. It's gotten a little bit out of hand, but this is just the beginning. Surely that has to have an impact on the long form video views. You've been moving really fast in another area, specifically shorts. It's definitely an area we've been investing very heavily in, for sure. YouTube has put out plenty of data boasting about the growth of YouTube shorts on their platform. But when I asked them if they could give me data about the number of long form video views per year since shorts was introduced, they said, we're not able to share any historical data on a platform level on the number of long form versus shorts views per year. And that's okay. It's their platform. They don't have to be transparent with creators who rely on this for their income if they don't want to. I did find an article in the Financial Times though, where it said that a senior staff member at YouTube had expressed concern that shorts were cannibalizing long-term views and that fewer long form videos were being uploaded to the platform and there was a risk of long form dying out. So I think that answers that question. But why does it even matter if it's shorts or long form? Well, it matters to creators and to viewers because quality content takes time and money to create. And shorts is just not paying enough. Zach King. It's actually shocking how little money you actually get from shorts. Um, truly shocking. Um, I, 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 I think that we've published, I, w I wonder, I wonder, can we find out? Let's see, we could probably find this out. Here, I'll look it up while we watch real quick. Let's continue, let's hear what, what she has to say and I'll look up mine. Got 35 million views on shorts and earned only $343. My 35 million, oh, sorry, I need to put this, sorry, let's, I, I didn't mean to do that, I apologize. Let's go back real quick. Let's just listen to that again real quick. Sorry about that, a rookie mistake. Quality content takes time and money. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. <clears throat> Let's look at the lifetime. On every short that I've ever uploaded on my channel, okay? We have dozens of shorts on my channel. I have made less than $15 across every single short that I have ever made on my entire channel. Less than $15. And most of that, or a good chunk of that, came from YouTube Premium viewers. Last month, I made how much? Last month, I made $2.25. Incredible. In total, that's in total, yes. That is the grand total is less than $15.
on the dozens of shorts I've uploaded. Yeah, so. ...to create, and shorts is just not paying enough. Zach King got 35 million views on shorts and earned only $343. My $343 for 35 million views. Just wow. Just, just wow. Next question is related to shorts. It's what even counts as a view on YouTube shorts? I mean, historically, YouTube has always said that for it to count as a view on the platform, you have to watch for at least 30 seconds of the video and the viewer has to initiate the view by clicking on it. You can't just auto play the video. Obviously, that's not the case with shorts. So I asked the question, what does count as a view? And this was the reply. We don't have a defined duration for the system to count it as a shorts view, but it does gauge the number of legitimate views for shorts versus those who swiped away immediately. How can you be counting something that's undefined? That is a really weird answer. That's a sus answer. So then I started looking at Shorts Analytics and you can see that it has the percent who chose to view versus those that swiped away. So we know it's not like TikTok, just swiping past doesn't count as you've seen the video. But if we look at the analytics on this 14 second video, you can see here that on this beginning bit, the first five seconds, the view is above the 100% line. And that's because once you've seen the video, it loops, it starts playing again. So if you watch it to the end and start watching it again, before you get a chance to swipe away, it looks like you are watching more than once. So depending where you choose to put your view count at is dramatically going to change the number of views on the platform. If we look at this longer video, it's exactly the same. You can see those first five seconds have a greater than 100% view count. So if you chose to put your view time at two seconds as the defined duration of a short view, you're gonna have many, many more views on the platform than if you said it was 10 seconds that counted as a view on a short. So by not defining it, you can manipulate the number of views on shorts that you're getting on the platform. The negative of that is by making it all the way at the beginning, like one second or half a second, is you're gonna increase the number of views, so the boasting rights on it, but you're not gonna increase the CPM. The next question I have is a really curious one. This is one that someone back at YouTube- Mistress Lynn says, this is really well edited and I love the visuals. If you like this, you should watch basically the rest of Anne Reardon's entire channel, How to Cook That. Um, her whole production style is amazing. Her videos are incredibly informative and entertaining. Um, the visual style is super, super unique. Um, I. I watch so much How to Cook That. I, I love her channel so much. And yeah, her debunking videos are amazing. If you want to like, that's the videos that got me into her channel was the debunking videos where she goes and she takes a cooking video or a hack, life hack video or whatever and debunks it and does it herself. And they're amazing. Um, it's so, so cool. I, I love Ann Reardon's channel. Anyway, let's continue in Sydney when I used to live there raised with me years ago because of all of the channels that they were managing all the female hosted ones had been growing nicely before the change to the AI algorithm and then by a year after here let me just rewind real quick so we can we can hear this I was answering a question I didn't mean to, to cross over but listen to this real quick next question I have is a really curious one this is one that someone back at YouTube in Sydney when I used to live there raised with me years ago because of all of the channels that they were managing all the female hosted ones had been growing nicely before the change to the AI algorithm and then by a year after they were all declining rather rapidly. Certainly in the how-to space, I noticed a sudden influx of male hosted channels doing really well and same in the beauty space, which those areas both used to be 
dominated by female hosts and female creators. But at the same time, there was a big influx in the amount of content that was being promoted for content farms, which as you know, can contain a lot of misinformation and fake recipes, which is why we've been doing all the debunking on. So I totally forgot about the potential for a gender bias. I just didn't even think about it anymore until recently. And then I was watching a video by Amanda reviewing a conference for YouTube creators that I was considering going to. And this is what she said. This was a dude fest. <laughs> One, maybe two women were on the main stage throughout uh, the three days, the two days. You had a lot of uh, volunteers that were women creators. I spoke to a bunch of them, they were great. Now, if you're running an event, you have to put the biggest creators on the main stage because they're who people want to see and you need more seats in the auditorium. It just makes sense. You don't want an empty auditorium with someone smaller on the stage. So that means either they couldn't get any female creators who were big to come and speak at their conference or there aren't any female creators who are big. And that made me wonder. And then I heard Samia say this. Our industry is very predominantly male, specifically on YouTube. It, it, you mm -hmm. go to any creator event, uh, you know, and it feels like it's it's uh, more male centric than uh, than maybe ever right now on YouTube. Why do you think that is, and do you think it's hard for female creators to break through on YouTube right now? It's a great question. Yeah, great question. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, and it's something I've also been thinking about. Is is it the nature of the algorithm that rewards more intense? content mm. that uh, and and maybe I fall in that because I'm doing traditionally more masculine things sometimes I, I'm not sure some of you might remember back in 2018 Amazon was in the news for its AI recruiting software Amazon software engineers recently uncovered a big problem the company has now abandoned an AI recruiting tool after discovering that the program was biased against women. When it came to choosing an applicant for a technical job like a software engineer, it was filtering out anyone who had the word women's in their application if they went to a women's university or were president of the women's chess club or played in the women's hockey team. If any of that was on the resume, they were getting lower points. And even when they tried to tell it, do not filter based on the word women's, we are happy to have women in those roles, it was still filtering out the women. It started looking at the tone of the language used in the application. The men's ones tended to use words like execute and more aggressive tones, I guess, and the women's were more passive tones. So it still managed to filter them out somehow. So they ended up scrapping it, going, well, this is not gonna work for us because we do want to employ women. The trouble is AI is always trained on a data set. So if there's any bias in that data set, it tends to pick that up and exaggerate it. So because it was trained on 10 years of historical hiring data and over that time, predominantly men had been hired for those roles, it had learnt that men must be better at those roles. Bloomberg did something similar where they asked an AI image generator to generate images of people in different jobs. So they asked for a picture of a CEO, a politician, a cleaner, a doctor, and in all the higher up roles, it gave a lot more men than it did women. And you might go, well, that's just true. It's just showing a reflection of what there is in society because there is a bias there still in some of the top roles. But the thing is, it has exaggerated the bias. For example, if we ask for an image of a doctor, it gave nine out of 10 images of a male doctor. Whereas in the US, 37% of doctors are women. So the bias already existed, but the AI has made it even worse. So to know if- That's pretty grim, isn't it? That's pretty grim. And of course, you can apply this exact same, these exact same findings to all kinds of other identity groups. You can talk about this same issue with race. You can talk, talk about the same issue with uh, sexuality, with, with um, queer, with whether you're queer or not. It's uh, pretty shocking. There is a bias in the YouTube AI towards male creators. We're going to need to analyze a lot of data and it is hard to access this sort of thing. I'm not interested in shorts views because they don't pay very well. So we're just looking at long form views. We can't look at 
total views for all time because that's giving us historical data for channels that have been around for a long time like mine that were around before shorts. So we just want to know how many long form views channels got in the last 30 days and which ones are at the top. That took hours and days and weeks of analysing data and thanks to James my son for helping me with that and doing all nighters and just crunching numbers but I think we finally have the list of the most viewed channels in the last 30 days. Before we look at the results I want to highlight another way in which algorithms can affect our lives as well as deciding which YouTube channels to amplify they also affect how we read the news. Algorithms will look at your browsing history in order to decide what information to show you which can really narrow down your perspective. There's an old saying that says in a court case the first person that gets up to speak always seems right until they're cross-examined. In other words, you need to hear both sides of a story to get the full picture. Today's sponsor, Grand News, is on a mission to help us do just Damn, that. A slick sponsor. Slick sponsor. I will say something. Ground News has been... Ground News has been... They've been, they've been out there, okay? I don't know anything about Ground News except for that I've seen a million of their sponsorships. My goodness, they've been nailing these sponsorships. What the hell? I've, I've always taken some of their claims to be a little sus. Like any time any company claims to be able to have like a, the right left analysis, I want to know like, well, how do you, how do you calculate that? Because a lot of them will put, will say stuff like, oh yeah, CNN is left. And it's like, well, actually, usually CNN is center, but they'll say like MSNBC is left. And I'm like, look, I'm left, okay? I'm openly left. That's my political position. I'm very open about that, okay? Anybody who knows my show knows that I very openly consider myself, you know, pretty far on the left side of things. I don't think MSNBC is representative of any left person that I know, so... They do conflate left with liberal, but that's just an example. I'm always interested in the actual nitty gritty of how these things work. But anyway, uh, not to not to do a, a sponsor skip, but I'm not sponsored by Ground News, and I can't endorse them. So we're gonna get back to the heart of the uh, we're gonna we're gonna get back to the heart of the topic. Let's continue. Wants to see if the YouTube AI algorithm is to all their features. It's a great way to outsmart the algorithms and make sure that you're seeing the bigger picture. Now, back to our results to see if the YouTube AI algorithm is favouring male creators or not. Imagine that this is the top 100 channels with the most long-form video views in the last 30 days. These ones are the music channels, like Taylor Swift. These ones are the made-for-kids channels. Kids watch a lot of content on YouTube. If you didn't know, kids creators are supposed to mark their videos as Brendan Hussar with the tier one sub, thank you very, very much, says, I started watching How to Cook That on your recommendation a few months back, and I really enjoy her content. That makes me feel good. I love being able to tune people into other shows uh, that I enjoy and that I think are good. So it makes me very happy that you have enjoyed How to Cook That stuff. It's why I do, you know, reacts like this, where I let people know who we're who we're watching. I like to create that ba that back and forth flow. That conversation is really important to me. Thank you made for kids just like Bounce Patrol has a great Australian kids channel. If you scroll down you can see there are no comments because comments automatically get switched off on made for kids videos. The other unfortunate thing is your AdSense goes down by about tenfold and that's because... Yeah if you if you do made for kids made for kids just the reason it it's the whole made for kids thing was like an almost necessary thing you know what I mean? Like the before before the made for kids category existed, there were all of these channels that were clearly making stuff for kids and they had like the most disturbing and messed up comment sections. Um and I don't know, YouTube's solution was not perfect, but I they had, something had to be done because the state of like kids channels that weren't officially kids channels before was really messed up. Some of you may have seen uh, way back in the day the videos that H3H3 did on 
the like Elsa Spider-Man kids channels where it was co nonsense content slop that sometimes had like really weird sexual themes for some reason in these videos that were very clearly designed for like children to be viewed and they also in the h3h3 video they also talked about how predatory a lot of the comment sections were on videos that were clearly being pitched at children um it's bad it was bad now unfortunately the solution to the kids videos thing has basically been to make um to to make like kids content not barely monetizable at all um, and the reason for that, of course, is because you, a lot of places there are restrictions against selling advertisements to kids, which is, yeah, that makes sense. It's completely logical to, to, to like, hey, you shouldn't be selling all kinds of random products to children. But because there are very few, um, like, fully supported or uh, reliable, you know, ways to make money on YouTube and... A lot of YouTube is just like sort of parents just dumping videos in front of their kids. Um, it, it means that these channels are incentivized to do what we're about to see, which you'll see in just a second. Because it's actually illegal to serve targeted ads to children. The reason being is because to serve targeted ads to you, they have to track you across the internet to see what your interests are and what things you are wanting to buy so they can serve those ads to you. And it's illegal to track data on children. YouTube got fined $136 million for doing so by the FTC. So they had to implement a way that creators could say, this channel is made for kids and there will be no targeted ads on that. Anyway. Back to the top 100. These ones are TV shows or very large media companies. And this may come as a surprise to you, but all of these channels are not in English, which makes sense given that India is the largest consumer of YouTube. So that leaves us with only five. I didn't know that before this video. I didn't know that, that um, India was the number one YouTube uh, consumer. Pretty interesting. I've created channels out of the top 100, so we had to go even further down the list to get to the top 10 for the month. Coming also, that really speaks to the direction that YouTube has gone over the last decade. The fact that, um, you know, a lot of people used to herald YouTube as this kind of like the democratization of viewing, you know, where it's like, oh yeah, you know, anybody can make a YouTube channel and... You know, it's it's anybody can put their video up there, but like the top 100 channels are mostly music videos from very well established musicians, television shows from establishment um, studios, um, and you know, and then I mean, there's the kid stuff, I suppose. Though a lot of those are made by huge studios as well. It's kind of just like. Yeah, actually, this website has increasingly become exactly what its predecessor was. It's wild. So I'm not saying it's not possible. Obviously, I make my show out of a studio in my house. You know what I mean? And I've had success. There's like almost there's, there's 340 people watching right now, which is amazing. Thanks for watching please make sure that you press subscribe down below so you can see all my amazing stuff that I make. And, you know, not everything is all politics. I do all kinds of other cool stuff. But um, it's really cool. But my story is not common. I am in a very low percentage of people who can do that. Um, it is less and less common. And also, we, like, channels like mine increasingly can never make it past a certain point. We're forever trapped at a certain size, no matter how good we get, you know, or, or how, uh, you know, innovative or whatever we're doing, um, because the top 100 channels are going to be dominated by the, the giant mega corporations that are putting out their shows on this channel, on this website now, too. Anyway, let's continue. In at number 10 with 157 million views for the month is Lanky Box. 
It looks very kid orientated for me, just so you know, kid is defined as under 13 on YouTube. Do you guys have any idea where the treasure is? <laughs> oh, they're right. It's right there. Oh, behind us. Oh, you guys are right. But the comments seem to be on for all of the videos. Yep, and that's exactly what I was referring to before when I was talking about kids' channels. There is a huge incentive right now for kids' channels to pretend to not be ki kids' channels. Basically doing exactly what the problem was before YouTube introduced kids' channels. And it's very funny because some kids' channels will intentionally put stuff in their episodes where they're like, They'll say like a swear or make a joke or whatever so that they can plausibly say we're not a kid's channel, which just goes to show that like YouTube has not fixed the problem. So it has not been marked as made for kids, so we will put them on the list. At number nine, we have A for Adley. Adley is a child, so I have no idea how this is not marked as made for kids. The comments are on for this video, but this one is marked as made for kids. Looking through their latest videos, it seems to be 50-50 whether they've marked it as made for kids or not. So because half of them are marked as made for kids, I think we'll just put their channel in the made for kids section and take it off this list, which means we need to go back one further down to number 11, which will now be number 10, which is Penguin Z Zero. All right, let's ride, boys. Charlie! He does streaming and commentary. Yeah, baby! Woohoo! ...videos and got 154 million long-form views in the last month. It's crazy. Add him to the list, and at number eight... He's at the... Yeah, Charlie's at the bottom of this list. Eight, we have Better Bojuk. This channel also has a kid as the main character, but comments seem to be on for every single video that I looked at, so it's not marked as made for kids, so we'll need to put it on the list. Next, at number seven, is Myzen. This one's run by a couple of guys. It was the top gaming channel in Japan, and they now also dub it into English. It's mainly Minecraft, and it looks kiddie to me again, but the comments are on, so we'll put them on the list. Next at number six is Darman Studios, with 180 million views. The channel is run by Darman, and he appears in the videos. I don't even like Darman anyway. What? Darman! I was just kidding. We don't have any females yet. Number five is Nile Red. It's great to have a science channel doing so well. It just seemed weird to me that something so toxic could smell good. This channel is run <laughs> and hosted by <laughs> Nigel, so we'll add him to the list. The list is full, so we're going to have to shrink down the guys so that we have some more space there. This next channel at number four had 202 million long form views last month. The channel has animations created by Alexei Gerasimov and his latest war series Skibbity Toilet has really taken off. Let's put him on the list. Well, actually, he doesn't actually appear in his videos, so let's put one of his toilet characters on the list for him <laughs> instead. Now, next at number three, we have Afmau with 257 million views. Again, it's Minecraft and looks kiddie to me. We're gonna play a game. But the comments are on. One thing for parents to be aware of is that some kiddie looking channels have added more adult conversations or adult themes to some of their videos in order not to be marked as made for kids. And that seems to be the case with some of the content on this channel. She says on Tumblr that not all of her videos are suitable for kids kids to view. So just be aware of listening to what your kids are watching, not just them with headphones and you can only see it because it's... Uh, Violet says, she's saying anything that, that's animated looks kitty. I just noticed that, which is so wrong. I don't, I don't think that's what's going on here. I, I, based on what was, what's been shown of these channels, they seem pretty kitty. Like, uh, a Minecraft video with a bunch of like cartoon voices going, let's go on an adventure. What's that behind me? It's the number three. One, two, three. That seems, I don't know. That seems pretty kiddie. I, I think I think so far Ann Reardon has been pretty fair. Uh, this channel maybe might be an exception to that, but I don't know. 
Jay Nolo says, Aff Mouse sells toys in the kids' section of Walmart. not necessarily going to be appropriate but we do finally have a female on the list so that is exciting next at number two we have jojo sim with 260 million views for the month is it a lie or is it the truth that a sew it foot long is actually a foot long so another guy and at number one with 830 million long form views for the month is of course Mr. Beast. You have exactly 24 hours to build whatever you want to protect your Lamborghini from the bullets. The timer starts now. So if we add him to the top of the list, that makes it nine male creators to one female creator, or 2.3 billion video views compared to 257 million video views, which seems pretty biased. But if we shrink that down and add the next 20 channels on the list, we end up with 20 male creators, seven female creators, and three couples or family vlogs. So I put them in the middle because they've got both. So that seems a little fairer, still biased, but a little fairer. But that was until I looked at those seven female channels. Of those seven channels, six of them, the female doesn't actually appear in the videos at all. Three of them are gaming, so they appear only as an animated character. One does videos about other people and their dogs and they are not seen personally in the videos at all. One does ASMR slime, so they are not seen or heard in their videos. And another has a monkey, which surely this belongs in Made for Kids, but What's comments this? are on, so I put it on the list. So the question could be asked, does- There's actually, it's really funny, but there's actually an ad for YouTube Kids on this video down below but it's not in the YouTube Kids section. What's this? Comments are on, so I put it on the list. So the question could be asked, does AI even know that those channels are run by a female? Certainly historically before AI, YouTube always used to have a male at the top of the creator list. There was Smosh, then Fred, then Ryan Heger, followed by Ray William Johnson. Jenna Marbles was doing really well, but she never actually made it to the top spot before PewDiePie took over. And now, of course, there's Mr. Beast. The question is, has AI looked at that historical data and then exaggerated a bias towards male creators? I really don't know because there are millions of YouTube channels and we have only looked at the tip of the iceberg. Certainly what we can see doesn't look great. Let me know what you think in the comments. Out of interest, I asked Midjourney, an AI image generator, to generate me some pictures of YouTubers. With thanks to my amazing patrons for all of your support of this channel that allows us to keep going despite YouTube algorithms, make it a great week by being kind to others and I'll see you on Friday. As I said before, that video, I'm going to link to this video right here so that anybody who's watching this, you can just check it in the, uh, in the chat. Um, there you go. It'll also be in the description when we upload this as a segment. But that video was exposing YouTube's bias by the channel How to Cook That with Anne Reardon. Amazing channel. Go check it out. Um, yeah, a bit of a depressing video, right? A little, a little rough to hear about. Um, but unfortunately, a reality of the current paradigm online. Um, I can certainly say uh, it, 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 it does not feel encouraging, you know, as a woman creator in these spaces. Um, it does not feel encouraging to think about uh, how the overlap of queer and woman uh, will do to your numbers and your chances on this platform and your likelihood of success. Um, especially when you think about how it's getting harder and harder and harder to even make a, uh, a, a basic living on these websites. It's definitely very depressing on that front. But there's another angle to it as well. Um, if, if the general uh, concept of justice and fairness doesn't appeal to you for some reason. If it if it doesn't bother you that uh, you know 
there is no current hope of proportional representation on these sites, um, that uh, there's another side of it as well, which is just that you get less good stuff. Um, if, if, if women are not, if women look at this site and they go, yeah, women can't succeed easily on this site, they're going to get less success, they're going to work harder, and they're going to get less for it, um, they'll choose different careers, which means you're missing out on talent. You're missing out on amazing things that could dazzle you and change your life, that could fill you with inspiration uh, for a very stupid reason, which is that an idiotic um, AI algorithm has simply decided that for some reason or another due to pre-existing bias that we should just bias it in a single direction. Um, yeah, and it, it does. It cre Yeah, exactly. It creates a feedback loop. It creates a feedback loop of, of uh, people going, why, why would I choose to, to pursue a career that I know that I'm not going to get even treatment in? Now, of course, we already know that many, many, many careers discriminate uh, you know, against women, uh, both pay and in general respect, um, and in hiring, but, uh, uh, it seems pretty goddamn bad on YouTube right now. That seems like a pretty major concern. I'm very happy that a large channel, 5 million subscribers, by the way, like how to cook that, um, was willing to talk about this issue, but I don't think that's going to be enough, uh, to, to make a meaningful dent on this. And I think that um, we, uh, this, this example speaks to a pretty serious concern with the implementation, the sort of wanton, um, uh, uh, implementation of AIs that have really baked in biases. Uh, this has really bad downstream effects. It's terrible. Um, you know, I, I do this site. I, I do this work. I, I, I make stuff for this website because it's something I'm incredibly passionate about. And because when I set out to do it, I wasn't setting out, you know, with the goal of having a career. I just was like, this is something that I want to do. Maybe I'll have a shot at it. Um, I want to try my hand at this and see what I can make, see if I can get good at it and see if I can make something that I'm proud of. And I've accomplished that. And I've also had some level of success. Now, some people look at my channel and go, oh my God, especially if you're a small creator, you probably look at my channel and go, oh my God, um, that's a great level of success. But the reality is that it doesn't even translate into that much financial, financial success. My show is sustainable at the moment, um, but it's not like I'm bringing in a crazy amount of money. I have said this before, I make less money doing this job all the time for four years with a big following and a fairly loyal following than I did with pretty much any of my previous jobs with the exception of freelance writing, which was, I was pretty low pay, I won't lie. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty tight. And also, that's with me running my own website, demonmama.com, where you can be one of these wonderful chatters and get access to uh, incredible, cute, custom emojis and f nice, colorful names. Um, that's my website. That's with my website. If I was going off of just YouTube income, I would not be able to do this job This job as a job. It would have to only be a hobby. Uh, the amount of money that I've made from YouTube is not even enough to be close to minimum wage. Over four years, all of it added together over four years would not be minimum wage for one year, you understand, with what I've made off of YouTube alone. Um, so, yeah, the state of, of this website right now is is not amazing. And the fact that, that now this data uh, is coming to surface, that it's gotten worse and worse for women on this website is really sad and depressing. Um, it's, it's sad for the industry. It's sad for consumers who are missing out on incredible shows that would otherwise exist but don't. Um, and, of course, it overall indicates a willingness to basically uh, let algorithms make decisions for us completely. The reality is that a lot, a lot of discoverability on YouTube happens through the algorithm. 
for obvious reasons. The YouTube interface is built around its algorithm. The top thing um, when you're on your homepage is, is, your, is recommendations, which are coming through the algorithm. When you search, the top search results are what the algorithm thinks that you want to see. You're not, um, you know, there's not like an organic pipeline for recommendations outside of what I do here. So like when you watch one of my videos and I say, hey guys, go check out Ann Reardon, how to cook that, you that's a direct organic recommendation. I, a person, am telling you to go do this. But the reality is that that's not really, um, YouTube doesn't really build a lot of tools for us to do that. You know what I mean? The UI is built around the algorithm. It's about feeding you stuff through this algorithm. That's where most YouTube discoverability comes from. And right now, it is telling you, whether you like it or not, you're going to watch men, and pretty much only men, uh, with a ratio of 9 to 1. And that's not even beginning to talk about, like I said, uh, race or, uh, or sexuality. Or the other part of this video which was the type of content that is succeeding on YouTube, which is largely corporate products. It's pretty rough. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty rough. And it's not a good sign for the health of the environment uh, on this website. And I hope that it can change but it also does mean that uh, there, there is one thing to consider, which is that it means that if you care about this stuff, that we have to start looking at ways to build recommendations that are outside of the algorithm. We have to learn both as participators, a viewer or a commenter or a chatter, and as video makers like myself we have to learn how to be able to share people you know guide people to content that otherwise wouldn't be seen that's wonderful you know what i mean part of the reason why i spend so much time on my show giving specific recommendations to things that i like or that i find interesting and also the reason why i do react the way, like this the way i do where we watch a video talk about it do a discussion afterwards and make sure that we're driving you know, people over to that video is because I want to start changing the way that we approach these things so that everybody doesn't just in instinctually uh, rely on the algorithm. And while I, while I don't think that I personally or my channel or even a couple of different channels are going to stop the algorithm from ruling the recommendations, we can certainly start to change some things. We can create, uh, we can create little bubbles of, of, different behavior where people can find fresh and interesting and amazing stuff and if that catches on to a great enough degree it might just make it more possible for people who are being ignored by the algorithm to have success and i would love that personally i would really love it to be able to see more women in this space more trans people in this space So, yeah. Felix B says, that explains why the channels I follow are more diverse. My subs are almost all based on word of mouth. And there you have it. The result is there. If you follow the algorithm, you will be served corporate product and you will be served a very, uh, a, a, a slice of content that is very lacking in diversity. Retcon 404 says, we would definitely need a creator's union. I would love it if a union was possible, but I think creators have to come up with, are going to have to start working on coming up with a new type of structure. Because, yeah, in the current in the current paradigm, the fact that YouTube has us all as contractors means that we don't get le the same legal protections as other workers when it comes to union law. But I do think that collective action among content creators is possible. I do believe that's possible.
Yeah. That's awesome, Joseph. Joseph. Joseph says, I was brought here and recommended by Vosh. That's amazing. It is possible to uh, to sort of shape what the algorithm will recommend you, but it has certain biases by default based on how it's programmed to begin with. Um, and that is very difficult to fully overcome, but you can of course change that. Um, anyway, uh, there's not a whole lot more for me to say on this topic. It's, it is, I can only hope that pe more people will bring attention to this and that we can hopefully change it because uh, it is actually very good for us to have a, a, a website that is able to fairly recommend content and at the very least to not slant it to that degree. Um, it hurts everyone, even the creators at the very top uh, when the when the environment on a website gets to this degree. And it can, in the worst of situations, create a death spiral. If the only thing, like imagine it like this, if the only thing that's being recommended to anyone is Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast might be doing something really amazing and he might be successful and that might be great for him, but it's going to start killing interest in the website. There'll be less overall viewers, less people will tune in to a website that only serves you one person or one type of person. It's better for everyone for this stuff to be ironed out so that it's not so slanted in what's being recommended. It will encourage more people to pursue this. And if more people can make a living believably and a more diverse group of people can make a living believably on the website, that's going to bring much more vibrant ideas, much more uh, vibrant environment to the website. Anyway, I'm Demon Mama. If you enjoyed what you saw here, make sure you subscribe to my channel down below and leave me a comment. Tell me your thoughts. Have you noticed something similar to this? Has your experience been different? I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for hearing the signal. I feel proud of that segment. I feel like that was a good segment. What do we all think? Feel good about it? Good. Yeah, people are just, people, seems like people are liking it. Pretty fresh. Pretty fresh. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hypno Amber says, when I first started making uh, a fave list, I purposely look for women and trans creators. Whenever I find a disability channel, I also add that too. And buy POC channels, which is why uh, I was so pissed when YouTube auto automatically deleted them from my subs. Um, yeah, here's the like sound. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that um, people exper had their their subs list really badly tampered with. And it does seem to, uh, I don't, I don't have data on this, but I have heard people say, um, that it, that it damages, uh, that it, that it seems to be slanted in a particular direction that a lot of queer, uh, black indigenous people of color channels have been purged from, from sub lists. I don't know. I don't have the data for that, but I've heard this, you know, you know, from word of mouth, from people to people. Yes, of course, Kiwi TP. If you subscribe to someone, make sure you actually watch them. It hurts them algorithmically if you subscribe but never really watch. Um, the algorithm and it's the subscription algorithm in its current form is busted. And in fact, I've considered trying to do some experiments with what we send notifications out for um, because yeah, it does seem to be hurting. Um, we've been getting, my channel has been getting uh, kind of dunked on in the algorithm lately and it's a real, real bummer. Um, like, uh, we've, I've been putting out a ton of content, 
Uh, we've been doing very good with live views. Like stream views are doing wonderfully. But the subs have been, um, recommendations in the algorithm have gone way down. The subs have gone way down. It, it sucks. I don't really know what's going on. Um, yeah, so I don't know what to. I don't know what we're. I don't know if we're doing something wrong or what. I have to look into it. Are you thinking of uh, Nebula? Maybe you see Snake Jerry. Patreon, maybe. Patreon. That's another one. We have a Patreon, by the way. Um, the Patreon gets you fancy, uh, uh, fancy names in the Discord, and it's mostly just to support me. But you can support through, uh, you can support through there if you want to. Patreon, yeah. Yes, YouTube Premium is uh, very good, uh, in my opinion. In my personal opinion, I think YouTube Premium is great. Uh, first of all, I use YouTube Premium because I don't. I hate ads, and it gets rid of ads, um, which is awesome. But uh, it also is good for creators. Uh, we, if you are, if you're a YouTube Premium viewer, we get a flat like amount based on how much you watch, instead of worrying about ads, which is like really awesome. It actually adds up to be quite a bit. Um, like it's not the best, but it's it's good. I got called a cuck for having YouTube premium. I don't understand that. I think that subscription models are better than ad supported models. Uh, there's this like really dumb, I don't know, people people are in for a shock. Uh, the ad market is not exactly doing amazingly right now, broadly. Um, ads are worth less than they ever have been. The ad the ad market, like ad-based models are 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 fading out right now. Yeah, so. Is that why ads are every, are everywhere more than ever? Yes, because they're worth less than they ever have been. So there's more ads in order to make up the difference. And you can't keep up because that creates an ad free fall because the more ads there are, the less people care about them. Um, People are tired of ads, and ads are less relevant than ever. Uh, and yeah, that's why when you go to some websites, you're just bombarded with ads. Like I don't know if you guys ever go to like like uh, if you go if you like are looking for some information about a video game, and you open up like a game site now, they're so loaded with ads. It's like oh my god, it's nightmarish. Yes, exactly. Snugan also says, also, if you bombard people with ads, ad blocks become more and more attractive, which further devalues the value of an ad. Yep. Grady HD says, I do, I do despise when they bully you into a subscription model b by making the base, base version more unusable or unbearable. Yeah, uh, I hate that too. Um, unfortunately, it's very, very, very common uh, <laughs> these days. Uh, that's, it's an unfortunate truth. Uh, it makes me sad, but it is an unfortunate truth of our current era. Uh, basically, every platform does that to some degree. It's pretty unfortunate. I wish there was a. I wish there was a better. I wish I had a better answer than that. It sucks and it's terrible, but it is. It's it's present and we keep encountering it. Yeah. Yep. 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 Oh. All right, we're going to look we're going to look at a meme. Okay. Jojo's bizarre. All right, let's see this. 
This is a meme, the Kaniku Man Iceberg. Let's check it out. Quick meme, meme review. Let's see it. ...of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure has even gone on record saying that seeing Yude Tamango... What is this music? Is this music going to get me copyrighted? This is music is going to get me demonetized, isn't it? Not risking it. Not risking it. Sorry. There is a man trying to break into the... All right, Snap Cube animated. Let's see this. Eggman breaks. Let's see it. Place. Lock him in so he'll starve. This is the most logical course of action. Did you see that hot JPEG footage that was just... <laughs> Ooh, baby. I'm gonna blow the walls off of this place. Going up! <laughs> <laughs> They, they fucked my vanished. wife. The animals fucked my wife. And then everybody fucking left because the fucking ship was going to be destroyed. She was able to escape because I designed a robot that would be able to pleasure her in such an intense way that I would be able to finally <laughs> fuck her. But it didn't happen because she decided to become a furry fucker and fuck the whole Sonic the Hedgehog and Shadow Team, which didn't even fucking matter since it went into a new arc. And then she fucked the world. The world was her next target because her jussie was not even playing enough so she had to hoe herself out and be the biggest fuck that you've ever seen the world is going to be destroyed right now i'm logging off you shouldn't talk about your wife that way i don't give a flying fuck that bitch can fuck off and divorce her ass three hours ago <laughs> i'm so sick my body's doing things that thing and you over there shut up and you take off my pants you want to see some Weird shit! Eggman, you need to calm down. <laughs> I am- I'm, I'm, I'm running up being calm all the goddamn time! I wanna live my life, and you, 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 oh. you, I'm so sick of you. It looks like we won, everybody. We broke him, finally. <laughs> Maria. <laughs> 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 okay, here's something I don't understand. I've seen a lot of memes by this particular channel. Do these guys just like, do they just play Sonic games and riff off of them endlessly? Is that what, is that their deal? Girl with the Guitar says the context behind this is that a bunch of friends get together and dub over the footage of cutscenes of different games, in this case, Sonic Adventure 2. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, I see. I see, I see. That, uh, it checks. I mean, they, they're definitely funny. They've got, they're good riffers. It's just I always feel like I'm missing something every time I see one of these. You know? Every time I get one of these, I'm always like, I feel, I feel a little bit like I'm missing something. You know? Another bored person with the $5. Hey, don't worry about ads. When we all get the mandatory brain chips, companies will just inject cravings for products directly into our subconscious. Well, then I need to make sure that they're injecting cravings for Demon Mama content directly into your consciousness. Thanks for making the glorious future of mandatory Demon Mama viewing possible with your incredibly generous $5 super chat. Thank you very much, another bored person. You are making the future brighter. Thank you. And Tifa Pyro with the tier one sub, you are also making the future bri uh, brighter and more demonic. Regardless of ad discourse, all must subscribe to Demon Mama and like every stream. Exactly! That's what I'm saying! Exactly! Thank you. Thank you very much. Hippopocanurius. Hippopocanurius says, The Eggman guy is really good at riffing. He basically carries their dubs. That makes sense. Wait, has anyone recommended Demon Mama the VeggieTales randomly generated content bit? I've seen that before. Um, I've also seen the VeggieTubers, which if you don't know what a VeggieTuber is, you're just missing out. Did you know? I don't know if you all know this. Did you know 
that there is an entire corner of the internet that are called, uh, I called them veggie tubers, but they're actually called veggie maters. They make their own version and they have their own veggie sonas. So they'll be like, their name will be like Ralph the Red Cucumber. I'm not even joking with you. I'm literally not even kidding. The veggie maters is what they're called. It's a whole corner. I introduced a uh, cherry of the Fruitcast podcast to that a couple of weeks ago. It's it's amazing. In fact, hold on. Uh, did I show you guys the? Uh, there was a great one. I watched a an actually like unironically funny one. It, the bit was a little too long. It wasn't perfect, but it was a uh, it was Larry the cucumber opens Discord in light mode. And it was just a little animation that they did with their own custom, uh, realistic looking Larry the Cucumber. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Veggie, as in, as it, as in veggie animators? Yeah, veggie maters. Yep, that's right. Fruit cast versus the veggie maters? I want to see it. I want to see it. Here's another meme to make up for the Kaniku Man one. All right, okay. All right, let's see it. Let's see it. And freak knuckles and we're at pumpkin hill you ready i ain't gonna let it get to me i'm just gonna creep down in pumpkin hill i got some fun my little speed so i know is... that it's here i can sense it in my feet the great emerald's power allows me to feel i can't see a thing but it's around somewhere i'm gonna hold my head because i have no fear this probably seems crazy crazy, crazy. A graveyard theory i go try to approach me and god larry ask him a question and he vanished in a second i'm walking through valley Seem happy, but they sure try to get me. Had a back of up with a fist metal crack. I'm hearing someone saying you were chicken. All right, that was a that was a that was a video. That was a video. Fascinating, fascinating video, but definitely a video. One of the one of the videos of all time, or so I've heard. You wanna know what's great? I got I got uh, Little Caesars earlier, and it was sick. Little Caesars. I am 100% the type of person, you know that one meme that everybody quotes where it's like the, you know, Little Caesars is great when you don't got a bitch in your ear telling you that it's gross? I 100% agree with that. It's so good when, when you don't got a bitch in your ear. What's your favorite flavor? Well, there's only basically two flavors in the entirety of Little Caesars. There's cheese, and then there's sauce. And you could argue there's pepperoni in there too, and veggies, but you can't really taste the veggies. And the pepperoni kind of blends in with the sauce and cheese. Uh, but my favorite item on their menu is their, cra their cheesy bread. They're like cheesy bread is legitimately really good, especially if you get the little garlic dip and the salt and the marinara dip. Thin crust is the best. What? Why? Their their best thing is when they do the buttery deep dish stuff, and that's because if you get the thin crust, there may as well not be any crust. You might as well just have cheese with sauce on it. Cheesy bread is is great. And their deep dish pizza is pretty good as well. That's what I usually like. I like their Detroit. I'm actually thinking of having Doe bring me up some of that before we played Dark Souls 2. But we have something else to do, which is what I promised at long last. That is, that is kind of true, Redcon. That is true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Do you and your critters have a favorite pizza place? Yeah, but not it. Listen, the pizza situation up here in the Seattle area is not good. Okay. It is, it's grim. The Seattle pizza culture is bad. It's just, it's not good. There's not a lot of good stuff. I'm sorry. I hate to say it, but we do have a couple places that we like more than others, but you just don't get pizza here like you do elsewhere. 
Mod pizza is fine, but they're mod pizza is not the type of pizza that you get like when you're at home and you're like, I want to order some pizza. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, the, but mod pizza is, is, is fine because it's like, you know, because you can go there and it's pretty decent. Um, yeah. It's not. I had some pretty good pizza there when I went on vacation in the mid-2000s. Well, either you discovered a place I haven't or you're from a place that has even worse pizza because, yeah. Mod has led me astray too much. Have they? I've always found their pizza to be acceptable and like not not acceptable. It's it's fine. It's like you're gonna go there and you're gonna enjoy it. It's not like like ascendant pizza, but you know it's good. It's good. The puppy girl culture makes up for it as an East Coaster. Oh well, of course. I mean Seattle is amazing, and I there are like a million trans people here, of all types. There are many puppy girls here, um, and yeah. Oh, Papa Murphy's is amazing. I love Papa Murphy's. They're crazy good. But there's puppy girls all over too. That's not true. Unfortunately, the puppy girls do not truly live everywhere. I mean, they, they there's probably a puppy girl, but there's not necessarily, they may not, you know, show, show themselves. Question, which is more disgusting? Domino's, Little Caesars, Caesars or Papa John's? Um, well, Papa John's is the most disgusting because the reason for that is because Papa John's will charge you $30 for the most pathetic pizza that you've ever seen in your entire life. And while on a pure quality level, it's probably like slightly better than Domino's, the cost of a Papa John's pizza is so ridiculous and insulting that you can't get that and you can't get that flavor out of your mouth when you're sitting there and you bite into the pizza and it tastes like worse than a frozen pizza and you're like i just paid like 30 dollars for this thing that tastes worse than something that i could get for five dollars in a walmart like frozen section yeah domino's is not good but Domino's is passable until it starts to cool down and then it becomes trash. Domino's is the type of pizza you Domino's is like McDonald's. You can't like warm it up and have it be good. Um, M Domino's legitimately it turns into an inedible ed brick the moment that it cools down, which is really unfortunate. Ink Frog says, "Mama, I introduced my friend to your holy mackerel series and he absolutely loved it." Yes! That's what I'm talking about. Based. Fucking based. Good job. Well done, Ink Frog. Thank you for spreading the word, not just of Demon Mama, but of Holy Mackerel. Arlo says, I legit like cold pizza. I like cold pizza too, but Domino's becomes a, a plank when it's cold. It is... It has no flavor when it's cold. It is actually so bad. Wrong, LB. See, that is the that right there, that is the the mentality of a Domino's eater. LB says, "Demon Mama, that's like saying ice cream is good, but when it melts it's not as good though, so it sucks." Wrong. Pizza should be able to be eaten cold. That's so silly. Gay Fesh says, have you ever had hot Dr. Pepper? No, I've heard that it, that like, it's supposed to be like, that's how it was originally designed to be eaten, but I've never bothered trying because it just didn't sound that, it didn't, even, even the way people described it, it didn't sound that good to me. It's actually really good. Hmm, okay. That's why I prefer the Pizza Hut thin shit. It's better cold. For me, uh, Pizza Hut's best pizza is their um, is their stuffed crust. Like no no question.
That's interesting, Gayfish. I'll have to get. I'll. I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try sometime. Pretty hyped for Dark Souls 2 tonight. You should be. It's gonna be great tonight. But we have to do something else first, which is something that I've promised and prepared for. So if you're watching right now, you should stick around because I did work for this one, okay? I worked hard, okay? Which is I put together a, let me tell you how many characters are in this document, okay? Hold on, no, no, no. Can I get a word count? No, it only does a character count. God damn it, that's not impressive. Is there a word counter? God damn it. All right, let me put it into a word counter on the internet. Let's see it. A 2016 word document, okay? 2016. Um, did I? Oh, yes, I did. Um, I will, uh, here, let me bump this. I didn't mean to write this off, but would you mind sending me an email about that? Um, I needed to think, I need to think on that a little more to see if there's, if we, if we can do that, but I would love to, at the very least, have you on file, Argo. So if you could shoot me an email at Demon Mama online, that will be less likely of me to forget it. That would be great. I, I'm sorry. It's so easy for me to lose Discord DMs. Um, yeah, I Discord is a mess, but yeah. What do you all eat up in washing machine? Lots of really great stuff. Okay, Washington. Stuff that Washington has that's amazing. Seafood, obviously. Seafood in Washington, killer, okay? Just next level, okay? The only place that even comes close is my home state of Maine where the seafood is better than anywhere else in the entire world, okay? Sushi, great, okay? Curry, a crazy amount of really good curry places up here, okay? We found so many killer curry places. It's amazing, okay? You can get so many different types of curry and all of it's great, okay? Next, um, Mediterranean food, okay? I'm talking all types of Mediterranean food. Just killer, okay? Greek food, amazing, okay? Uh, 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 we got, we get, we get Greek, we get, uh, um, we get, we get, um, what's the place I'm thinking of? Oh my God. What's the, what's the place that we went to? Oh yeah, we get Ethiopian food up here that's really good. The Ethiopian uh, food here is, oh, pho. Pho up here, killer. V so the, the, the pho places around here are absolutely amazing. I don't know about French, actually. That's a good question. And then did I say the Mexican food already? Mexican food up here, awesome. We get, we have like, we have like five different Mexican food places that we go to on rotation. That's just killer. Nasty, if you ever come to this to this neck of the woods, we will not only host you, but tour you to all of the coolest places. You would be so beyond welcome. Oh my God, it would be amazing. Love to have you. Oh my God, we'd love to have you. That'd be so much fun. I really like um, I really like uh, Ethiopian food. There's two good French places. One's in Pike Place. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't done a lot of food in Pike Place only because it's very very expensive. Um, yeah, it's so it's so expensive that it makes me go. Ooh. Like I'm not I'm not usually super worried. You know, if we're going out to eat, I'm not gonna like be cheap about it. But but Pike Place is like the tourist center, and sometimes you'll go to Pike Place and you'll order something and you'll get like a food that's like this big and it costs you like forty dollars. And I'm just like, oof, oof. There are some stores in Pike Place I really like though. In Pike Place, there's an Italian deli, um, 
that is slash grocery store and it's amazing oh my god so good no wrong wrong oxy's back sigzo oxy's back sigzo whatever your name is pronounced no it is not taco bell del taco chipotle fuck chipotle fuck chipotle and i would i would fucking I would fucking blacklist Chipotle if it wasn't for everyone else in my house liking Chipotle, except a small victory in the grand war against Chipotle when multiple of my housemates and partners got sick from Chipotle after I warned otherwise. Fuck Chipotle. Taco Bell's cool, but they don't count as... I don't... Taco Bell is fast food. Taco Bell is kibble. Chipotle. Hey, Grime Dango. It's wonderful to see you. Taco Bell is... I am always thankful for Taco Bell, but it is kibble. It's kibble. When I'm talking about... Um, when I'm talking about Mexican food that we rotate through in the area, I'm talking restaurants and food trucks, which in, in this area, it is in a fucking amazing. There are two separate restaurants that do uh, uh, a their own spin on street corn. One of them, they put the street corn in a bowl. So it's like a bunch of, of fresh corn kernels with the... Um, the like cheese and the mayo and the uh, the 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 uh, pepper flakes and tons of lime. It's fucking amazing. It depends on the way that they do it. Lots of street corn does mayo. Other ones do like butter mostly, but yeah. Rat Shepherd says, hey, Demon Mama, I'm a Louisiana transplant who lives in Seattle. Walrus and the Carpenter is stellar seafood. And as for French, Le, Le Piché is pretty good. To everyone in chat, Seattle food is great. You can find nearly everything except for good Cajun food. Okay, Le Piché. I'm going to keep that in mind. All right? I'm putting that on my list. I'm putting it in my notebook to go check that out because I have not had any French food in this area, and that sounds great. And I'll also check out Walrus and the Carpenter for seafood. But I've, I know a lot of really good seafood. I've found so many. There's even a main themed restaurant here that we found that's amazing. Um, also, the main themed restaurant has made to date my partner's favorite Moscow mule in the entire city. In fact, the Moscow mule at the main restaurant has been sort of the gold standard that my partner has been trying to replicate and nowhere has done it well. They do a, um, they do a Moscow mule with hibiscus in it and it's like, it pops. It's great. Also, hold on. Grime Dango said something. The Athenian. I've never been to the Athenian. Moscow Mule, is that booze? Yeah, a Moscow Mule is um, a vodka drink mixed with ginger beer usually or or depending on the place um they might use like real like pureed ginger in like a soda water type thing it really depends but it's ginger and vodka um and it's pretty good they're very strong they have a lot of bite to them um yeah they serve them in uh, copper mugs um oh yeah lime juice i forgot the I forgot the lime juice and um some places we now know will add hibiscus in there and it's amazing. It's they're really good. I am not a big drinker. I don't drink much alcohol. Um almost 
ever. Um, I drink like small amounts every once in a while. Um, but I like the Moscow Mule. I used to drink more when I was younger, but I don't really drink that much. Alcohol kind of fucking sucks. Uh, it has its place, which is, I think alcohol is best enjoyed when drunk in small, small, like literally small amounts. Uh, I don't know. That's the way I am. That sounds incredible, Nerodia. I do have uh, some soju that I got the other day, and I like soju. Um, yeah. Tatra tea? What's Tatra tea? Tatra tea. Tea-based herbal liqueur. Whoa, that sounds cool as hell. I wonder if I can get that around here. Oh, I can. We don't. I don't know if they'll stock it nearby, but I can order some. I should order some. Wow. Wow. Slovakia, clear, deep, coppery amber with, with burnished bronze highlight, a nose of English breakfast tea, caddy, and cracked black pepper spice. What the fuck? That sounds amazing. What the hell? That, that sounds fucking good. Oh, no. Wait, it doesn't look like I can have it shipped. I might have to find that somewhere. Okay, I'm gonna try and get my hands on some of that nasty. Isn't it amazing, Argo? Tunic is such an amazing game. Oh my God, it's so incredible. What a magical game. Also, hold on. Wait, hold on. What's this called? Ha okay, wait. Um, nasty. Have you... Wait, I, I mean, surely you have, but... Um, Be Besherovka? Besherovka? Becherovka? I don't know how it's said. I don't know how it's pronounced. The The Christmas drink? Um, that I had a friend from Prague many years ago give me a bottle of that and that stuff was amazing. Why? It literally, it just does. It tastes like Christmas in a bottle. I didn't know it was literally the national drink, the national alcohol uh, of the Czech Republic, but here you, I guess you learn every day. But I had a bottle of that that we had. We drank it slowly over the course of like a year. It was amazing. Very intense, incredibly intense flavor. But it's just like, it was incredible. Bekharovka, there we go. Incredible stuff. What's America's national drink? Corn squeezins. <laughs> Lead. Corn syrup. I see we have a lot of we have a lot of America doubters here. Okay, everybody. All right, enough of this. All right, this is another thing. I gotta try this one. I gotta try this tea thing that Nasty just recommended. I gotta try that. 
So that's going on the list. But we have to do, we have to do, I have another thing, okay? I have another thing, all right? It's time. We gotta do a segment. And I put a lot of work into this segment. So you should stick around for it, even if you don't usually stick around for my gaming content. You guys ready? I'm ready. Bazinga. Let's do it. Let's do it. My lovely, lovely imps. Today, it comes at last. I promised you all that I was going to do a full review of Dragon's Dogma 2. If you haven't seen my first impressions video, it's on my channel, very easy to find. I'll put it in the description down below, but go check it out. Um, I did a first impressions video after playing somewhere in the ballpark of 20 hours. And then I promised that I was going to do a full review of Dragon's Dogma 2 once I beat the game. Well, it's happened. I beat the game. And I beat the game with a fairly high level of completion, actually. Um, I did a lot of the stuff in the game, and I have just so many thoughts about Dragon's Dogma 2. And uh, if you haven't seen my first impressions video, it's a good idea to watch it, watch it first so you can see how my approach and opinions changed from the first 20 hours to when I had become a grizzled veteran of Dragon's Dogma 2 at the uh, somewhere around almost 100 hours um, mark. Played a lot of Dragon's Dogma 2. Let's talk about it. So Dragon's Dogma 2 um, is obviously uh, a sequel, but it is a sequel to a cult game, a game that was incredibly, incredibly popular within a certain niche, a game that was not really a AAA game, and now its new version is almost inarguably a AAA game made with a large budget by a major studio. And um, it had a, a pretty ambitious, you know, task in front of it. Um, the, the hype for the game was unreal. I was very surprised by just how much attention Dragon's Dogma 2 was getting online. Um, but also, the director of the game um, was sort of going around and doing interviews with some major magazines in advance of the game that got it a lot of attention for some of the bold claims that were made. And I'm going to talk about those in a few minutes. Um, in my opinion, having played a decent chunk of Dragon's Dogma 1 and now played all of Dragon's Dogma 2, you do not need to play Dragon's Dogma 1 in order to enjoy Dragon's Dogma 2. But you should probably just go play Dragon's Dogma 1 for a number of reasons. Mostly because it's really fun. And I had a lot of fun with Dragon's Dogma 1. And I have to say, I think that Dragon's Dogma 2 failed to follow up on the sheer innovative and unique level uh, um, that Dragon's Dogma 1 was operating on. But I'll get into all that in a second. There are going to be spoilers in this review. But the type of spoilers that I'm going to be doing are illustrative for the purposes of this. And they're not going to, hopefully, completely spoil the experience. Um, most of what is going to be spoiled is going to be the story. And I wouldn't worry too much about that for reasons that I'm going to get into. Um, the greatest part of Dragon's Dogma 2 has nothing to do... It cannot be spoiled, okay? So don't worry about listening to this review and feeling like you're going to you know, that things are going to be ruined for you. It's impossible for me to ruin the parts of Dragon's Dogma 2 that are good. Um, so don't stress that too much. But there will be spoilers in this review, just in case it's, it's particularly important to you. Anyway, let's get into this. Dragon's Dogma 2 is an RPG. It is an action uh, uh, game that has RPG elements. And the sort of core feature that Dragon's Dogma brought to the table that very few other games have done is this system called the Pawn System. The Pawn System is uh, really, really amazing. 
And uh, it, in my opinion, it only got better in Dragon's Dogma 2 with very few exceptions. The pawn system is a system by which you make your own little custom sidekick, basically. They're a NPC uh, that helps you in battle, carries your stuff for you, follows you around through the entire game, and gets up to all kinds of hijinks. And what's really special about the pawn system is that um, there's a ton of options, first of all, for their personalities, but more importantly, you can share your pawn with other people, and other people's pawns can be shared with you. Which means when you're playing the game, chances are you're going to have a party full of other people's pawns mixing and hanging out with and talking back and forth with your pawn. And those people's pawns can carry knowledge from, their, from another game that they played with another pl person to your game. So an example, you bring a pawn into your world from somebody who's already done the quest that you are on right now, and that pawn might say, Arisen, I have information about this quest that could help you. And then you can press a little button and it'll and that pawn can tell you information about the quest. Or sometimes they'll just say, I don't think we're going to find what we're looking for here, my lord. Kind of amazing. I love it. It's kind of beautiful. The pawn system is incredible. And um, that's one of the biggest things that this game has to... Uh, that the Dragon's Dogma series brings to the table. And let me tell you, Dragon's Dogma 2 did an absolutely amazing job uh, adding more and, and infusing the pawn system with love. In fact, I think that the pawn system is perhaps my favorite thing in the entire game. Uh, all the way through, from the beginning to the end, a hundred hours somewhere in the ballpark of gameplay and the pawn system was still entertaining to me all the way to the end. I had multiple pawns that there were other people's pawns that I added to my uh, party that I ended up keeping for a really long time. One such example was a pawn named A2, which was modeled to look just like the character from Nier named A2. So this was, somebody had made a character from another game, put it into the pawn system, and I brought that pawn into my party and adventured with that pawn for a really long time. And it was, it was awesome, okay? It was fantastic. They remade A2, looked just like the character from, from Nier. Uh, and I, in fact, I think that that pawn was the, uh, and I'll tell you about this, at the end of the game, they do a little stats screen while the credits are rolling, and they show you the pawns that you adventured the longest with. And my number one pawn was A2, and my number two pawn was this unbelievably yoked mage by the name of Klaus, okay? I had somebody made this, this sorcerer pawn whose name was Klaus, and he was sick, okay? This guy was dripped up. He had face tats, he had a little crown, he had jewelry, he had this red robe that was flowing all over the place. The guy was sick, okay? And also, he had the most overpowered magic. The person who, who made this pawn stacked him up with the best spells that you could possibly unlock for sorcerer. So this pawn completely was wrecking monsters for me. It was incredible. And I kept him in my party for like, I don't know, a, like a quarter of the game time played. It was amazing, okay? It was incredible. Klaus, you were a real one. A2, you were a real one. And I loved that at the end of the game that it shows your pawns and they're doing their little animations and you get to see them as like your number one companion. And it's like A2 doing like cool moves with her sword. And then it's like Klaus, and he's like whoosh. Excellent, amazing touch, okay? Pawn system, beautiful. You get attached to these wonderful creatures. They have unique interactions. They've all, because there's so many different personalities you can choose, there's like, there's like 
five overarching personalities and then the pawns learn stuff and they change slightly as they go through the game. So there's like a lot of variety in the ways the pawns can approach. And it's very funny because sometimes you'll get a pawn who's a total asshole. Let's just put it that way, okay? You'll get a pawn that's constantly talking down to you or whatever or insulting the other pawns. And other times you'll get a pawn that's a total pushover sweetheart. It's The variety is great. And the way that the pawns interact with each other is just so much fun in this game. Um, and of course, you know, I mentioned the comparison to Dragon's Dogma 1, which I'm going to do a couple times throughout this lengthy review. Um, but... Uh, there is a lot more variety of lines, dialogue, spontaneid, spont spontaneous dialogue, all kinds of stuff like that than the first game. The second game has a lot more. So uh, you will still hear from time to time repeated lines, sometimes lines that you hear way too often, but it's much better than <laughs> Dragon's Dogma 1. In Dragon's Dogma 1, soaked to the bone! Wolves hunt in packs arisen. Be careful arisen. Like those lines, there is aught here. Like you would hear those lines so goddamn much. Soaked to the bone, soaked to the bone. Wolves hunt in packs arisen. God, like every 10 seconds, wolves hunt in packs arisen. That guy wasn't a pawn. People are talking about the masterworks all can't go wrong. That guy is not a pawn. That's just a normal shopkeeper that you have to go to 100,000 times. Um, but the uh, pawn lines were... There were not as many pawn lines in Dragon's Dogma 1 as there are in Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, you still get some repeats, but it's not nearly as bad. Um, anyway, the, the pawn system is perhaps my favorite part of Dragon's Dogma 2. And... That alone had me still having fun all the way to the end of my playthrough. Um, I want to talk about the other things that I loved about Dragon's Dogma 2 first, before I get into anything else. Um, the uh, other thing that I really like about Dragon's Dogma 2 is the wackiness factor that is present in the combat all the way through the game. There is an approach to combat, and in fact, I wish that they would have leaned even more into it, um, that there's just this goofiness to the... I shouldn't call it goofy, because it's not It's not really, like, like, silly. It's not like, you know, there's funny noises or anything. It's wacky, okay? It's just unpredictable, weird things that happen. I, an example that I talked about in my... Um, in my first little first impressions video was um, my pawn at one point going, I'll save you master and flinging herself off of a, off of a cliff onto the head of an ogre, which immediately toppled over into a river, killing both of them immediately. Just like that type of stuff happens so frequently. And uh, I love it. There are uh, there are monsters that can pick you up and throw you, and you'll just go, like, rolling across and land somewhere else. You might even land in another group of enemies. Um, the, the, the wacky aspect of combat is so great. There are times where a giant enemy will chase you into a tiny location, and it will barely be able to move. It'll be struggling... Uh, it's struggling and it'll be chaotic and it's ridiculous. There are, um, there's these lizards in the game that one of their moves is that they roll up into a ball and they like sonic roll themselves at you. And if you step out of the way, they'll just go flying. So sometimes you'll hear like a grumbling noise and you could just like speed up by sprinting real quick and a lizard will just like, like hot wheels launch itself off of a cliff into the distance. There <coughs> There is a spell that you can get um, for, uh, or a, a skill that you can get as warriors, which is like the big two-handers, where you can like wind up like a baseball style strike and you can knock an enemy into the distance and they literally like fly off and disappear. You don't, if you kill an enemy like that, you don't get treasure and you don't get experience. You just get the joy of baseball home run batting an enemy off into the foreign distance. It's, it's, absolutely incredible okay um <laughs> it's great the wacky aspect is 
amazing. I love it. Oh, another example of this. There's a spell in the game that lets you summon a tornado, and it picks up enemies and turns them into physics objects. So you can crash enemies into each other, and with the tornado, you can basically scoop up a bunch of goblins, and and if an ogre is there, the goblins will be getting pelted. Their, their bodies will be getting pelted into the ogre or into the dragon or whatever else you're fighting. Awesome. Okay? Truly awesome. So that's that's the other thing that I really love about this game. Um, and, oh, oh my God, I want to talk about one more thing. There's another thing you can do in the game, which is you can pick up enemies that are prone or dead and throw them at each other. And you can make enemies hit each other mid-air. I have picked up a, a, a stunned goblin and thrown him at another goblin that was doing a jump attack at me, had them collide in the air, and both of them die. Awesome. Just amazing. I love it. Oh my god. Just, that feels so cool and is very funny, okay? So there's one more thing that I truly love about the game, and I wanted to, I want to, I want to talk about it, which is the fashion, okay? And I'm going to show you some pictures of my character throughout the game because I love the fashion in this game so very much, okay? And I have a lot of... So I want to show you where my character started, okay? Real quick, here's my character, all right? First of all, isn't she beautiful? She's beautiful, she's strong, she's ripped. She looks amazing. Doesn't she look incredible? This is where she started, okay? Amazing starting drip. Very simple, but but a, a, a aesthetically pleasing staff. Cool little scale crown. Feathery feathers on the shoulders. We got her little serpentine bracelets and this little gem studded thing, okay? Amazing, right? Okay? Well, it just keeps getting better because as the game goes on, I had so many different incredible outfits. My God. So here was one of my, oh, let me get a, let me get a nice shot of this one. Okay. Hold on. Let me get this one up here. All right. Here we go. Here's my pawn as an archer with some, uh, as you can see, we got a little bit of uh, World of Warcraft shoulder plate going on here, but I've got like a thorn bow, this big, really attractive red quiver, matching red suit. I've got an over-the-shoulder cape here. I've got like a little bit of like this uh, sort of chainmail type stuff going on here. No more, uh, no more crown. This is as a, with an archer outfit, okay? And I got more. It's gonna keep go keep going. Here, of course, is one of my favorite pictures from the entire game. <laughs> Wait, hold on, let me let me show you the one. All right. Here we go. Here we go. One of my favorite screenshots I got. This is me holding the A2 pawn, by the way. This is, I think, the only screenshot I got of the A2 pawn. <laughs> this is with that same out, or, oh no, I slightly modified this outfit. So you can see now I've got a different, uh, slightly different top on, carrying the A2 pawn. And down here in the corner, you can see Yoda. Yoda's over here. There's a, there's a zoomed out picture where we can see Yoda a little bit closer. There's Yoda wearing a wolf hat and a wolf fur leggings and a wolf fur cloak. And this, this is another pawn we've got. As you can see, she's got like sort of golden wings. Great. The, the fashion is amazing. But I'm not done yet. I want to show you some of my other amazing fashions through the game. Are you guys ready for it to get kicked into ultimate level? All right. Are you ready for the, the absolute the most incredible drip of the entire game, perhaps. Check this. Look at this. God damn, what a sick outfit. I've got the this this smoking sensor. I've got this uh, leather strap outfit with the over-the-shoulder feathers, with the multi-eye veil hood. You get these... Sh no shoulders puffy s sleeves that swing behind you that have golden eyes embroidered on the inside of the sleeve. Look at this. The detail in these outfits are amazing. Just so, but the inside of the sleeves has golden eyes. Whoa, just incredible. Okay. 
but I got more, okay? I've got even more outfits. Take a look at this one. Take a look at my late game archer drip, okay? Oh no, wait, this was actually as a mystic spear hand, not archer. Here's me carrying one of my wives. That's right, you can have many lovers in these games, which is impressive. Incredible. I've got the dark leather up here with the with the green and gold straps. I have a golden laurels matching the green and gold here, matching the green and gold here with the dark red, reddish brown leather. Incredible, just amazing. And of course, hold on, let me show you my later game stuff, the, my actual late game stuff. Hold on, let me get this one up for you. Wait, do we got the shot? Let me find it. Oh yeah, here's just a really cool cinematic shot. Okay, this doesn't show the whole drip, but you can see my character, how she looks towards the end of the game. I've got silver feathers on one end, like real feathers on the other, the silver armor, the mask that's got the black and white pattern, and the, this little diadem or whatever this is. Incredible. But hold on, let me get you the full shot so you can see the whole outfit. Where is that one? That is here. Here's the full outfit. No, wait, this is not with the silver. This is with before I switched to the silver armor. Here we go. There's the one with the silver armor. Unfortunately, the lighting is kind of fucked up here, but you can see the full end game drip. I've got, uh, I've got leg. The 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 leg piece is blood rune wraps. So I have like cloths with red blood runes written on them, wrapped all around my legs actually amazing with this by the way you can't see this because these are just screenshots but this mask shimmers so these patterns on the mask they change they shift over it it keeps constantly moving that that white and black pattern moves across the mask when it's in the real actual gameplay really really amazing okay the fashion in this game i think i've shown just and that's i'm showing you a tiny selection of the available outfit options in this game it is the, the 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 armor choices are amazing there are so many good ones oh actually i have one more to show here we go this was the one that i used before i got that silver armor this is a uh, a rare end game dress it's 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 made with dragon scales and black leather You've got like these little winged eyes on the belt, golden big bracelets, and a little top here that's got this like scale going, thing going on. Actually incredible, the amount of outfits that you can do in Dragon's Dogma 2. And I wanted to give a lot of attention to it because it deserves praise. I love fashion in games, and this game really hits the spot. The outfits are very different for each of the classes, and they look... They're, they're just, they're mix and matchable. You can make your own custom outfits. You don't have to stick to sets. Um, the sets blend well with one another. It's really, really, really cool. So that's what I love about Dragon's Dogma. And now I'm gonna talk about some of the things that I like about Dragon's Dogma. And then we're gonna talk into my critiques of Dragon's Dogma 2. Um, because There's a lot to talk about there. And I want to make this as f complete and and full of a review as possible. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about what I like. So this game has a really cool day-night cycle. There is a lot of differences between exploring the world during the day and exploring the world at night. Uh, not just visibility, but the types of enemies that appear and the frequency of enemies, in addition to where people are in the game world, changes. Um, the the NPCs have totally different cycles at night and may completely d become inaccessible as they go into their houses or whatever at nighttime versus at day. The day-night cycle, there's a lot of love put into the day-night cycle and a lot of attention was paid into the experience of navigating at night um, navigating at night is very dangerous. It's very hard to see, um, but there are some advantages, and this is what, what's really, really cool. At nighttime, treasures of certain types glow. 
fairly brightly, in fact, which means while it is significantly harder to find your way around the environment and there are way more enemies that are stronger, enemies get stronger at night, you can actually find certain treasures significantly easier if you're exploring an area that you know at night. So if you get the familiarity, if you get familiarity with an area during the daytime and then you revisit that area at night, you might find a lot of stuff that's fairly valuable to you um, or could be fairly valuable to you at the nighttime. Uh, additionally, there is a real sense of peril, uh, especially in the like first third of the game when you're traveling at night. If you're traveling at night, you are going to be getting attacked. There is a lot more enemies at night and you cannot see very far, which means the likelihood of you being ambushed by something pretty scary uh, goes way up. The day-night cycle, I really like it. There's also, which something that ties into this, is a camping system. There are camp sites all over the world that you can use. They're fairly plentiful. Um, and you can camp at a campsite and eat a meal, uh, restore your lost HP, because in this game, when you lose HP, a certain percentage of the damage is taken as permanent HP loss until you rent until you rest again, which means that you gotta rest at some point because otherwise your HP bar is just gonna keep getting smaller and smaller as you get more tired. Um, and that means that this camping system is fairly important. You can also pass time when you're at a camp, uh, but there's a percentage chance of you getting ambushed when you camp. And getting ambushed is no good. If you get ambushed, you don't get to restore the stuff that you needed and you can lose some of your camping materials, which means that you're incentivized to choose between different camping materials, which are more advantageous in different areas. There is a certain type of camping gear that is good in the forest and makes you harder to detect versus stuff that you use in the desert. Um, Really cool. Camping system works great, feels good, gives you a, a sort of punctuation to your adventures where, okay, I've taken a lot of damage, I better rest and camp. Additionally, other things that I like is the save system. At least, I should say, ideally. And I'll get into this in the criticism section, but the save system in the ideal is that you only save when... Um, you rest at a tavern when you manually save the game or at certain very ostensibly very sparse autosave locations. So uh, if you make a big decision, the game will autosave. If uh, you enter a new, uh, new area you've never been into before, like a new uh, country or whatever, autosave. But uh, actually the truth is that the autosaves are a lot more common and I don't know if this was a last minute change or what, but in my experience, the auto saves happen all the time and actually, you don't actually lose any progress. Now in Dragon's Dogma 1, you lost a lot of progress. The game only auto saved, um, the game only saved when you saved it yourself, when you rested at a tavern, or when uh, you entered uh, like at like certain very key locations, so like a safe location. If you entered into a camp, uh, like an encampment or a small city, then you would get an auto save, but not not guaranteed. So, uh, unfortunately, in Dragon's Dogma Two, it seems like somewhere along the process they decided to be pretty generous with auto saves. And to me, I found that there was never a situation where I lost any progress except for one time, which was a bug. And I'm going to talk about the bugs in a little bit. And that was infuriating. The progress that I lost as a result of the bug was very, very infuriating. But it was not like a designed or intentional progress loss. It was very stupid. Um, extremely annoying. Um, yeah. So, two more things that I like about the game. The variable stamina system. Uh, in this game, you have a stamina bar for all of your actions. Everything that you do takes stamina. And the stamina bar uh, depletes faster if you are have a lot of stuff in your backpack, but also if you're carrying things in your arms, um, if you are sprinting, 
And this is where it gets really cool. If you are running uphill, it will deplete faster. And if you are running downhill, it will deplete slower. So in the ideal, you can chart paths towards certain locations that avoid going uphill and instead let you head downhill so that you're expending less stamina and also running faster so you can sprint and get to locations faster. That's really cool. Now, unfortunately, I have another critique that's tied to this, which is that I don't think they use the variable stamina system to their fullest almost at all throughout the entire game. But it is really cool in the in the abstract. The idea that like you're that there are like system reasons. It almost reminds me a tiny bit, and I say a tiny bit, of Death Stranding, where Death Stranding has a ton of thought that you have to put into the traversal, where every surface affects you differently and will tire your character out and will change how you're approaching the world. It's a small drop of Death Stranding um, that is really cool, and I love that. It, me it means you're putting a lot of thought, or at least you would be putting a lot of thought, into your traversal of the world, which seems like that was something that was very important to the devs. Unfortunately, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, I don't think they fully succeeded. One more thing that I like before we move on to the critique segment. Uh, the enemies that do exist in the game are, especially for the first, I'd say, 40% of your playthrough, are really, really fun to fight. Um, the, the iconic example is the Cyclops. So, the Cyclops is what they showed off in basically every single trailer of the game. Um, but basically all of the enemies that are in the game have variable damage, weaknesses, and effects based on where you're attacking them. It almost reminds me a little bit of Monster Hunter, a tiny, tiny bit, in the sense that different body parts have different weaknesses. For an example, on your when you're fighting a Cyclops, its eye, which is a really tiny, really, really tiny vulnerable point, is really weak. If you hit it in the eye, it will be blinded temporarily, potentially permanently, depending on how hard you hit it. And it will start attacking indiscriminately. It won't be able to target anybody. It might even just be attacking off into the distance where nobody is standing because it's blinded. It will also take a crazy amount of damage, but you can break off horns, claws. There's all kinds of parts that you can break off. When you're fighting a griffin, you can set a griffin's wings on fire and that griffin will come to the ground. Awesome. Really cool. Feels super, super fun. Um, there's a lot of love put into the encounters, like into, um, I should say, into the first encounters with most monsters. Um, usually the first time that you encounter a new monster is going to be really cool. Uh, you're going to just be like, wow, what? what? Like one of the first uh, Cyclopses that I ever encountered in the game burst out of a wall. It crashed through a cave in the mountain and it literally just burst through the wall and rocks went flying everywhere. Rocks which are physics objects and could do damage and can be thrown back at the guy. Uh, the the first time you encounter a griffin swooping in and destroying everything in your path, really, really cool. Those enemies that do exist, especially the first time that you encounter them, are really fun and exciting. And that is where I have to stop the positivity. Um, a lot of this review so far, as you can tell, has been very positive. And I structured that like that for a reason. I wanted you guys to understand very viscerally why I want to talk about this game and why I spent so much time in the game because there's a lot of stuff to really, really, really like. Um, but unfortunately, there's also a lot of problems with this game. And that's the section we're going to go into now, which is the stuff that I hate, stuff that I dislike, and worst of all, the things that I believe are completely and and utterly broken. Um, so, Dragon's Dogma is a huge game. Okay, there's a lot in it. It's like um, 
it's a, it's it's a pretty big game. When you look at the game map, it's almost overwhelming at first. Now, as you actually play the game, uh, they kind of cheat a little bit. The game map is not even close to as big as it seems when you first get in. There are a lot of areas in the map that are simply uh, inaccessible, but appear that they might be accessible. It seems a, it feels a little bit deceptive. Um, there's, but it's still a very large game, and there's a lot in it. So keep that all in mind when I'm talking about almost everything here, okay? So let's start. This is probably the biggest problem. I shouldn't say that, but it's a big problem, okay? Um, the enemy variety in Dragon's Dogma 2 is inexcusable. Um, it is bad. Okay, it's truly, truly bad. And in my opinion, uh, is going to make a lot of players not like this game. And that's a huge shame because the monsters that do exist are really cool. Um, and Dragon's Dogma 1 had more monsters, more monster variety. A game that came out over a decade ago had more monsters and more monster variety in the base game than this game does in a world that is much bigger with much more variety in it except for all the enemies. Um, it's a, a, a serious weak spot um, for this game. The fact that uh, when I when I first jumped into the game and I saw like that there was like a there was like a list of badges for fighting enemies. I'm like, surely there's secret badges that they're not revealing because they don't want you to show it. But no, there is somewhere in the ballpark of 20 or so total enemies, maybe a little more. I don't know the exact list. I don't know the exact count. I would ballpark it somewhere in the ballpark of about 20 enemies in the entire game. And um, that's not going to cut it in a game like this. Uh, the enemy variety is worse than basically any other game that this game like seeks to compare itself to. And one of the biggest problems is not just the variety, but the, the way that the encounters go. So um, the, the devs of this game, um, and I'm going to read a quote real quick for you because I feel like this quote is incredibly important to keep in mind, one of the most like publicized quotes at the very beginning of the game was from the uh, game, the director of the game, Itsuno. Um, and I'm going to read you this quote real quick. This was from the IGN article uh, uh, interviewing uh, Itsuno. Okay, are you ready? Just give it a try. Travel is boring. That's not true. That's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. In this particular instance, he was talk he was asked about why he opposes fast travel. And we're going to talk about that in full in a second. So this is about travel. You know, it's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. That's why you place things in the right location for players to discover or come up with enemy appearance methods that create different experiences each time or force players into blind situations where they don't know whether or safe whether or not it's safe 10 meters in front of them. That's a quote directly from, from the director of the game, okay? And uh, uh, I think it is a shocking show of arrogance to call other games boring when the enemy variety is so low, so unbelievably low. In this game, you will do a lot of walking between locations. And for the first maybe 20% to 30% of the game, it's going to be it's going to feel pretty fresh, okay? Uh it's it's like wow, cool, I'm going to these different locations. But as the game goes on, you are going to get incredibly incredibly tired of walking between uh basically paths bet through the forest or uh, or or like paths through mountain valleys that are full of 
a patch of wolves, a patch of goblins, a patch of harpies, a patch of wolves, a patch of goblins, a patch of harpies, a patch of wolves. Oh, an ogre. Wolves, goblin, harpy. Oh, oh, more, more goblins. Goblins, harpy, goblins, harpy, wolf. You're going to get so tired of encountering those guys. And while, yes, the enemy variety does slowly crawl up as the game goes through, um, you reach a point where uh, once you've seen every enemy type, getting sp spontaneously attacked by an enemy that you've already fought before with no real combination with other enemies, um, is it, it's not entertaining anymore. Now, there are times where you will encounter like wolves and goblins or goblins and harpies but you almost never almost never in a hundred hours of play have i encountered you know uh, uh uh a bunch of goblins fighting a dragon or a bunch of goblins getting attacked by wolves and then an ogre comes in and is trying to eat the wolves and knocking the goblins all over the place it's incredibly rare there were probably two or three entire times in the game when I can think of like, uh, where there was a real like monster mishmash situation. And most of them were like scripted, not scripted events, but they were pre-planned events. There's like one area on the map where you can fight two Cyclopses at the same time. There's one area where you're most likely to get attacked by a Griffin and the Griffin might land on you while you're fighting some goblins. Total missed opportunity. This game would have been so much better if, first of all, they added more types of monsters for you encounter in the first place. But secondly, if the game was actually able to, to figure out how to spawn varieties of monsters in an interesting way. And this gets worse when we get to some of the other stuff I'm about to talk about. Um, like, for example, I'll, I'll actually bring this in right now because I think it, it's a good segue. Um, combat balance. The combat balance in this game is deeply, deeply flawed, okay? Um, when you reach a certain point in the game, I would say somewhere in the ballpark of like the 50% point of the game, um, combat stops feeling like anything at all. In the early game, you feel like you're having these big struggling back and forths where enemies take a lot of hits and you can take a lot of hits and you're trying bunches of different abilities and it takes you a bit to get through some of these enemies but you reach a certain point in the game and like this is without like farming or anything like that i just played the game and followed my impulses and it got to a point where um small enemies like goblins and wolves would just be deleted immediately you could just instantly delete them so they're not a threat anymore, really, at all. And they don't last in a fight. So it's not like you're having like a big interesting battle with two rival gangs of, of goblins fighting each other and you're in the middle and it's like this whole back and forth thing. No, you just delete all the goblins and it's over. Um, it becomes like very, very quickly. Um, does this happen? But there's another problem of it, which is that um, as the game goes on, the numbers are so imbalanced that hard fights are uh, enemies one-shot you and you uh, rapidly melt enemies. And what this creates is a very swingy feel to the combat that, in my opinion, feels terrible, like just horrible. So let me give you an example of how an endgame fight might go. Um, you're walking down the road. There's a dragon. You see the dragon. You walk up to the dragon. You shoot the dragon with your biggest, strongest attack. The dragon gets mad. Maybe you do a big chunk of its health bar. It turns over to you. The dragon flies up into the air and does a, a stomp attack on you. Now, uh, it's kind of hard to read a lot of the abilities, so you might have thought that the breath attack was coming. Uh, either way, it doesn't really matter. If you got hit by either the breath attack or the stomp attack, your whole health bar is gone. Unless you're playing as a very specific class. But as most classes, your health bar is gone. Which means you immediately press the pause menu button and you eat a bunch of um, fish. Or you eat a potion. Or you eat a bunch of um, what are called roborants. They're little healing items. How 
Just munch it up, unpause, your health's back to full again. Oh, maybe the dragon does a second attack and deletes your entire health bar again. It's okay, open up your pause menu, eat another poison and you're back, or eat another potion and you're back to full health again. That's That becomes the combat after you reach about the 50% point of the game. So half of the game is you either instantly deleting completely stupid enemies that don't do anything to you and pose no threat whatsoever, just boom, 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 gone, 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 or it's you fighting an enemy that has a huge health bar and does all of your health in one hit, but then you recover your health instantly anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, the only time that you will ever use um, like an item called a wake stone, which are like an extra life, of which there are tons of these in the game, by the way. I'm going to go all in on the whole difficulty here as we go on. You can already hear me complaining about it. You get a lot of wake stones in the game. They're extra lives. The only time you're ever going to use one uh, is when you're not fast enough at pressing the start menu to eat a bunch of fish or, or apples or potions. Um, very silly. T feels terrible, especially with the fact that the abilities in the game feel great they put all this love into these cool abilities into the weighty combat the bow feels great to shoot i loved playing bow the big double-handed swords and hammers feel great doesn't matter um you're just gonna be doing this back and forth of if you get hit at all uh you're gonna just eat a bunch of healing items and it won't matter and then maybe if you're not fast enough you have to use a wake stone or if you've gotten hit enough your hp might be so low that you die instantly and then you need to use a wake stone. Um, I think in 100 hours of play, I used about like 18 wake stones. And that includes wake stones that I used on other players. Cause like, or on other characters. Because uh, if an NPC dies in your game, you, have to use, you can use a wake stone to bring them back to life. Because NPCs have permadeath in this game. And that can mess things up um, with quests and whatever. Pretty silly. Uh, hits... Uh, basically become meaningless um, and it starts to feel like an interruption to the flow of the game when you're just pressing pause, eating healing items, unpausing, trying to get out of... There's... Did I mention there's no dodge in this game? There's no dodging. There's no parrying. Actually, sorry. There is parrying, but only as a specific class. So only fighters and um, and and warrior... Or Sorry. Yeah, only fighters and warriors can have any type of block parry mechanic and it's fairly limited um all other classes no dodge no parry you just have to sort of goofily walk out of the way um and on this front i have to be very mean here i hate usually doing this but i'm going to do it here on this front it starts to feel like monster hunter but bad which is a terrible place to be in in monster hunter um one of the big things in that game is that monsters hit really hard and um, they have like a lot of movement that you have to read. Your dodges have very few iframes, if any, depending on your build in Monster Hunter. You do have a dodge, but you have to spend a lot of time predicting enemy, enemy motion. But that's not really the case here. The enemies move, the, the design is not given to like being able to predict enemy mo mo motion very well. You don't have any dodge at all. You just kind of have to walk or move out of the way. And there's a big focus on enemies that do hit combos, which is really dumb. If you get a dragon that does a three hit strike on you, entire health bar gone, pause, eat. Boom, entire health bar gone, pause, eat, unpause. Boom! Entire health bar gone. Pause. Eat. Unpause. Combo done. Terrible. You don't have any means to break out of a combo, really, at all, as most classes. Um, just not good. It's crazy how the first third, the first few hours of the game can feel so good, and the later can feel so bad. And also, the damage scaling which is, this is a part of the combat balance that I'm talking about, gets to the point where most enemies are really not a threat at all. When I got to the last boss of the game, or no, I shouldn't say the last, okay, yeah, the hardest enemy in the game. Uh, I, when I got to the hardest single enemy in the game, uh, it took me, I don't know, maybe eight minutes total to beat him, and it was nothing. It was easy. And I was not, like, super over-leveled or anything to my knowledge. I was just playing the game as it felt to me. 
Um, yeah, it it sucked, and it was very disappointing. And I, I was really, really frustrated with that aspect. And I think that it's a huge shame because, uh, like I said, for the first third of the game, it feels incredible. And if they just, all they really needed to do was take a slightly different approach, tune the numbers slightly different, but it's, it, as it stands, it's just terrible. Um, I don't know why. Uh, because, again, uh, for the first third of the game, it's like, wow, okay, this feels like... Uh, it feels like um, slightly casual Monster Hunter type combat. It's not as hardcore as Monster Hunter, but the game isn't supposed to be as hardcore, you know? It just feels like you're playing like a like a little more casual Monster Hunter. You get to climb all over the enemies and the battles take a while. In Dragon's Dogma 1, that game had fairly long combat encounters, which was great in a lot of ways. Some people don't like that style because they feel bad about, you know, having to slowly chip an enemy down, but it felt good in my opinion. When I played Dragon's Dogma 1, I loved the fact that monster fights took a long time and that they usually didn't kill you in one hit, that they were kind of these long battles of attrition. And I think that was great. Not so in Dragon's Dogma 2. They feel very bad as the game goes on. Um, yeah, it's un very unfortunate. Uh, and that should be a word of warning. Now, keep in mind, I did keep playing the game, and there was still stuff that I was having fun with all the way until the end of the game, but at every, at the further, the longer you play the game, the more the combat starts to feel bad. And there's another problem that ties into this, okay? Which is that, uh, in Dragon's Dogma 2, they made a very weird decision. And that is that they lowered the ability slots from six in Dragon's Dogma 1 to four in Dragon's Dogma 2. You have your face buttons, okay? Now they added in some, some other things. There's like some passive abilities, but they're pretty minuscule in most cases. The passive abilities are not all that impactful in my opinion. I mean, sometimes they are, but they're not like, they don't feel like you're spending a lot of time thinking about them. And some of them are really like, just like, uh, well, obviously. Like for example, the passive ability for archers is that you can aim. Obviously, w what? Come on. Um, but the fact that there's only four slots is terrible, okay? It's really bad and it gets really bad. Um, we're gonna talk about the Warfarer but, and we're going to talk about mages in just a second, they suffer the most from this. But the four slots means that you either have to choose to intentionally have a bad build that is often not fun, or you choose the obvious choices for your four abilities. There are a lot of abilities in this game, and I am not kidding you, you will barely see any of them see play, okay? The abilities that will see play are are very obvious. They're really easy to pick which ones are the best. Um, they become apparent incredibly quickly and you'll even see them on the pawns. There's a ton of abilities that nobody puts on their pawns and nobody puts on their character bar because they are way too niche. Some of them are even really cool. There are some really amazing abilities that are like, oh, this would be great, but it's too niche. If I take this, I'm gonna have a dead skill slot in battle and I don't want a dead skill slot in battle. I only have four abilities. I want to be able to actually play in battle and do things. And uh, it's per it gets pretty bad on that front. Four uh, ability slots. This game was not designed for four ab ability slots. It, it truly was not. Um, and this becomes especially apparent with the Warfarer vocation, vocation okay? Uh, the Warfarer is a massive cop-out, okay? It is unbelievably bad. I can't even believe that this game shipped with a vocation that they were hyping up in the, in the trailers, that they were hyping up in the marketing materials that is so embarrassing. Let me explain the Warfarer. The Warfarer is the last class that you will unlock in the game in all likelihood. Um, it is a, a secret vocation that was touted as being able to take and pull from every single vocation in the game. And what they mean by that is uh, nothing, actually. The, way the Warfarer is 
a joke. And here's what I mean. The Warfarer can take passive abilities and primary abilities with the exception of the ultimate final ability of each class. It could use any of them. It can use any ability besides the ultimate ability and any passive ability, just like as if you were playing as that class. And it only has three abilities of its own. It has two passives, whereas most classes have uh, anywhere from five to eight, I think, passive abilities that you unlock. It has only two, which are amazing, and you're going to take them on basically every single build that you do. And it unlocks an ability called... Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It, it's, it's an ability that lets you switch weapons, okay? So um, I want you to... to you go, oh, wow, cool. So you can switch between the weapons between each class, right? You can. But the problem is, is that that ability takes up a skill slot. And you, when you switch weapons, you don't switch your skill slots. You, you have to pick static skill slots that can only work when you're using that weapon. So to play Warfarer as the Warfarer, you have to have a dead slot to switch weapons and slots that are dead when you're not using that weapon. It, the maximum number of weapons you can have equipped as Warfare is three, okay? So what that would mean is, is that you're, you're, you have one button for each weapon that you can use. Just terrible. And this is where it gets really funny, which is that the Warfarer levels up all classes. Which means the real way to play the game is to unlock Warfarer and then play exact, just equip one weapon, never use the weapon swap ability at all, and just equip whatever you want from that class and pretend that you're playing that class. For the entire last 35% or so of the game, I was just playing Archer but my class was technically Warfarer because when you're playing as Warfarer, you level up all other classes. And the only thing that I was missing out on is the ultimate ability, which was terrible anyway. So why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I play as Warfarer and get the Warfarer benefits plus all of the Archer abilities that I liked and level up all my other classes so I can have fun with those abilities if I want to? total cop out. Now I have a suggestion. I don't want to be completely negative, but I have a suggestion. And I think Dragon's Dogma, because I know you guys are listening. Capcom, I know you listen to the Demon Mama stream, right? By the way, if you're Capcom or anybody else for that matter, you should be subscribed to my channel. I talk about all kinds of stuff, lots of video game stuff. I go deep, deep, deep into video games that I love and you should be subscribed to Demon Mama. So press subscribe down below. And also, this is the little opportunity. If you've watched this far, if you've watched this far into the video, I'm going to borrow from my boy Mug Thief. Shout out to Mug Thief. Great channel, by the way. But I'm going to borrow from him. If you have watched this far in the video, leave a comment below that says Beloved. And you'll know that I'll see it. I'll heart every single comment that I get that says Beloved. Okay? There you go. If you watched this far, you got the secret word. Do it. All right, let's continue. With, uh, with, with all my love, I'm going to give a suggestion to Capcom, who I know watches my videos, obviously. Um, Warfarer should not be a vocation. You should just become the Warfarer at a certain point in the game. I recommend a big quest. You go and you do a big epic quest. Think like a quest like... Uh, like the Ronnie quest line in Elden Ring, a big, long, story-filled quest. And at the end of it, you become the Warfarer, which simply unlocks all of the other classes and lets you level them all at the same time. You got to go do a big quest. It gives it some significance. And then you just unlock everything. Instead of, instead of having a dead, a, a class that is, uh, that is meaningless on a design level, there is no reason to not play Warfarer except for a handful of ultimate abilities, most, most of which are not very good. Um, for most classes, you're just going to play Warfarer and pretend that you're playing as another class. And also, 
I forgot to mention this, but Warfarer can wear any armor from any class, which means that the class that lets you play with style is Warfarer. So why don't you just become the Warfarer at some point? Why would you make it so that the obvious answer is to choose the class that lets you dress in anything and use any abilities, but also has kind of like stupid and pointless side things and is its own vocation? Just makes no sense. Just have a quest where the Arisen rises and awakens and you wake up and you're like, ah, I am the Warfarer now. I can access all of these abilities in my true awakened form. There you go. You can have that, you can have that idea for free, Capcom. It will make your game better, okay? especially because most people are going to play as the Warfarer just for the fashion option anyway. So just let the Arisen turn into the Warfarer. There's no reason not to. And let us use the ultimates on the Warfarer at that point. There's no reason to limit them. The, most of the ultimates, like I said, are not that good. They're mostly niche and kind of funny. Um, I don't want to talk, I don't want to spoil all of the, all of the ultimate abilities, but let me tell you, uh, most of the ultimate abilities are goofy, and or very niche with one exception which is sorcerer and sorcerer has the most broken ultimate ability in the entire game which you will inevitably put onto a pawn because if you have a pawn with the sorcerer ultimate you will delete every enemy in the game with almost no challenge whatsoever the ultimate spells for sorcerer are so incredibly good and they're so slow to cast that just putting them on a pawn is the obvious answer. Kind of sucks. Anyway. Let's continue. Let's let's continue, okay? Warfarer, total cop-out. Combat balance and enemy variety is really, really borked. But unfortunately, that is not the end of my critiques. I have, unfortunately, quite a few critiques. And the next critique I'm going to do is another vocation critique, the trickster. The trickster was another one of the classes that was very, very showed off. Like it was, it was heavily advertised in a lot of the in the, a lot of the marketing material building up to the game. The trickster is uh, ostensibly an illusionist. You use a a smoke, you know what's it called? Um, uh, it's called a um, thurible. It's a little like thing on chains. It's a, it's got incense in it and, and smoke comes out of it. And you use this smoke to, be, to, to enchant and trick enemies. At least that's what you're supposed to be able to do. The trickster is a very strange class. In game, the trickster does not do any damage. And I mean that you do so little damage that it's, it is about as close to zero as possible. When you hit an enemy with your Thurible, they take a, like I'm talking single digits damage even at the end of the game. You will not see it register on a health bar. You could technically finish off an enemy, but you are not gonna be doing damage. And none of their spells do any damage. Everything that they do is built around uh, supposedly being able to manipulate the battlefield. And some of that sounds on on in concept very cool, right? Um, However, in execution, it is atrocious and essentially unplayable um, in any serious way. It is a goof class that you play uh, to challenge yourself if you want to have like if you're like if you've got like a masochistic streak. And I mean that it's like a, it's 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 very, very difficult to play. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult to play is because of the combat balance, which I talked about before. OK, the combat balance Th this class, so let me explain, I should explain exactly how it works. To play this class, you can summon an illusory version of yourself. So you can summon up this little, little phantom of yourself. And that phantom taunts enemies that have been hit by your smoke. So you need to hit enemies with your smoke, and then you need to summon or have summoned already your little illusion. And your illusion... And, your, and you also taunt when they're affected by your smoke because your illusion and yourself are indistinguishable to the enemies. Your illusion can be damaged and dispelled and there is a cast time to summon it back. Additionally, if you personally take damage, 
you will lose your illusion. So you not only need to keep your smoke touching enemies so that they can be taunted, but your illusion will disappear if you take damage or if it takes damage. And what you can do with your illusion is you can put it on an enemy and that enemy will become the target of nearby enemies that have been affected by your smoke, which sounds kind of cool. You're like, oh, okay, so if there's a bunch of goblins, I can hit them all with smoke and I can put my illusion onto a dragon and all the goblins will attack the dragon. Except I already mentioned goblins die in one hit from basically fucking everything at the end of the game. And the dragons especially will delete the goblins instantly. And the, the dragon will delete your illusion immediately, which means they won't be taunted to the dragon. And making goblins attack each other is pointless because your, your pawns will delete them immediately. And on top of that, it's really, really hard to get your illusion to actually stick to an enemy. And if you take any damage during any of that, your illusion will disappear. Now, they have some other abilities. One of the ones that was showed off in the trailer is the trick platform. You can make a, a piece of ground that appears to be real uh, uh, appear, and you can put your illusion out on it, and maybe an enemy might go and try and walk on it and fall off. But the chance of you actually being able to execute that is very low. Uh, very, very low. And it really only looks good uh, for a funny gimmick. You can't actually play this class. The class is just unplayable in the game if you want to actually play the game. If you want to goof around and do some challenge runs, you might be able to have some fun with it, but the reality is no. And it really sucks because the Trickster has an incredible amount of cool armor. The one that I showed you, this image that I showed you that I was, was absolutely obsessed with, the one where I had the smoke thurible in front of the fire, this one. Uh, this, this, this outfit right here, this is a Trickster outfit. You can see I got the thurible and the whole cool outfit with the embroidered sleeves. And they've got a lot of really cool ones, okay? But playing that class is very, very difficult. And another thing that tells me that they didn't, they didn't do, they didn't pay attention while they were doing this um, is the fact that they only have six weapons. Every other class has tons of weapons. Trickster, six. Six weapon upgrades through the entire game. Every other class has way more, like shockingly more. So it sounds to me like they uh, they were phoning it in for their trickster class. Um, and this leads me to a spot. We're gonna take a small moment away from my critiques and we're gonna veer into the world of... My sources that I made it the fuck up. We're at, that's right, we're going into the world of conspiracy, okay? We're going into the world of conspiracy, all right? In Dragon's Dogma 1, throwables were extremely plentiful in the game. Now, they sucked, okay? In Dragon's Dogma 1, you could not really aim your throwables. You had to equip a throwable from your start menu, uh, point your character in vaguely the correct direction, and then you would throw it at a static length. And you'd hope it would hit. But there was a ton of them, okay? In Dragon's Dogma 1, they had rotten fruit, throwing pies. You could throw little jester pies. They had uh, poison bombs, throwing knives, throwing javelins, rocks. Uh, little, you could throw cups at people. You could throw little bouncy balls at people. There was an unbelievable amount of throwing items in Dragon's Dogma 1 and no throwing system. In Dragon's Dogma 2, they added a throwing system. When you pick up enemies or you pick up rocks or boxes in the environment using the grab key, you have an aiming system by which you can actually throw them, which means throwing rocks and throwing enemies and throwing boxes is pretty fun at least for the first third of the game. But guess what? There's no throwables. Except something really strange. The pawns reference throwable items. There are items you can pick up in the game and the pawns will go, Arisen, this would make an incredible projectile to throw at our opponents. Which makes me think that throwable items 
are cut content. And of course, my source is that I made it the fuck up. But I genuinely, I actually do believe that. And, and I want to tell you another piece of, of theory as to why I believe in this conspiracy theory. Not only do the pawns reference it, not only is there basically no use for rotten fruit in the game. You get rotten meat, rotten fruit, but you can't throw them. They just sit in your inventory, and if you're lucky, you might be able to mix it with something to turn it into um, oil. Sometimes. Most of the time, not. However, the trickster... The trickster class is so bad, and yet everything in the trickster class says this is the perfect class to use throwables. Imagine that even in its current bungled form, the trickster would make so much more sense if there was throwables. Oh, you put your little smoke illusion out and the enemies are coming to look at it and you're standing up above throwing rotten fruit at them or poison bombs or grenades? The- oh! The goblins have throwing items. The goblins throw rocks and the gro gob little pebbles, not big rocks that you pick up in the environment. They throw pebbles and they throw oil flasks and they throw bombs at you. So the goblins have the throwables, but the player character does not. And the trickster class seems like it's just missing something that just so happens to be throwables. That's my theory. That's my, that's my sinister theory, my, my conspiracy theory, okay? Incredible, right? <sighs> okay, so enough about my conspiracy theory. Wayfarer is a joke. Trickster is a joke. There's no throwables in the game. The enemy variety sucks. Combat balance is all off. And there are a few more things we have to talk about before I'm done, okay? I told you this was gonna be exhaustive. Guys, the quest design. We gotta talk about the quest design. Um, the quest design in this game made me cry. <laughs> The quest design in this game, I have not seen a game with such embarrassingly bad quest design. Um, I don't know, uh, in a long time, okay? This was some PlayStation 2 ass quest design. The quest design is one of two things. Uh, it is either the most obvious hand-holdy toddler garbage that you've ever encountered in your entire life or nonsensical to the point of laughability, okay? It is quite ridiculous. Um, the, 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 the quests are, almost all of the quests in the game are some variety of, of a fetch quest or a, a point A to point B. You go... Go talk to this person here, then go talk to that person there, then go talk to this person here, and you're done on the quest. There is, There are a series of stealth quests in the beginning to middle of the game. They are not actually stealth quests, okay? I'm, I'm not kidding you. They, they are framed in game as stealth quests, but there is no stealth in the game. There's no stealth. Uh, you just, there's a part where you're supposed to sneak in to the castle, and what they mean is you just walk in the door of the castle and walk up to the room uh, that you're supposed to go in, and as long as as long as you do it when one NPC is down the on the other end of the hall, all of the guards, all of the other characters ignore you. There is one NPC that just needs to be on a scripted basis. He will scriptedly walk down the hall. You walk into his room and grab his thing. That's it. And there are multiple stealth quests like this in the game. They're not stealth quests at all. They have a simple precursor that you must do and a scripted event that you just have to wait around the corner for. There's another stealth quest where you're supposed to sneak into a secret underground like lab in the bottom of a church. And literally, all you have to do is stand a certain distance away from the like nun who's guarding the door. You, she, you can be within sight of her. I literally stood outside the door just like this and my and she was just like 
Well, thank goodness no one's here. Better go back to my nunly duties. Walked right past me and away, and I just walked in the door behind her. I was literally just standing in a doorway like this on the edge of the, the distance range that you're supposed to be. It is embarrassing, okay? I don't even know why they bothered, okay? But that's not even like what I'm talking about when I'm, that's, that is, that is just lazy not putting a stealth system in your game and for some reason insisting that there's, there needs to be stealth quests. What I'm really talking about when I'm talking about quest design is the fact that like there's no creativity dumped into, there's no creativity put into any of these quests. Every single quest is, um, is a fairly rote go from talk to guy here go to this place talk to guy there go to this place or go kill this thing or go get me this item and bring it back that's all of the quests in the entire game with one exception which is the sphinx stuff the sphinx quest line has some creativity they are still mostly fetch quests but they are kind of creative fetch quests like um i don't want to spoil all the sphinx stuff but I'll give I'll, I'll I'll spoil one of the Sphinx ones. One of the Sphinx riddles makes you go and find the first item of a certain type that you picked up in the game, which is very funny. It's still a fetch quest, but it's really funny to make you try and remember where you picked up the first item of a certain type in the game. That's that's kind of funny. The Sphinx though is about it. Other than that, all of the quests follow an incredibly rote pattern. And, and there are a few quests that are complicated. Um, and by complicated, I mean they have multiple steps. There are a number of quests in the game that have multiple steps. And those steps are usually multiple branching paths with, with, with the actual tasks being little fetch quests. But they are like branching paths. And this is, a, and this is not praise, okay? Because... Um, the way that this game tries to communicate to you what you're supposed to do on a quest um, is not good. And it's especially not good when it mixes with bugs. All of the quests in this game, even the complicated ones, have a very um, stilted and awkward progression. And what I mean by that is basically a guy will talk to you and go, we need to go do this. And then you'll press A and they'll immediately go back to their, their usual activities. Um, outside of like initiating a quest, characters basically do not tell you anything. They have a set, they have like a set pool of lines. And even if you are in the middle of the most intense thing ever, they'll just be like, fine weather we're having today. Mud crabs, nasty little things. It's it's more oblivion than oblivion. And as a result, like it's like quest on. Anyway, Arisen, it's time for us to go do this thing. Quest off. Nice weather we're having today. And that makes the quests feel really weird. But on top of that, a lot of quests just kind of lazily teleport you around. I'm going to tell a story because I feel I was having a hard time putting into words exactly how to describe the juddering pacing of every single quest in the game where the quest goes from like locked screen talking to a guy go to a place locked screen talking to a guy uh, walk into an area cutscene happens they're very very chunky but i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you a quick story i typed this all out because i wanted to when this happened i knew i had to talk about it okay so let me it's not old school old school games had really had quests that might have been slightly technically chunky but that nonetheless had flow with the rest of the game you know uh i don't know i've played a lot of games over the years a lot of rpgs and some of them have you know if you talk to somebody they'll usually talk to you about the quest but this game doesn't really have a dialogue system it has like half a dialogue system it's very chunky well let me tell you this story okay and this is gonna have spoilers for one of the end game quests in it I promise you, you're not missing anything when I tell you this. But I'll, just as a warning, just in case, minor spoilers for one of the end game quests. Listen to this story, okay? Okay, so 
when you get to the end game, there's a big event that happens and the world the, the world state changes towards the end of the game and a bunch of stuff has to happen. And one of the things that you're supposed to do is you're supposed to do these evacuation quests. So at the end of the game, this character appears and says, go evacuate the people from all of the major cities. They're in danger. You need to go to all of the major cities and evacuate them. Go quickly. And so I'm like, oh, um, okay. Um, I gotta go there. So I was like, um, well, all right. I just, I, I'm nearest to the, there's this big mining pit zone and it's right near where you fight the final boss. And I'm like, okay, well, I wanted to go check the location where I fought the final boss because I had a suspicion. I don't know, maybe there'd be a special item. Maybe there'd be some clues or something. And there's also a place that I would want to evacuate near that. So I go to that location. Um, and I'm, I'm walking in and as I, as I walk into the area, uh, the, the, the camera gets taken from me and a guard runs up to me and the guard goes, uh, the guards like things have gotten very bad here. I, I, we need to evacuate everyone, but I'm not sure that I can do it on my own. And I'm like, okay. So I end the dialogue and immediately he, he disappears and a golem spawns in and he's fighting the golem and he's like, help Risen, help! And so I'm like, what? And so I go run over and I insta-kill the golem. It's like, it's like dead in, in seconds, okay? And then he's like, and then immediately, the second the golem dies, I'm stuck back, I'm like teleported back into dialogue with this guard. And he's like, well done Arisen. Now that you helped me defeat the threat, I'll be able to evacuate all of the people here. You have saved us truly. And I was like, okay. And then I exited the dialogue and he starts walking away and everyone in the town despawns except for one merchant. I'm like, oh, okay. So I guess I evacuated this area and I was like, okay. And then I decided to explore around and make sure I didn't miss anything. And I found that actually there was one merchant and there were four guys in jail. And I talked to them in jail and they just had generic lines. And so I'm like, okay, I'm guessing that's a bug. Okay. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go continue and go check some other locations. So uh, I go to another location for another quest that they give you at the end of the game. And when I go there, they're like, the person who gave you the evacuate, who tells you to go evacuate everybody's like, thank goodness that you came here. This is the location that you need to evacuate everyone to. And I'm like, oh, okay. I thought that I was just supposed to go evacuate them, but now you're telling me, oh, I got to evacuate them here. And I was like, um, okay. So you unlock a new city on the map that you can send people to. And I was like, all right. And then I got a new quest in my quest menu that started tracking people that I could evacuate. But the mining pit people weren't on there. So I was like, maybe they don't count. Maybe they're just like too small to go on the quest checklist. So I went and I started evacuating some other um, places. I'm like, right, okay, like she told me to go evacuate people. I now know where to evacuate them. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go to the main big city, this town called Vernworth, okay? A lot of the quests happen in this place. And I'm like, okay, uh, in Vernworth, you got uh, you got a bunch of different characters that you meet in Vernworth, and one of them is like this little prince. Okay, he's like he's a prince. Okay, and part of the main story is that you help this prince uh, basically take control of the town at, from a bad lady. Okay, so I'm like, okay, well I got to go talk to the prince, right? The prince is my friend. I've I've done a bunch of quests for the prince, and he's the guy who's definitely going to do the evacuation, right? So I go all the way into the castle and I talk to the prince. And he's like, Egads, it's the end of the world? I had noticed that it was the end of the world, but I'm happy that you told me it was the end of the world. And then I was like, he's like, however, I need you to talk to my, my, my captain first. Sorry, he just says, my captain. Go talk to the guard captain. And so I'm like, okay. So then I go talk to the guard captain. And the guard captain goes, it's great to see you, Arisen. Where have you been? We need to talk to, to, to the prince immediately. I'm like, 
I was just talking to the prince. So I run all the way back and I talk to the prince. And then the prince is like, thank goodness you came to me. I'm like, I just came to you. You told me to go to the guard. The guard told me to come back to the prince. And then he's like, now go do this fetch quest. You literally have to carry a bag of gold to somebody else. It's so stupid. Then you go back, then everybody evacuates. And that's when I noticed, okay, this city shows up on the evacuation checklist, which made me nervous because I evacuated that other place beforehand. So I went on the internet and I looked up a guide to the quest. And that was when I discovered that something was wrong. Something was very wrong. So on the guide that I looked up online, it was like, yeah, to evacuate the mining pit location, you need to help the guard fight the golem. And then he'll tell you that everyone couldn't evacuate and that he needs a special staff to help everyone evacuate. And I'm like, that didn't happen. So I'm like, well, I better go back. So I walked all the way back to the mining pit, which is on the farthest south location on the map. And, uh, and, I, was, and I fought all the boring enemies on the way there. And I got there and it's empty still. Nobody's there, even though I've started this new quest. It's just the my just that one merchant, and the uh, and the the guys and the the people in the jail. I searched top and bottom. I searched this entire place, every corner of this zone. I searched trying to find the guard so that I could properly e e evacuate this town. Don't find him. So I'm like, well, all right then. I guess I must have completed it, and maybe I bugged it. Who knows? Out of out of out of uh, caution, I put down a teleportation sign there. I go back, I finish all of the other evacuation quests, and I get nervous one more time. And I'm like, okay, I put down that teleport sign. Let me go back and just make sure I didn't miss this guy. So I go all the way back to this mine location. Thankfully, this time I have a teleport point, And I search from top to bottom again. And this time, on my way out of the jail... Out of nowhere, the guard just teleports. He just appears. I'm not kidding you. Just like out of a wall. He's just like, and he appears and he goes, Arisen, thank goodness. There are pawns trapped in the jail and they won't follow orders. We need the magic staff to tell them to leave. I'm like, what? where the fuck were you? Oh my God. And then I immediately walked over and in the empty town, I found the staff instantaneously and then he evacuated the four pawns that were just sitting there. And that is one of the branching paths, multiple complex quests. It is so difficult to tell if you've bugged or broken a quest. The game does not communicate well. The game does not communicate even at the best of times what you're supposed to be doing unless it's literally telling you directly what you need to do and puts an objective on your map. It is all over the place. Okay, it is really, really frustrating. There are a lot of quests that you can fail and you will often never know if you bugged the quest or if you failed the quest. There's another quest in the game that has multiple branching paths and if you, there is a way to successfully, to succeed fail the quest, where you succeed at the quest and then it gets stuck in your quest log because uh, uh, you can't, you can't, because if you did another quest, you can't do the last step because they didn't give you any alternatives. So the quest just stays in your log for the rest of the game. And you don't know, well, am I supposed to keep looking for this guy to like finish this quest? Or is it bugged? Sometimes it legitimately bugs. Multiple people reported the quest actually just bugging. Just, uh, just what? I'm going to tell you another example of what I mean when I say the quest design is terrible in this game. And this is not buggy. This is by design, okay? This one's a little shorter, all right? There's a quest where an, import, an important character, uh, this is very random. You're walking through town, and the captain of the guard walks up to you and goes, there's an assassination attempt against our wonderful and amazing empress. I need your help. And you're like, okay, I'll help you then. I don't know the Empress, but sure, I'll help you. Um, and then she's t she tells you this big block of dialogue, and she describes what the killer looks like and what happened last time, which is that the, uh, the, the, the Empress was praying, and the killer tried to get her, okay? And then she says, all right, we got to prevent this. Don't let the killer kill the Empress. And the Empress starts praying. You can walk and stand 
right next to the Empress. And I'm sitting there going, I've been told what this guy looks like. I've been told, okay, don't let him do any, don't let him approach the Empress, don't let him kill the Empress. So I'm guarding the Empress. Then the guard lady starts yelling at me. She's like, we need to find him, search the crowd. And I'm like, search the crowd, okay? It's in like a dark room, you can barely see anything. So I go over and I start talking to people in the crowd. Like I'm supposed to find this guy, this sus ass guy. And there's a bunch of characters that like loosely match the description. She's like, quickly, you need to find him. And I'm like, I, and then I'm like, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And then she's like, make sure you don't grab the wrong guy. Cause whoever it is, he'll be tortured for sure. I'm like, okay. And then just like, don't let the queen die. And I was like, okay. So I said, I'll just go stand next to the queen. And if this guy tries to make a move for it, I'll try and catch him. I'm standing next to the queen, right? The game goes into a cutscene, fades to black, queen dies, fades back in, queen's dead body is on the floor. I was teleported away. Apparently what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to find the guy that you suspect and then you're supposed to pick them up. Like just pick them up. Like just, just heave them over your shoulder. That's all you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go find a guy in the audience and heave them over your shoulder, okay? So the, the Empress dies, right? I walk over to the Empress and I immediately resurrect her using a resurrection stone. No problem, right? Empress dies, I bring her back to life immediately. She starts walking off in a, the Empress walks off in a random direction. If you talk to the Empress, she doesn't say anything. She just says her normal lines of dialogue. So then I'm like, okay. I guess I'm supposed to go talk to the guard lady. And I talk to the guard lady and the guard lady goes, I am, this is it. It's over for me. I've been exiled forever. Goodbye forever now. Since the queen is dead, since the empress is dead, I've been exiled. Goodbye. And then you end the dialogue and she immediately disappears. The queen, the empress walks into the throne room where the guard was two seconds ago. And then once she's in the throne room, I go, hello. And she goes, Oh no, they've exiled my favorite guard. We need to prepare a letter to, to take to her so that she can come back from exile. And I'm like, okay, give me the letter. She's like, come back to me in a bit and I'll have a letter prepared for you. I'm like, okay. So I walk out the room and one of the people at the front door goes, holy shit, the Empress is alive. You've saved us, Arisen. Thank you for bringing the Empress back to life. And I'm like, oh, okay. Did I guess then I go back into the room and talk to the Empress. She's like, I need more time to write the letter. So I wait a couple of days, go do other stuff, come back to the Empress. And she says, I need a little more time to give me a letter to my guard, to get me a letter to my favorite guard so you can go deliver it. So I go look online. Turns out she never gives you a letter. You just actually just have to go tell the guard. She, she will never give you a letter. You never get a letter. Even though she tells you to come back and give you a letter, um, you just never get a letter. Letter. You just go talk to the guard, and then she goes, thank goodness, I can leave forever exile now, and then she goes back to town. Just the f what the fuck? And that is not a bugged quest. That is how the quest is designed. There's no bug going on there. She never, there is no letter item that you get. You're just supposed to go talk to her after a certain number of time. And that's a lot of the quests in the game, okay? Oh, I feel like I've, uh, oh my God. I feel like I've, I've been ranting so much, but there's just, there's just, the quests are just so goofy. It's so goofy. All right, there's one last thing I'm gonna talk about. No, there's two last things I'm gonna talk about, okay? The fast travel. In this game, and I and remember, I'm gonna read the quote again, okay? On the topic of, of fast travel, the, 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 the director of the game, Itsuno, says, director Itsuno says, just give it a try. Travel is boring. That's not true. It's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. That's why you place things in the right location for players to discover or come up with enemy appearance methods that create different experiences each time or force players into blind situations where they don't know whether it's safe or not 10 meters in front of them. Okay. All of that 
is a load of crock, okay? This game has so much fast travel, it's not even funny. And in fact, once you get to the end game portion, you literally find fast travel items laying all over the ground. By the end of the game, I was using tra fast travel items all the time and I had 35 just piled up in my inventory. They, you use so much fast travel in this game, there is quite literally no reason for them to even restrict fast travel at all. At the end, oh my God, it's so silly. The fast travel is so abundant that only really for the first like 30% of the game will you need to be picky with your fast travel at all. And in reality, you really don't. I was very nervous to use my fast travel items and, and, and didn't use them because I was worried there was only going to be like 10 fast travel items in the entire game. So for the beginning of the game, I just ran everywhere and it was fine. I'm totally fine with that. It, it was fun enough at the beginning, but I realized very quickly that I didn't need to worry at all that you can just fast travel as free as much as you want. Um, and you get so many, uh, there's these items that you can place that are like, they're, they're fast travel crystals that you put down that you can fast travel to, but you can immediately pick them back up again. They're not permanent. You put them down, pick them up. So go to a location that you want to go, put a fast travel crystal there. You can travel there whenever you want. And then when you're done with it, just pick it up. And there's tons of these in the game. So many that I was literally, I, at the end game, I was just teleporting across the map anytime I needed anything at all. And I didn't even come close to even scratching the surface of the stores of my fast travel. There is so much fast travel in this game. The ox cart system is a form of fast travel. And when they first talked about it in the game, they made it seem like the ox carts were not that fast, that you would go on an ox cart and you would have to sort of, you, you could automatically go to a location, but it might be, you know, not, a, it might be easy, but it might not actually be that much faster. But that's not actually true because you can go to sleep on the ox carts. So you climb on an ox cart, you pay a laughable amount of money. It's like 10 cents equivalent in, like it's nothing. It's just a dime, okay? And then you just press the Y button to go to sleep. And yeah, there's a chance you get attacked by enemies. Um, and the first time that happens, it's kind of funny. You're like, oh my God, I got attacked by enemies. My ox cart got interrupted. And once in a great while, you might actually have your ox cart get destroyed if you get attacked by a big enough enemy. But in reality, what happens is you get so good so quickly that you melt the enemies immediately, climb back onto the ox cart and fall asleep. So what it, rea what it really is, is it's just fast travel with a slight interruption. The first few times that you get your ox cart ambushed, it kind of feels novel. You're like, oh, that's kind of fun. It's cool. And after a while, it just becomes a, boy, a boring and easy interruption. There's no real threat. You just are taking your ox cart and an enemy pops up. You have to do a little quick time event, basically. Kill the enemy real quick, climb back on, and continue your fast travel. Um, feels like a bunch of loading screens. Uh, the, 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 the like fast anti fast travel thing is pure load of crock. I don't know what they were talking about. It's silly. Don't believe anybody who tells you that there's not fast travel in this game. It is overwhelmingly full of tra fast travel. Um, and, uh, the last thing, the last and final thing I want to talk about in this game, uh, is that Almost every item in the game, with I believe two exceptions, can be found at a vendor. Um, it's that simple. Uh, the, there are almost no dungeon variety. The dungeon types in this game are bad. It's cave, tomb, magma cave, and castle dungeon basement. There is no other, to my to my recollection, no other types of dungeon that you go into. You get a cave. You get a magma cave, you get a tomb that looks like a cave, and you get a castle dungeon that kind of looks like a tomb. Um, they're very boring, uh, and they sometimes have treasures at the end. However, there is, you can almost always buy that treasure at, at um, vendors already. And yeah, it's sometimes expensive, but it doesn't really matter that much. And in fact, this is what really hurts. There's even a joke if you buy an item at a vendor and then you find it in a chest moments later or like fairly, you know, soon afterwards, your pawns will go, doesn't it feel bad to find an exact copy of an item that you just spent a lot of money on, Arisen? 
There is the pawn lampshading of bad design decisions made me angry by the end of the game. Just, oh, what? Oh, God damn. Whew. Yeah. So, I think that's everything. I think I've uh, I think I've touched on every aspect of Dragon's Dogma 2 that I loved, liked, and was very very angered by. <laughs> Unfortunately, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a very flawed game. There is a lot that I love about it. There is a lot of fun to be had in the first 20 to 30 hours of play, which, hey, that's pretty good. But unfortunately, you're not going to feel like you got a complete experience by 20 to 30 hours. You're going to want to play the rest of the game, and the game gets worse and worse the longer that it goes on. There are decisions that they took things away from, from Dragon's Dogma 1. They removed features from Dragon's Dogma 1. It's very strange, and I don't know why. Um, and and most of the things that they were boasting about being like like shocking and innovative features of this game simply aren't. It's just not true that the fast travel is particularly restricted. It just isn't. The game is super full of fast travel, and it's really easy to do. Um, the healing system is messed up. The, the combat scaling is busted, and there's basically no enemy variety. Some of this stuff, I believe, could be fixed with DLC and a patch. But some of it will never be fixed. Or is so unlikely to be fixed that there's just no changing it. I don't know how you change the terrible writing and the terrible quest design. The quests are just terrible. And the problem with the quest is that most of them with the exception of the Meister quests, which give you special abilities, have no reward other than experience and gold. Just feels terrible. Why, I mean, there's some story repercussions sometimes for some of the quests. Most of them don't go anywhere because they don't actually change anything in the world or they change so little that it doesn't actually affect all that much. Like there's no point at the, you know, let me give an example of this. In Dragon's Dogma 1, there's a quest line that you can do for a kind of weird guy. You meet this weird guy in the first city of Dragon's Dogma 1, and he asks you to find him a tome. When you go to try and get the tome, you find out that it got stolen by a bunch of bandits, which then leads you to um, uh, the bandit fortress. And there's multiple ways you can do it. You could kill all the bandits immediately and steal their stuff and get the, the thing back. Or you can work for the bandits and go do another quest and then they'll give you the book. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. If you get this book for this guy, he gives you a quest reward. He gives you money and some experience. But also, there's a pretty major boss fight shortly after this. And... If you have done that quest with that guy, he appears to help you during the boss fight. He's like, I decided to become a pilgrim after you gave me that magic book and the pilgrimage sent me here. When I got close to the tower, I heard a horrible noise and I rushed up to the top of the tower and I saw you getting attacked by a monster. So I rushed in to help you straight up. That's awesome. You do a story quest and something changes about the world in a way that you have that you can feel. There's very little of that in this game. Almost none of your quests actually plug back in and affect you in any in any way. There's like sometimes they'll be like, "Thank you for doing that," but it's not like they plug into another quest later in most of the cases, which just means that the quest design is very it seems almost unfixable. Uh, and that's unlikely to change even with DLC. However, things like enemy variety, combat balance, things like that, that might be fixed in the future. Um, some of the classes might be fixed in a future patch. Uh, if throwables get put into the game, Trickster might actually be a fun class. Um, in the end, to summarize everything that I've talked about here, I really, really... I, there was so much that I loved about Dragon's Dogma 2, but it is so deeply flawed of a game that it's very hard for me to recommend it just without any considerations. And I, I hope that 
that Capcom and the and Itsuno and the other people working on this game are able to hear. I'm not the only person making these critiques. I know that for sure. Um, but uh, these are my critiques from my experience. Um, and uh, I've seen people echoing these critiques even in their first impressions videos. So I hope that they're able to take feedback because there's so much that I love about this, this game. And the pawn system is so endearing and wonderful that I would love for it to be in a game that I could recommend without any hesitation. I love games that do weird stuff. I love the Souls games with all their weirdness. Um, I love Pathologic and Disco Elysium, these games that are weird and don't necessarily conform to the standards of, um, of you know, AAA games or what makes games good. But Dragon's Dogma 2, ironically, doesn't do enough of its own. It tries to be too many different things and it doesn't do them right. And as a result, its strong points actually get washed beneath the parts of it that just don't work that well. And it's really unfortunate. And there's stuff that they got rid of from Dragon's Dogma 1 that would have been really wonderful here and that would have felt nice and fun. More monster variety, uh, and it would have been great to bring back the quest board from Dragon's Dogma 1 where you're, like, given a quest to go hunt a certain type of monster a certain amount of times. That'd be cool to see. As it stands right now, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a very, very, very flawed game. And... While I do think that people can have a lot of fun with it, and I do think that it, even if you don't complete the game, you'll have fun with things like the pawn system and with the wackiness of the combat in the first, like, third to first half of the game. Um, it's If you play to the end, you're, you're going to be in for some disappointment. And just keep that in mind. Um, there is a lot to love. And I think I do love a lot of this game. But there's also so much frustrations that I felt myself getting more and more tired and angry the more that I played this game. And I don't really expect that I'll be revisiting it anytime soon, if ever. If they don't do a DLC, I can't imagine I'll ever go back and play Dragon's Dogma 2. But I will definitely be playing Dragon's Dogma 1 again. Um, so... With all that said, that is my exhaustive and complete review of Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you found it interesting. If you agreed with something that I said, let me know below. If you disagreed with stuff that I said, let me know below. I want to hear your thoughts. Leave me some comments. And of course, please make sure that you're subscribed down below to Demon Mama. Thanks for hearing the signal. All right, now I'm going to thank some donations that I got. Nadia. Nadia. Wait, I can't see your full name. Nadia uh, Yvette. Nadia Yvette with the $10. Thank you very, very, very much for the $10. Thank you so much. YouTube has been pretty intentionally suppressing LGBT to left and by POC. There's a very large scale project to turn the internet into a walled garden with info ter served top down ongoing for a while. Um, yeah, I know there have been multiple demonstrable and evidenced instances of them suppressing LGBT um, and bi POC opinions, um, but I don't, there isn't a, I don't know what's going on right now, and there isn't a whole lot of hard evidence of it. Um, this video, the one that we watched a little bit ago, um, is most, was most certainly. Uh, some evidence of something like that going on. And I want us, I want to see more because I, these things that happen in the shadows sometimes are very, very, very difficult to prove. But uh, let's just say I know a lot of trans uh, by POC and, uh, uh, um, and, and neurodivergent content creators and they don't have an easy time building their channels. And they get demonetized a shocking amount when there doesn't really seem to be a policy reason for it. So, uh, anecdotally, I, I believe that there is something going on. But proving it is very hard, especially because these websites are often black boxes.
However, we do have the past to know. For example, at one point, YouTube was actively and demonstrably uh, suppressing LGBT content. They were tagging even content creators who didn't openly talk about it uh, on their channel as LGBT if they talked about certain topics generally. And then your channel would get suppressed. And that got called out and they, they, they undid it. But who knows if it's actually still operating and if they just started hiding it more. I want to avoid conspiratorial thinking, but also I have to look at the realities and the realities say LGBT creators, bi POC creators, uh, neurodivergent creators, disabled creators, we struggle even when we work our hardest, even when we're making gold and we just can't find that algorithm space. And that's pretty messed up. Anyway, thank you for the $10. Let me check my uh, website feed. How do we feel about that review? Okay, we didn't get any, we didn't get any donos. Damn it. No donos? Oh, I wanted to read donos. Anyway, how do we feel about that? How do we feel about that review? Was it too much? Was it too little? Contraband 100 says, still want to play this game so badly. Play it. I didn't even talk about the performance stuff because I already mentioned that in my first impressions and I think that's been talked to death. But play it. It's not a bad game. It just has problems. Um, there's a lot to enjoy in it and you're certainly going to get 20 to 30 hours of pure fun out of it. And those first 20 to 30 hours are really, really fun. They're just a lot of fun. You should definitely play it. Thought it was a great review, a long but good review. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Gumbald. I, uh, I feel like what I need to do is that I need to do my reviews. I need to learn how to do reviews as video essays. Because then I can add in footage I can add in music, and maybe that would make them a little bit better. But I've always been uh, I've always been hesitant because I'm a streamer, you know. I do streams, and uh, I like them. But sometimes I feel like, oh man, me just sort of talking at the camera might not do it for most people, you know. JS Mascus says, your reviews are always so solid, and I appreciate hearing a nuanced take when most banter around the game has been unproductive. I do think that happened. First of all, thank you. And secondly, I do think that some of the banter around the game was really unproductive. There was so much fixation on the microtransactions, and I understand microtransactions are very annoying, um, but these really don't impact the gameplay of the game at all. Um, you wouldn't even know they existed if you didn't like go log online, really. Um, and uh, people spent all their time criticizing the game for the microtransactions and they missed the actual critiques. I feel there's a lot, there was a lot to actually talk about that could help these games get better if they become like, you know, if people know how to talk about it. And I would love that. I would love for there to be a Dragon Dog, Dragon's Dogma 2 DLC that fixes a bunch of these problems and makes it an unbelievable game. Like I can, there have been so many games I've played that over time got better. I think about a game like No Man's Sky. When No Man's Sky launched, that game was terrible. And now No Man's Sky is amazing. Like it's actually not even, it doesn't even resemble the same game. You can see what they were going for, but now they've added so much and so much free stuff to No Man's Sky. If you boot up No Man's Sky today, you've got a magical world in front of you. If you just played it when it first came out, it was like, ooh. Windleby says, I'm glad I didn't buy it. I understand that. And honestly, I would recommend that if you're interested in the game, even after everything that I said, um, that you buy it on on sale because you'll feel a lot better about it. I don't think that, I don't, <laughs> I think this game deserves to be heavily criticized at $70. There is so much unfinished buggy crap in this game that it's hard for me to justify telling people to spend $70 fucking dollars on it. 
that's a good idea, another board person. I could do like a like a I could set up like PowerPoints or pictures or something like that and have them up on the screen. That's actually not a bad idea. But I wonder if that point, if it might just be better for me to branch out and to do some video essays. I know that I can, you know, I know that I have the ability to like prepare them. But it's just I spend so much time on stream that I like to give love to my stream audience who have been with me. And I don't know, I'm I'm I've been thinking a lot about stuff um, and what I want to do going forward uh, to do more, to be more creative, to make more things. And I've thought about doing video essays. I've thought about uh, branching out into some other stuff um, in addition to streaming. But I, 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 like, I don't know. I never want to get stagnant. You know what I mean? I always want to be doing more and experimenting and growing, especially because I have a really strong artistic urge. Uh, I feel almost pursued. Um, I don't know if this, I'm sure it shows. Uh, given that I've made hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of hours of content, but I feel the need to make things. I feel the need to, to create. Uh, and, and of course, that's just what you guys see on my stream. I have a lot of other projects that I've done over the years, my entire life. I've always been undertaking different um, creative Things I have, I have, I, I'm, I'm pursued by that, and I want to be able to feed that and, and grow my creative expression. You know, ideally, I'd like to make some stuff that's really ground shaking. You know, but we'll see. Yeah. Al the Healer says, I feel like a lot of people talking about video games online are only doing it because it's topical, but I can always tell that you care about video games and want them to be good. It's great. Thank you. I do really care about video games. And part of the reason why I do the reviews the way I do is because that's just, I want people to see what I feel and I want people to understand me in an organic context, you know? Um, which I do think is an advantage of the stream format, but maybe I could do that more structuredly and have it make more sense. Well, thank you very much. That's really kind of you. I do really care about video games. They're they're an art form that's incredibly important to me, and has been very influential on in my life. So yeah. Boy, though, I'm 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 getting tired. Maybe it's because I had that. Maybe it's because I had that migraine yesterday. But goodness gracious, I'm getting freaking tired. My goodness, my goodness. Dark Souls? Oh, we're playing Dark Souls. Don't you worry. Mistress Lynn says, I think it's great to experiment with things. Yeah, I'm going to keep ex experimenting. Don't you worry about that. Uncle Gumbald with the gifted tier one sub. Thank you so much. Tell me of the lava waters, the lava waters of your home world, Mama Sul. Of the impies running free across the sulfur plains. True. By the way, I've been listening to the Dune Part 1 soundtrack. I've listened to both the Dune 1 soundtrack and the Dune 2 soundtrack. And I gotta say, I think the Dune 1 soundtrack is better by like a pretty solid margin. The Dune 1 soundtrack is a freaking banger. Hans Zimmer was, was on his A game for that one. What about the Toto soundtrack? The Toto soundtrack? I'm loving this Dune revival. Yeah, it's great. Oh, the Dune revival is amazing. Oh, and the Dune memers have gone so hard. 
it's it's actually amazing. That's the that's the way that you know how powerful the Dune fan base is and how uh, vener venerable they are. There's th the Dune fan base has been building over multiple patient iterations, and as a result, they're not just like. They're not all bandwagoners. There are newcomers, you know, who are like, oh my God, ha ha, I'm going to make only movie memes. You know what I mean? No, but ev but the thing is that because there's been so many and because there's so there's no like, there isn't really any gatekeeping, you know? You get all the movie memers who are like, ha ha, movie memes, only movie images only. But then you get it mixed in with all of the ancients, the ones who are playing nine dimensional chess and are posting the memes from the depths and it's all just gets muddled together and it builds this this energy and then the new ones want to they want to achieve the meme game of the old heads and so the new ones get more into it and it builds even more ah it's beautiful i love it it's incredible There's a track from Dune from the from Dune Part One. It's the um, it's called Herald of the Change. Oh my God! I wish I could play it on stream. Herald of the Change goes way too hard. It's oh my wow wow. Hans Zimmer went way too hard on that. Now listen, Hans Zimmer is a talented guy, okay? A really talented guy. Like I'm, who am I to cast hate on Hans Zimmer, the guy who's done 900 million movie soundtracks and TV soundtracks and whatever. He's done some bangers, okay? Over the years, he's done a lot of great soundtracks, all right? He's also phoned it in for a few, okay? He's really phoned it in for a few of them. But he was not phoning it in when it came to Dune Part 1. Dune Part 1. Just too good. Too goddamn good. The, the Spider-Man soundtrack that Hans Zimmer did was like, I hated that one. In fact, it made me laugh. The one where it's like, where it has the like, it has the like, the dialogue lines whispered underneath it. Cringing, I'm cringing. <clears throat> I'm cringing, just I'm cringing. Oh, yeah, Uncle Gumball, the costume design in the new Dune is really good. They did a really great job with it. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty incre incredible. I mean, the thing is, Dune has always had uh, a lot of inspired, um, a lot of inspired outfits. Because the, the descriptions of the outfits are pretty impressive, and even in the original books. Um, and of course, there's been a bunch of different takes on it, but they did a really good job in this one. The guy who could with the $5 donation, thank you so very much. Really appreciate that. Hey, Demon Mama, it's my birthday today on the East Coast, and it will be in a couple of hours for you. And to celebrate, I wanted to share some of the joy via money. Keep producing your art, and don't forget, everyone, like the stream. The guy who could, thank you so very much, and happy birthday to the guy who could. I hope you have an amazing birthday. Thank you so much for sharing some of the joy with all of us here and with me. Uh, that means a lot to me. Thank you so much and happy birthday. Amazing. Al the Healer says, I had forgotten about that trash. I think you're referring to my comment about the Spider-Man soundtrack that he did. Woo. It is, again, it's a special brand of cringe. I don't know what he was thinking with that. I do not know. Are we ready for some? Are we? Are we ready for some fucking Dark Souls? 
I'm ready for some goddamn Dark Souls. I think it's Dark Souls time. I think it's Dark Souls time. It's the perfect time. I gotta use my energy wisely. Let's Dark Souls this shit. Let's do it. We have to march onward. We defeated like multiple bosses last time. And that was a, a killer. Oh my God, I forgot to talk about Jusant. I guess I could talk about Jusant while we play Dark Souls 2 maybe. I played the hell out of Jusant. Hold on, I need to ask Doe to warm me some food and I need to get a drink. Hold on a second. Give me just one minute. Pizza time soon, I should say. Pizza time, pizza time, pizza time. Doe's gonna make me some pizza, or warm me up in some pizza. Damn, look at my character. We're sick. We are tricked out. Okay, oh yeah, that's right. We have 75,000 souls. So let me go see, what is our equipment at? We got, we gotta upgrade the Hunter's Black Bow. Huh, I'd given you up for dead. Don't be an asshole. All right, Hunter's Black Bow. We got it. Let's do it. Plus 10. Blessed. How are we doing on... S I'll be around. Oh my God. Oh yeah, we bought a ton of arrows last time, so we're actually all in the clear. We got our Chotel. Okay, here's what we have to start deciding. We have to decide where we're gonna put our stuff. Bear, I think seek, seek, less seek, this. bear, less, less, seek, less, bear, less, bear. Okay. We can do, wow, we got four levels. Okay, so we have 40 decks, which if I believe if I remember correctly, 40 decks is the soft cap, right? Let me see. Let's see, Dark Souls 2. Let's look. Oh, let me look at him real quick. Soft cap is 20 for vigor. Soft cap for... Hold on, let's see. Dexterity is 40 and a 50 hard cap. Okay, so that means we definitely want to spread our stats around. Okay, we definitely are going to spread our stats around. All right, let's figure this out. So we could go into Faith so we could wield that dragon spear. That would be pretty cool. We could also go into strength a little bit. Let's see, let's see what we got that looks cool. What do we got that looks sick? All right. So a lot of the great swords are, that one's like 17, 25, ugh. I don't know about those. I don't think I want to do any great swords. Black steel katana, we can do that one already. A katana might be cool. The washing pole is huge. I don't know if I want to wield a giant katana. What about, what about our spears? The dragon slayer spear is 16 strength and 14 faith. That could be cool. 
A spear could be pretty cool. I figured it out. We're gonna do we're gonna do strength and face so we can wield that Bearer case of the curse. Seek so seek lest this land. I've decided. No more time for dawdling. We put our strength to 16 and we start getting our faith up. We're almost there. We're gonna be there in no time, and then we'll get to wield a cool spear in addition to having a sick ass chotel. Seek seek lest. Alright. Where do we go next? So here's our options. We can go. We have, uh, fuck. We could go do one of the DLCs. We go to one of the DLCs. Or we can go um, to the castle next, right? Of course I could. Of course I can, Baphomet. I don't know how what the best way to do that would be. But you tell me what to do and I'll help you out. You've helped me out a ton in this game, so I'll help you, of course. I think it's a good time to do Shulva, right? Sanctum City? I say, let's do it. First of all, let's take in the view. Wow. What an amazing, what an amazing spot. God, it looks so cool. So amazing. Bonfire ahead or overwhelming? Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Watch it, bro. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. I hear something. Do you hear that? There's a bug crawling around or something. Ow! Hey, watch it! Alright, you want to get in a fight? Oh, fuck. There's a lot of guys here. <laughs> I did not expect his reach to be that big. Uh, wow! <laughs> Holy shit! Have you been through Shrine of Amana yet? No, I haven't been through Shrine of Amana. I just went here kind of on a whim. Should I do that first? I can go back. Should I do, I could do Drang Lake first. If, if people have an idea. I, I mean, I always trust, I always trust what Chariot has to say on this game, especially. Generally, but especially on this one. You recommend doing Dranglaic first? Okay, we can go to Dranglaic then. I'll, I'll go back. <laughs> That's all right, we can go do that. Oh, what the heck is that? There's a nasty thing in there. <gasps> Ew, there's big bulgy things in there. No, no, I can go do Dranglaic first. I don't know how to get to Dranglaic. Wait, yes, I think I do. Hold on, wait. I think to get to Dranglaic, I have to go to the Shaded Woods or something. And I have to go to the Ruined Fork Road. The Ruined Fork Road. And then I think I go up and I have to show an item or something. Okay. 
I think I go up here. If I remember correctly, I go out this door. And then... Yay! Welcome, Chariot! I wonder, did you watch my review of um, Dragon's Dogma? I would... I don't know if you played Dragon's Dogma 2, but... Um, I I hope... I don't know. I was curious to see if you'd watch my Dragon Dog... Dragon's... Oh, hello! Oh, man, this guy looks so funky. He's so goofy. These guys are so funny. I remember hating these guys' de design the first time I played this game. And honestly, they are a little silly. But I kind of like them more now. I don't know. I like them more than I did before. Before, I just found them so silly. But honestly, they're not that silly. They're kind of silly, but they're not that silly. They're not as silly as I once thought, basically, is what I'm saying. Oh, okay. I see, Chariot. You have an old gaming console? What, what what gaming console do you have? We gotta put a fundraiser together for you. Or something. I don't want to impose or anything, but... I would love to see you uh, get to play some new media. That'd be cool. Yeah, get you... A, I'd love to get you a new a new stuff. Maybe I can be a, a benefactor of some sort. We'll talk about it. I don't mean to be awkward. I'm, I'm kind of, my brain isn't functioning. Right if I'm being awkward or bad right now, just shout at me and tell me, shut the fuck up. It's okay, you can tell me to do that. Also now, now that I've done my Dragon's Dogma review, I can watch Mug Thief's Dragon's Dogma 2 review. I didn't want to watch it because I didn't want to bias myself. Mug Thief's videos are so good um yeah yeah true chariot oh Baldur's gate is so good you'd have a great time with Baldur's gate oh my god i bet you'd make the best essay about Baldur's gate too Baldur's gate 3 i mean i meant Baldur's gate also but um oops um I forgot what I was going to say. Also, the Baldur's Gate soundtrack is amazing. It's a little repetitive thematically. Like, it has a lot of motifs that repeat, but they're really goddamn good. Down, down, down by the river. Down, down, down by the river. Oh my god, it's so good. Ah, so good. God damn it, now I want to listen to it. Ah, these guys in their weird run animation. Ah. Why do they do it like that? Why are they, why is their run animation like that? God damn it. Oh yeah, I remember there's invisible visible dudes. Da 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 What's your favorite video game of all time? Of all time, Pathologic 2 and um and 
uh, Majora's Mask, Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Those are my two faves of all time. Um, whoa, hey, hold on. Um, but also, it's hard for me to pick a single one because I also feel very strongly about Death Stranding. And the more that I and the more that I think about Death Stranding, the more that I like it. Um, Death Stranding really is something magical. It does some pretty magical stuff. I mean, so does Pathologic too. But Death Stranding does um, Death Stranding does something. Oh God, they both they both play with the maximum potential that games can do as a medium, but they do it in very different ways. Oh, hello. It just kind of opens for you, huh? Where is that? Oh, that goes back down, huh? Oh, okay. All right, let's do it then. Liking stories about futility, are we? Well, oh, uh-oh. No, not this zone. Wait a second, I know this place. This is the nightmare zone. I went to the wrong one. How did I go to the wrong one two times in a row? What's wrong with me? Also, not that, I know what that zone is. I, that's the zone that everybody complains about, even the diehards. Even the diehards are like, this one was a miss. Soul of a hero? Oh, this is not where I was at before. No, wrong. That's the area with the horses. Levi Matthew says, is Pathologic 2 the better game to start out with? In my opinion, yes. Um, Pathologic 2 is a more, it is a more completed game. And um, according to the creators, it is more to their vision of what they wanted to create originally than they were able to with the original. However, that, that is not to say that Pathologic 1 is not good, it is really, really good. But I would say start with Pathologic 2, it will make you fall in love with everything Pathologic and then you'll want to go check out Pathologic 1. Also, Pathologic 1 is just slightly, in my opinion, slightly less fun to play because of some design decisions. Chariot says, I love that even the rumor of a snowstorm has caused Demon Mama to become paranoid of reindeer. If that's not the reindeer area, I, I stand corrected, but I was pretty sure that was the reindeer area. Yeah. It's a little... Listen, I know about those reindeer, okay? I've watched that shit, and it, it, it looked bad, okay? Where am I going? I don't even know. Whatever. Let's walk. Let's find. Let's figure it out. Ilium Lois has the Lois Knights and such. I don't know. I don't know what that means. You can't. I don't know what Ilium Lois or any of that shit means. I don't know what that what that means. Thank you, liar. That those words mean nothing to me. I don't know what a Lois Knight is. That Lois Knight sounds like, for some reason, Ilium Lois sounds like a soap brand, doesn't it? And when you say Lois Knights, I just think like, oh, it's like a like a like a mascot for a soap brand. Like he's the Lois Knight. You know? Oh, it's rainy. Whoa. Rain. It's weird. Whoa! Hey! Haven't seen you guys in... I haven't seen you guys in a while. Whoa! Cool it. Cool it, Jack.
This looks odd. This area looks pretty cool. Whoa! Oh. Is this supposed to look like that? Did the textures not load? <gasps> Pizza! Oh, perfect timing. I just got to this epic reveal. You would hate this dough. Why would I hate it? Uh, because of um, because of the the reason why you hate Dark, Dark Souls Two. Doe is a big Dark Souls Two hater, by the way. This is gonna make so many people mad. I'm ruining your reputation with your friends. That's fair. Doe is a big Dark Souls Two hater. So wait, wait, wait. Which thing specifically? The textures. Okay, I knew it. I knew it. Look, look at okay. the look. Oh, you can't. Oh my God. Doe is Doe is super slutty right now. Incredibly slutting it up and can't come on camera because Doe's <laughs> always a slut. Put on something. Um, Reach in there and grab that 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 thing and right? put that on. Yeah, yeah, put that on. Okay. So you can come over here and see what I'm talking about. Stop being such a slut. I don't know if I can. You I know, but you can at least pretend on the camera. Mm. So good. Some of the pizza might could be pretty hot. Be careful. I can already feel that, but it tastes so good. Oh. Oh my God. Well, here's Dale. Yeah, look. Doesn't it look like a okay, wireframe? Yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, you see what I mean. Of course I do. I know what you mean. I just think you're over obsessed with it. No, it's so. You let yourself be blinded. I can't believe that I'm in the position, but I have to. I have to make up for my sins, as because I became because I was taught by the scholar of the first sin that I committed the sin. Okay, if I played scholar, would I have a good time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, because I never played scholar. That's the that's the I just played the regular because the regular one sucked. And so I didn't try Scholar. It's really good. You'd have a really good time. You're gonna hate the textures because, yeah, the texture work is a little bit not great, but still, there's a lot to really like and it's still a really pretty game even with its texture issues. Awesome, Majula doesn't do it for me. What? Why? Majula's great. It's like... Uncle Gumbald is going to be your biggest ally in chat because Uncle Gumbald is also a DS2 hater. Regular version, especially on consoles. Trash, that's what I played it on forever yeah. ago. That's what a lot of people played it on. But no, honestly, Scholar's been great so far. There's so much cool shit in here. And if you've never played it before, it's going to feel like playing a whole new Dark Souls game. So. Okay, I also really... Okay, okay. The, the main mechanical thing is life gems. For most of for like for like the first half of the game or whatever, literally one of my least favorite mechanics for world design. It's so weird to, to me because you because you you like Demon Souls and the life gems yeah. are straight out Demon Souls. Yeah, I know, but they got they got better. They got better and then they came, they went back on it. You know what I mean? Like the grass is. You know, funny. if you're pressing that, it, okay, no, good, no, it's, it's not. On. On. Okay. The grass is kind of funny to go back to now, but like. Even they paced a lot of the grass out better. You could do things to get a bunch of grass, a bunch of really good grass, but if you move all over the place, the mic won't pick you up. I'm sorry. So come up, come up closer. Wait, no, I Let me eat. Oh my goodness. Oh come on! You used to come on stream all the time, and people used to, and then you stopped coming on stream, and then nobody wanted to watch me anymore because they stopped no, believing that it. there was a chance that the dough would show up, and that's the only reason they would tune in anymore. And now they know, so. and so. But now, you appearing and hanging out for a few minutes, they'll go tell everybody else, and then people will start coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, see, they can, they can, they can hear me fine. Uncle, that's not Uncle true. Uncle Gumball's on my side, like you said. I know, but that's, but he's, but Uncle Gumball is being on your side too much. No, 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 it's the perfect amount, and everyone should be on my side that much. See, look, everyone can hear me. <laughs> okay. Well, then fine. I'm the DS2 apologist. To be fair, oh, I did shit. I did make some modifications to my audio that should make it better. We still had some crackling this stream, but not nearly as much, which is really good. That means I, I have, I think I've figured out the problems. 
What's two the, of the problems. What's the main one? The first one was that my compressor was too aggressive. And the second one is, okay, remember how uh, I went insane for like two nights in a row and I was up here and I was getting really mad and I was telling you that I kept having this audio issue where it was crackling while I was listening to Spotify? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And I was just like, I couldn't stop working on it. This is how I get sometimes. Well, it's happening, except not for Spotify now. It's happening for the stream. So when I click on different apps or switch windows or whatever, there's some sort of uh, processor or bus issue that's causing it to, to crunch, crunch that's up. That's really weird. Yeah, and I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's the, the buses on the motherboard or maybe just on the case are having issues. Maybe. But the compressor was also making it worse because I changed some settings on the compressor. Also, the compressor was tuned a little bit too tightly and it was making it uh, too quiet on my stream too frequently. So it was giving people, they were having a hard time having to crank it up really high. Sure, yeah, yeah. Hmm. It looks like garbage with the rest of the games look. It looks okay. But yeah. Yeah, Doe's wearing my clothes because it was too much of a filthy slut when it came in here. And I wasn't wearing pants, sorry. You look so nice right now. Thank you. You look so wonderful. Thank Your you. Your hair looks so cute. Doe's hair is like right now it's a little fuzzy, but you look at look at this. Hold that back up again and show them. Doe's curls are like a Greek like a Greek statue. <laughs> Isn't it? Like the the like hair of like the David statue is Doe's <laughs> curls. Incredible. What the fuck? How do you get like like sculpture, like Renaissance sculpture hair? It's crazy. It's my mom. My mom has this hair. Really? Yeah, my mom has this hair. Oh yeah, I'm sure she does. You look a lot like your mom. Meg from Hercules. Only her friends call her Meg. This town's finished. Is it? <laughs> you have to have you have to go have the Bloodborne hat for that. It's messed up. Fawn has a hat. Um, it's like this funny bucket hat. And I always call it the Bloodborne hat because it looks like the hat that the guys that are the little undead guys down in the sewer have. It does. It looks just like it. Sanji with the tier three sub. Yo. Whoa! Hell yeah. Need to atone and fix my white name. Have a great night or day, everyone. Sanji, thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Will you shout out Sanji? What? what? Shout out Sanji. Hell yeah, Sanji. Thanks for the tier three. Look at that. A no shout out. <laughs> The viewers have gone up so much since you reappeared. What is this? What's wrong with you people? You're supposed to be subscribed to my channel, not Doe's. Just kidding. Doe's obviously an integral part of this, so it makes sense why you tune in. I just like giving you I just like giving you trouble. See how cool it is when you come in? This is why this is why we need to re we need to we need to go back. Go back! We need to go back! That's what we need to do to we the way it was. Back. I there's know. no return. I know there's no return, but remember the old studio yeah. when you and Fun would be in there and there's all this dynamicness and sometimes people would donate and you'd pop in or I, I'd say something and you'd be like, wait, 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 that's not right, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I remember. That was so magical. We can't do that anymore because this stupid, isolated, lonely tower of a studio where I sit up here like a, like a sad crow. Good night, JS Masochist. Rest well. Rest well. Yeah, Doe can play. Play some, yeah. Play some. Hold on. You have to do, um... Here. You gotta put these on. To, wait, they're gonna hear it twice if you do it that way. Here. Put these on. Hear it twice? Yeah, put those on and press speaker. Turn the speaker off. And now they'll hear it once and you can play as much as you want. You'll hear it through the headphones oh, with no I delay. Understand what you're saying. Yeah, because it, it'll pick up by the mic and through the pickup. And you don't want that. Kind of low. Um, yeah, a little bit more. Okay, that should be perfect. This gives me time to eat pizza.
Oh, do, 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 burn them. Give them the burn them. the song got mad at you. <laughs> Literally everyone in chat, chat is saying, oh, your dough do is better than you. I'm not. They, they're not, they don't have the wisdom. They don't know. They don't know what happens in the shadow. That's okay. Let them believe. That's not Randy Newman. You got a friend in me. I guess I guess Bo Burnham has some Randy Newman energy. <laughs> He's like dark Randy Newman. I get him with the Christmas song. That one's always nice. No, it's not Christmas time. Yeah, but you play it all the time anyway. Yeah, I know I do, because I know like two songs on the piano. Give them your review of The Curse. <laughs> the Curse is so good. You guys should go watch The Curse. Well, you have to tell them what it is. Uh, no, there's no telling. Uh, it's Nathan It's Nathan Fielder, if you... Uh... Ah. Okay, 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 okay. Be careful. Oh, I gotta break him. Thank you. No, the ending was great. What are you talking about? No, no, the no. ending of the curse was fantastic. The ending of the curse is the only way it can end. That's it. It's, it's primo. No spoilers or whatever, but. You shouldn't have put these back on to me because I gotta wash my hands after I eat all this oh, this greasy pizza. Here, take them back, and you wear them for a little bit, and then and then you talk to the chat and keep them entertained, and I'm gonna go Wait. take them out. Wait, oh my gosh, okay, I wanna talk about the ending, but nobody's seen it, and it's gonna be a big spoiler, but I don't know why it's conceptually disappointing. It's literally, it's literally his life. Oh, Windleby, once you start watching The Curse, you won't be able to stop. That show is magically painful. It is one of the most painful shows, like, yeah. It is a train wreck in I like I've watched a lot of like painful comedy, but the curse is so next level, I couldn't even believe it. Reality is often conceptually disappointing. No, like okay, I, I, no spoilers, but the end of the show is literally like a revelation of like a day in the life of our main character. Like yes. We like It's a literalization. Yeah. of of everything that he's going through. Yeah. It's, and it's silly as a result of that, but it's a literalization of his life. It's so good. And the reason why, I understand why people thought it was silly and got mad at it, because it's, yeah, because it, it's, it's taking the metaphor, it's, it's turning the metaphor into like literalism, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That one, I, I, it's really good. I love The Curse. We've also, I've also been watching, 
Uh, Bo Burnham's Zach Stone is going to be famous, which has also a lot of Nathan Fielder energy. It does, yeah. Um, but it has Nathan Fielder energy, but with like Bo Burnham slathered all over of it. Of course, of course. Like the core premise is very Nathan Fieldery, but like Bo Burnham's joke style is all over it. Right? Yeah, 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 like, definitely, definitely. But one of the things that they both focus on a lot that I really like is because they're both shows where supposedly they're filming like a documentary of some mm -hmm. sort. And so part of the question is like, where does the camera start? And how much more do we see than the camera sees? Or mm -hmm. like, just like the intentional like voyeurism or whatever of the camera and uh, you know, who's using it and why and uh, you're talking about the curse right now, right? I'm talking about both. Honestly, oh, yeah. honestly, both of them have have a lot of that. But yeah, the curse, the curse goes more like, so. the like curse, the a curse, million like, yeah, times, times the, the, to eleven. The curse is a masterpiece in like in modern media voyeurism commentary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The shot with the lady sitting in her house is like. Was so incredible. <laughs> Through the window where we're trying to pay attention to like outside and she's in the couch, but she's the main part of the frame. Yeah, in the curse, still, in the curse, yeah. you constantly get these weird voyeur shots where it's like the camera is filming like through a window or through a door watching. And it's like the dialogue is still like an HGTV show, but the camera is like, it's like a creep is watching you. And there's one scene where they just take it up to 11 and it's literally, the camera is on the other side of a wall. There's a little window with our characters having a conversation outside. And you can see a lady, just a, not a character that's in the show that you know anything, just a random lady just sitting there watching her TV and eating a snack under with her head like under the window where they're talking. And she's just sitting there. And it's just like, so awkward and she has not she's not a character she's not she doesn't engage with the camera at all the camera's just like the cameraman is would have to be like straddling her you know what i mean to get that shot and she's just sitting there eating her eating her thing and you see the main characters having their conversation out the window it's incredible amazing the show is so good it has so much to say about lots and I'm being intentionally vague right now because I don't want to spoil anything. It's so painful, yeah. I don't know, it's a fun pain. It's okay, a... I'm going to go wash my hands and you keep entertaining them for a few more minutes and I'll, and I'll be back in a little bit. I'll be back in like an hour or two. An hour? Yeah, I'm going to go take an hour or two. No! They like you more anyway. That's certainly not true. <laughs> no, that's not true, Fafila. Fafila? I don't know, I'm sorry. Tell us more about how much you hate DS2. I really do. I really hate Dark Souls 2. It's right here on this screen. I fucking hate this game. I played it when it came out, and I played it a bunch. So I was really into Souls. I don't know, like, okay, when I think, some of the, some of the comparisons that I always think about are um, the scorpion fight versus like Quelag. It was the first best souls, like that's pretty good. Um, I mean, I, I do I hate it or do I think it's the worst souls? I don't know. Um, that's similar. That's too. That's too good. That's too close. Like that's too. Um, what my favorite game is? I don't know what my favorite game is. I don't have a favorite game. Oh my gosh. I don't know. Um. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Do I hate it? Or I think it's the worst souls. I don't know. Like they're 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 they're. I think I hate it because it's the worst souls. That, I think that's what it is. I like Demon Souls most. There's a lot of stuff I do like about Demon Souls most, but there's definitely stuff in other games that like got better. Scorpion doesn't feel like a Souls boss. It feels like a generic fantasy boss. It feels like there's like yeah, like there's not a lot of like 
attachment for that character. Like, we don't have a lot of attachment to that character in the world or whatever. And the area, like, the textures of the area look really gross and bad. And, like, you don't have any of that same weight that I feel like was there with the Quaylag fight. And it's so obviously, like, a reference. Like, they're, they're, they're pointing at each other. You know what I mean? Like, they're... they're, they're the scorpion one is is supposed to be like the Quaylag fight. Demon Souls has a unique feel. Demon Souls, okay, something that I always complain about, and and DM never seems to agree with me, um, uh, ooh, is that uh uh uh. uh yeah, the burden of the horns is hard, right? The music. Not every head can can wear the horns unbowed. Yeah, that's true. The music in Demon Souls is so, like. Well, I think every, the music is great. Every song is unique. No song sounds like any of the other songs on, like 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 for the game. Like none of them, none of them sound like each other. And the further the series has gone on, the more that, like. Every every boss gets like a super high instrumental with a bunch of choral like harmonies like it's a, they're all like super super intense always in your face there's a couple there's a couple that stand out but in demon souls every single one is fucking completely different dark souls 3 soundtrack fucking goaded there's a lot of good music in each of them but I can sit back here now and just be like yes keep entertaining them yes no, I'm so I'm so high. I should stop. What really? Yeah, I'm really stoned. I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, you're always really stoned. So. No, no, like I like right. just did a dab before I. Came all right, all right. That's not the. Are you fucking kidding me? What? what? The fuck is wrong with you? I was just telling Doe what to do from the throne. <laughs> it's a chair that's ten times. This is the cuck chair, you fuckers. I'm cucking myself out for you, bitches, all the time. This is the fucking cuck chair. What are you talking about? That's my chair that I read cool shit in and that other things happen in. <laughs> this is the cuck chair. This is where you sit and have to just go like this and go, ah, dance around for other people's fucking entertainment. Fuck you. They're saying, we want more dough. We want more dough. B -b 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 Bazinga. Unfortunately, the sad truth that you all can't handle is that unlike Based and Chad Demon Mama, Doe is a fucking little stoner and is getting nervous and anxious from the amount of drugs that it consumes all the time. By the way, my <laughs> stream has been demonetized and that's all part of the bit. This is just a joke, YouTube. <laughs> We're joking, ah, you know, woo! Just a joke, it's a bit, woohoo! Bazinga. Buh, 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 bazinga. All right, okay, <clears throat> let's get back to the game. Thank you for the pizza, that was very filling. Go relax and go on the couch and go, hey, I need some Scooby snacks or whatever <laughs> you people do. Anyway. Yeah, thank you, Chariot. Yes, that's all I needed. Fuck the rest of you. That's all I needed. That's all I fucking needed. I got this now. I'm going to win the whole game of uh, Dark Souls 2 now. Yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best, Ukronian. I just, you know, I tend to stream late. And uh, oddly enough, Doe. Oh my god! <gasps> no! No! What? What was that? What the f Mistress Lynn with the five tier one subs. I'm always here to hear what you have to say, Dia Mama. Also, we just really think Doe is cool. Doe is cool. I'm just playing around. I just, I just, I like to goof and gag a little bit. I, I would love it if Doe came on here more frequently, in fact. Um... LB says, finally, Demon Mama, the first cuck type streamer. Fuck you! Fuck you! <laughs> Fuck you! Oh my god. Oh, fuck. I got cooked. Um, what was I even gonna say? 
Mistress Lynn, thank you very much. Uh, I don't even remember what I was saying. Oh yeah, I was saying the dough doesn't come on as much anymore because like I said, I am in the lonely tower, okay? This studio is up away from where everybody else hangs out all day. Uh, it's up on the top floor all by itself, okay? And so nobody comes up here unless I call them up here, you know? Nobody wants to because it's not, it's not a comfy zone like it used to be. And so, and also, Doe, believe it or not, tends to go to bed quite a bit earlier than I do and get up quite a bit earlier than I do. I'm a, I'm a night owl, uh, and I tend to get up a little bit later in the morning. So, you know, Doe is, is for some, some of the times when I'm streaming, Doe goes to bed, you know? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it here. Gayfesh, I'm going to lose it. It's going to be your fault. Damn. This castle is isolated. Oh! Everything you reminds must me of... Forge on to bring an end to your journey and mine. That's it? That's all you have to say? Gesture? Don't give up. Try woman. What gesture? What gesture am I supposed to do here? Elden Ring like to do gestures. There's a lot of Elden Ring gesture unlocks. These guys are going to come to life. I knew it! I fucking knew it! You can't trick me, assholes. These guys have a cool roar. So I know they could do good roar design. They shouldn't have reused the damn Dark Souls 1 roar too frequently. Here. What about here? What about here? <gasps> Wait, is there an invisible guy here? Okay, it starts to look cooler when you get closer. It looks kind of dumb from far away. Be wary of tight spot, then blood stain ahead. That giant is going to attack me, isn't it? Oh, man. Lightning. Lightning. Oh, I knew it. We see it. Wait, we I saw, we saw that, right? Oh. I see.
asshole. There we go. <clears throat> That's kind of cool. Oh, I have to get more. Oh no, there it goes. Whoa, 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 hey. Hurrah for pointless. So they just keep spawning over here? Quite something ahead. What? There's something invisible here. What the fuck? Is it like an invisible enemy spawner or something? That's really funny. Can I kill all of these? And is there any reason to do so? I'm guessing not. They probably just, oh hey, there's a treasure over here though. I'm glad I checked over here. <clears throat> okay, they only respawn to light the giants. Okay, that, that makes sense. That's what I assumed, but. Therefore, try front. Oh, never mind. Yeah, pyromancy stuff. I'm not doing pyromancy this run, but oh, oh man, look at that guy. He's standing up there giving me a funny stance. He's doing a sonic, he's doing a Shadow the Hedgehog ass shit. Who's this? Trans Bunny? Trans Bunny, I wonder who that could be. A g -g 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 ghost. That's why I was saying, don't eat the Scooby Snacks if we're going to deal with all these g, g g ghosts Oh, this is a, there's a lot of areas to go here. we got a lot of areas to explore, huh? Well, I better go talk to this ghost. I hope this ghost doesn't attack me, but I feel like he might. Charmer ahead. Who are you? Whoa! And by whose permission do you stand before me? This. Oops. His Highness. Where has he gone? You are a guest of our castle. I am the Chancellor. Belaga. Belaga. Do you seek an audience with my lord, King Vendrick? Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, His Highness is absent. My lord, the King, has... Queen has taken him. My lord made magnificent findings on souls. An accomplishment for the ages. He vanquished four great ones and built this kingdom upon their souls. Our king has watched over this land since ages long, long ago. King Vendrick. We must fight back, or the giants will take Dranglake. Bro. The king had a dear queen, a woman of unparalleled beauty. Long ago, the queen came to us, alone, from a faraway land. She warned our lord of the looming threat across the seas, of the giants. The king crossed the ocean and defeated the giants with the queen at his side. The king commandeered their power and created the golems. With the golems, the king created this castle to celebrate victory and to show his love, his gratitude to his queen. 
the queen brought peace to this land and to her king. A peace so deep, it was like the dark. Is this some sort of a dream? Where am I? What has happened to our castle? Who are you? And by whose permission do you stand before me? Welcome, visit. Our guests are treated with honor. This is the way of our castle. Oh, no, Tell me if you should require anything. Oh. This one's me. My lord made magnificent. Our king, king. You've done all these things. Ooh, do we own one of these? Oh, whoa, he's got lots of stuff. Bracing knuckle ring. Slows equipment degradation. Oh my god, I want that. Oh! Magic and lightning arrows! Oh, yeah, baby! Oh, that's awesome! I gotta get as many as I can. He sells infinity. Well, I'm stocked up on magic arrows now. That's sick. They're so expensive. Yeah, I'm but so who cares? Sick. Be safe on your trip. All right, I can come back here. Okay. Illusory Ring of the Exalted. Ring of Blades 2. Okay. Now what? Bizadu with... Bezidu with the gifted tier one sub just dropped a clip in the Discord channel that I think summarizes the Doe visit perfectly. <laughs> oh no! Oh. Oh, bye. Bye. I don't remember which rings I was supposed to give you. I have the rings. Look, the rings in this game have a hell of a look to them. That is one thing that's really good. Blades 2 and Illusory. Okay. I'll give them to you. I thought that was a piece of the wall. That's what I get. That's what I get for letting myself have merriment. He's got dirty feet. This guy's leaving fucking nasty footprints all over the place. What's his problem? Ah! Wait, is that me? Oh, I'm the one with the dirty feet. How come I'm leaving footprints everywhere, huh? Is this why Americans wear shoes inside? Wh who wear- what Americans wear shoes inside? What are you fucking talking about? What Americans wear shoes inside? Is that like a thing? Because that is not something that I am familiar with. That is a meme that I'm not, I, I have never experienced. It is in some places, 
people wear, everyone I know wears socks inside. It is where I live. I always take shoes off inside. Yeah, me too. Like, I mean, I will. Who's this? Wait, is this your character? Okay, that's you, okay. The, okay, hold on a second. I will sometimes wear my shoes inside if I'm like, if there's something I need to, like if I'm outside, like say, for example, like if I, if Yoda's in the yard, okay, and, um, and I, and Yoda goes poop in the yard and I have to go in to get like poop bags or something, like dog poop bags, like I'll wear my shoes to go do that, but I won't wear my shoes around inside. And usually, um, I'll regret, um, I'll regret, um, doing that because I'll track mud or dirt inside and then you have to sweep. But that's like it. I don't understand. Like I don't get people wearing shoes inside their house. That's really weird. I'm a barefoot is legal type person. I'll be completely honest. I wear like I go barefoot inside most of the time, often to my detriment because my feet get really cold. And so I some I usually when it's cold out I have two pairs of socks. I have sleepy socks, which are socks that I change into when it's time to go to bed so that I don't track anything into the bed, you know, I just have a pair of socks that I only wear when I'm sleeping. And then I have my normal my normal socks, like the socks that I'm going to wear for the day or whatever. I I don't understand the shoe thing. It sounds, yeah, it sounds like you're going to track, like, lots of dirty shit into the house if you wear your shoes around. Like, I get slippers. Slippers are, are fine because they're designed to be worn inside. I don't, I don't get walking around your house in shoes. That's weird to me. Oh, this is creepy. What's this doing here? You can go ahead and go to the last bonfire. I forgot to get it. Wait, the last bonfire? Oh, you mean the last one that I, like the previous one you mean? The previous one you mean? Oh, the next bonfire. Okay, yeah, I'll go to that one then. Boo, 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 boo. Do you think all the guards fucked this guy's wife? You mean the king? Nassandra? Nashandra? Whatever her name is? I don't remember what they, well, I don't actually remember what her name is. Nassandra? Nassa Lissandra? The ice witch from League of Legends? Nassa Lissandra? Maybe. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time in history, right? You know, kings aren't exactly famous for being good in bed. I guess there were a few, right? There were a couple. Oh, that was Sublime Bone Dust. That's really good. Oh, shit.
Yeah, eat shit, asshole. Beating to a pulp. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the that's one of the best beating to a pulp I've ever seen. That's so good. What the hell? Perfect. Yeah, why else have guards, right? Why else have guards unless you're gonna have a bunch of ripped people around you to to do to do uh to do big gangbangs with, right? You might be thinking of Sticker Brush Symphony. But I don't know if that's what the one. But it might have been Aquatic Ambience. Wouldn't wouldn't Aquatic Ambience have had um have had like seaweed or something? Oh ho ho ho. You thought I wasn't going to catch your ass. Sticker Brush Symphony is really nice too, though. Boy, is this area sus. Boy, is this area sus. Leth says, fun fact, ace gangbangs are just slumber parties where there's a cuddle nest. Listen. Oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. I was gonna say, I'll be completely honest, that ends up being a lot of non-ace gangbangs as well. Oh shit. I did I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find the thing yet. I thought it was through that door. It's okay. We'll get there. I got plenty of humanity, so we'll be fine. I hate these guys silly ass movements. They really they really bungled that animation, didn't they? Like, it literally just looks like they didn't get the, the walk cycle animation to sync up with the move speed. Because even when they're moving backwards, they slide all over the place. Boo, 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 boo. Boo, 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 We're going to get through here nice and easy. Don't worry. Don't worry. It'll all be okay. I think cuddles are great. Hot take. Yeah, right? Hot take. It was nice and easy. I only took a little bit of damage. It was nothing.
got him. By the way, what did we talk about today? Uh, we talked about, we did a reaction to a really amazing video about um, a, the really sexist bias in the YouTube algorithm. Then I did a super long, super detailed, very passionate review of Dragon's Dogma 2 where I talk about basically everything I loved, liked, and hated about the game. Um, and then uh, Doe came on for a little bit and then I played this game. It's been a really great stream. Oh yeah, I also talked about what I would do if I was voted for pre as if I was voted in as president. That was silly. Um, but it's been really good. It's been a really great stream. I've been having a good time. Hope everybody else has been having a pretty good time. Doe should have a recurring segment called Dabs with Doe. I don't think Doe would like that very much. I don't think Doe likes being on camera when it's high. I don't like that either. That's why I almost never, I almost never drink or smoke. Okay, I, I rarely drink or smoke anyway. Um, but when I, when I, when I do any type of substance, the last thing I want to do is be on stream with very few exceptions. I know there's some people who really like that and I, and you know what, more power to that type of person. Um, but for me, I want to be in my head and in my heart and that's a lot harder to do when you're on camera, you know, if that makes sense. Signs down? Where? I'd hate being stoned and watched by so many people. Yeah, it makes me really, really paranoid. Um, I used to, once in a while, I would smoke um, while I was uh, on stream or whatever. And then I realized that it would make me really self, even more self-conscious than I already am. And I've already told you guys, like, I... Uh, I already struggle as it is um, with like being overly self-conscious when I'm on camera. Like I've had to learn how to be able to be on camera normally. I, I did not naturally have this talent like at all. It's been a process of learning and, uh, and I'm actually a fairly, um, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly uh, introverted person in a lot of ways. Um, but I've, I've found that, I've found a nice balance with streaming because I feel like I have a certain amount of control and I know that I can turn off the camera at every time, which is like, a, uh, it's a small bit of control that I have that makes me feel like uh, safer doing it and whatever. Gotcha. You're mine. Three t chunks in a slab? That's crazy. That is the most, that was the best, that was the best lizard to get ever. What the hell? When you turn off the camera, we skitter back into your walls. No, you don't. Uh, joke's on you. I already punched holes in all my walls to make sure there was nobody in them. So who's in whose walls now? I have to take like 300 milligrams plus of an edible to get paranoid. What the fuck? 300 milligrams? That's like, that's like, what? No fucking shot. That's like die levels of, of weed. That's like have a heart attack levels of weed. 300? I'm convinced people who say that get, get fake edibles. Yeah, it's gotta be. What the fuck? That 300, 300 milligrams was, was like, is like a hundred more than the worst weed-related experience I've ever had in my entire life, which in and of itself 
was a living nightmare. That was the time when I ate the hell edible that was somewhere in the ballpark of like 200 milligrams. And that made me have the worst time of my fucking life. I can't even imagine taking a 300. You shouldn't be paranoid either way. Well, um, paranoia and anxiety is a fairly common side effect um, of weed. Um, it depends on the person. I, when I was, um, like years ago, when I, when I first started smoking weed and stuff, I would never get anxious or, or paranoid. Um, but then my general levels of anxiety went up. And when that happened, I started to experience anxiety and paranoia sometimes. Um, when I smoked a lot. So, so wait, this is the illusory ring of a conqueror. And then the ring of Thor, no. So illusory ring of exalted, illusory ring of conqueror and ring of blades Two. Anything else? Was that it? Yeah, it's not ideal um, for sure. Oh, God damn it. There we go. Cool hat. It's a really cool hat. I want that hat. It's a really cool hat. Bird hat. All right. Invisible whips. All right, let's do this. Wow, what the hell? I did a lot of damage. I don't know, Fortnite. I think the 8-bit Big Band version is about as close as you can get to that. The 8-bit Big Band uh, has some real magic going on. It's not the exact vibe of the original, but it's pretty... I think it's pretty magical. Ah, here we go. Bashful Ray. Thanks, Bashful Ray. Uh. Oh. oh well, these guys again. Not these guys again. What the hell? Your whips are doing crazy damage. What the fuck? Whoa. Okay, so there's a chest in here. Mastodon Greatsword? That's sick. Wait, 
Alright, so do these, can you like walk up and open these or what? How do you open them? Why is there smoke over here? What's the smoke? Oh shit. Oh, the souls open the door. Okay, all right. Wait, so drag this guy over here and let's let him open this one. Come on, come on, come on. No, 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 no! Bashful, Ray, look at what you've done. Oh, okay, I guess that counted. Don't give up, skeleton! Don't give up, skeleton! Oh! Wow. Okay, that whip build is busted. Baff, that whip build is frickin' broken. What the heck? How? How is it so broken? Yeah, you should. You should send me a screen screenshot of it. That sounds fun as hell to play. I'd love to go mess with some people in PvP with that. In those little arenas. Five hundred milligrams is the most I've ever taken. Had a terrible night. That doesn't surprise me at all. That sounds like the worst experience ever. Oh my god, that's that's too much. Oh man, that sounds horrible. Genuinely sounds terrible. Frozen flower. What the hell's a frozen flower for? Wait, there's a dude over here. Head required a head. Don't give up, skeleton. Okay, some healing items. That's nice. Just gotta find this guy's head. Oh, DLC key. Interesting. Bravery required a head. Oh! Do I need to sit right here? Man. Whoa! Hello. Whoa, what the fuck is going on over here? Oh my god, it's acid. Oh, Jesus. Oh no, is this going to dissolve all my items? There's an item over there, isn't there, though? That looks like it's gonna fucking kill me. There's no way. I want that item, though. Whatever. It's probably not a good item. There's lots of tricks in this game. Jumping ahead. What are they fighting? Be wary of trap, try rolling. No, I didn't mean to do that, I didn't mean to do that! Okay, this is the creepiest room in the entire game. I know this is gonna kill me, but I don't care. I don't even know what I got there. <laughs> ow! Ow! Okay, I almost got, I almost dodged all of them. That was pretty impressive, I will say. I only got hit by one of them, so. Item over there on a skeleton. Oh boy, here we go. 
ow, ow. That whip build is busted! This, this is deleting all these high level enemies! It's too good, it's too good. <laughs> the invisible whip build! What is this shit? Your whip's basic attacks do more than my finisher move. Petrified dragon bone, okay. Torch, okay. Fire great arrow, destructive great arrow, okay. And a picture of a lady. Hello, lady. Ah! What? A cursed painting? <laughs> what the fuck? Th okay, this is the kind of wacky shit that makes Dark Souls that I, I think Dark Souls should get bonus points for. Why the hell, if you come up and look at this painting, does it curse you? That is so funny. I'm really happy I equipped that extra durability thing. Oh, Nameless Usurper. I just hit this guy, didn't I? Ah! Ah! <laughs> Bye! Bye, idiot! <laughs> Cooked! Bye! Oh my god. Hey, bye bye! Bye bye. They call him the nameless usurper. More like nameless asshole. More like the nameless plunger. Am I right? Bye bye. Uh, bye bye. I can't believe that. That was really funny. Okay. Oh, <gasps> secret! Thank you. Oh, hold on. Soul of a brave warrior? I'm a brave warrior. I'm very brave. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Hunter's black bow. Hey, we already have that. Thankfully, we got that as a gift. So we're based and and cool pilled. Now we'll have to pass it on to somebody else. So that is a way we could jump down and I could go get the acid items if I take everything off and get naked. Let's do that. I'm gonna go do that. I'm gonna get all the good items. Nike. Elizabeth uh. Mushroom. Why'd you bring them? Are they gonna dissolve? I want their items to fall off. Corrosive urns. This is kind of funny. I feel like there's probably a secret door in here somewhere, right? There's gotta be there. Like here or something? Maybe over there. Okay. Well, that was funny. Yeah, the piss basement. I don't know, it doesn't look, I mean, okay, honestly, I'll be completely real. It doesn't really look like piss. 
if your piss looks like that, I truly feel like you might need to go to the hospital. Like, just seriously, that's fairly concerning, I won't lie. I've been using this one because my physical attack is pretty important, right? Work hook? What the hell's a work hook? What the? There's a hook hand? There's a, there's a hook hand? Since when did we get the hook hand? That's so funny! You get a little hook hand weapon? That's so funny! Yar! Well, this is Dark Souls. Rules are different in this one, Rakanis. <laughs> the rules are the rules are different in the real world than in the uh, than in the game. Okay. Where's my Where's my weapon? Where's my weapon? Where's my fucking weapon? Okay, I'm not playing anymore. Where's my fucking weapon? Oh, there it is. Oh my god. Oh, I was getting scared that I threw my weapon or dissolved it or something. Whew, I got a little scared. All right, let's dress back up here. Bone crown. That's such a cool one. But that's not what we were wearing before. The hide knight is really cool. But I, I've been wearing the bone guy. The grave warden top. Well, that's kind of cool, honestly, too. Pate's armor. Ugh. Well, okay, actually, it's not that bad. Oh, I do like Vengarl's armor, but Bone King looks the best. This game has this game is a little better with shape with fitting the armors to your body shape a little better. They're it's pretty bad in the um. It's pretty wait that's not the one I was wearing. In Dark Souls One, um, it's questionable. The Mastodon leggings that's so cool. Desert Sorceress skirt. I could go Desert Sorceress for a, wit, a bit. My character does look good in the Desert Sorceress outfit. My character's a little more no, like a little more knightly than the the than the Desert Sorceress. Yeah, I think she's just a little. She needs to be a little more knightly. It is very good, thank you, I appreciate that, but I think I'm gonna stay with the bone set, because the bone set makes her look like a a based and scary knight, and I like her being a little scary, you know? Just It just seems right for her. Something we're gonna have to do something with this this thing. With this painting. I have a feeling I have a feeling this painting is going to require our attention or something like it. Boo 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 boo. Oh. Be wary of woman, try man. You have fought admirably Whoa. on the journey, cursed undead. I am Nishandra, Queen of Dranglake. A true monarch carries the weight of their souls. 
the last king of this land, King Vendrick, as he was called. He found the strength to rule his people, and when the undead were born, cursed. He found more strength to face them, but in the end, he never took the true throne. Visit Vendrick. We have no need for two rulers. That's it? That's all we got here? That's all you're gonna tell me? Can I shoot her? What happens if I shoot her with an arrow? Good luck in short, don't give up. Ally required ahead. Duo ahead, boss. Try hitting them in one swoop. Weakness, hope. Pilgrim Belclair. Oh, nice outfit, Pilgrim Belclair. All right, come on, Belclair. Sad thing is, I have no healing. See you later, Kino Salti Kino Saltier. Thanks for coming by. All right, let's do this. Hold on, let me see if I got any healing items. Okay, I do, I have some. Okay, I got a couple. Let's do this. Huh? Oh, not these losers again. Well, to be fair, the first time I fought this guy, he fell off the edge, so... Maybe I shouldn't be so worried about it. That's a lot of messed up piles of yucky gold. Ouch. This is supposed to be like gold items that are all smushed and tra trampled on. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, they weren't riding on dragons. Rest well, Dragonborn. Thanks for coming by. Want a duel? Sure, I'll duel with you. Happy to. You're definitely gonna cook me, but whatever. I'll give it a try. Back in short, try miracles. Wait, hold on. Try bonfire. Liar ahead. Hmm, sus. Hmm, sus. Back in short, try miracles. In here? Well, that's the thing, Rakanis. They're not, I mean, they, were, they weren't they were always worthless. They just become worthless. But that's also true of our world, right? Red sign down at King's Gate. I don't know what a King's Gate is. Whoa, hey, there's something here. Hmm. First bonfire, okay. Wow! Oh, ow! Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll come back. And I need to go back to Majula real quick. No, it's good. It's okay. I'll go back there. I gotta go to Majula first, real quick. <laughs> Levi Matthew says, "I wish your character would peg me," and then everyone else says, "Jesus Christ!" I mean, come on, though. I don't bl I can't blame Levi. Like, I mean, damn, look at her. I mean, I can't I can't blame him. 
bearer of the curse seeks seek lest this la okay let's level up let's put some love into faith so we can get so we can wield that cool spear that'd be cool also I have some um, have some souls we can soul of a hero soul of a brave warrior soul of a brave warrior large soul of a nameless soldier we have so many boss souls we haven't used yet fading soul 8 in the foyer okay bearer of the seek seek the lest this hey i believe we're at the amount of souls that we needed or at the amount of faith we needed to wield that cool spear i think right yep we are Oh, that's so cool! We're gonna upgrade this real quick. Let's put some love into this weapon. That's so awesome! I didn't know you could Ooh. shoot a lightning sphere with it. That's, that's so cool. What? Petrified dragon, wait. Oh, it's not it's souls that I'm missing. Oh my god, I thought, I thought it said nine required. I was like, uh, no, uh, uh-uh. Okay, well, I don't have enough souls yet, so we'll have to come back once I have some more souls. I gotta go duel anyway. If I win, I'll get some souls, right? Dranglake. From Glake. Forgotten Chamber. Alright. We'll be able to go a little further and then I have to go arrest. Wait, this is wrong. This was the wrong one. This was the wrong one. I went to the wrong goddamn one. What the? Oh, you can. I can see these now. That's weird. How come I can see these? Could I always do that? I don't remember this. What what let me do that? Is that Oh, what the hell? That's weird. Is that talking to entering Dranglake lets you do that? Oh, interesting. That's super, super interesting. And also creepy. I don't know. It's just upsetting. Nice. I'm ready. I'm ready to red summon sign. I'm probably going to get cooked, but you know what? Let's try it anyway. reach on that. What? Okay, the 
reach is stupid. Uh. Not worth it. Do not trade. Not this time. Not this time. Not this time. Those whips are strong, but not this time. Thank you. Honorable fight. Invaders can't heal, by the way. Based. Okay, I won't heal next time. Next time, I didn't know. I thought, I thought it was like Dark Souls 3 where you got a limited amount. Oh, okay, I'll do that. I'll avoid that in the future. I didn't know that. I thought it was like Dark Souls 3. I've never invaded anyone in Dark Souls 2, so I didn't know. Next time. Here, resummon. I'll resummon you. Well, I didn't know it was an honor duel. Don't fucking shame my honor. I'm used to the dirty tactics of Dark Souls 3, okay? And every other goddamn game. I play to survive. I don't fucking play by, ooh, you know, oh, first you must scent yourself with flowers and then you must do a curtsy. It's you die or you kill them. One of the two. It was very honor pilled in the DS2 payday. Well, listen, some 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 problems can't be cured. Okay. I never said that everything was correct with the mind of the Dark Souls 2 lovers. I just said that I was wrong about certain aspects of Dark Souls 2. Sorry, I forgot to do the I forgot to do the pedal dance. I'm surprised that counted as a hit there. Oh, the reach on those is crazy. Those are pretty tough. The the reach is very difficult to judge, not being able to see the whip at all. You finally have your win. It only took nine duels. It's all right. Well done. Unseated, finally. Well done. That is a scary build. I will say that is very difficult. All right, are we gonna continue? We want. I wanna go a little further. I can play a little further. Oh shit, I have to go back and get my body. So I can get my souls back, right? They're useless but cool looking in PV PvE. Are they useless? I mean, that seemed fine. I'm sure it's probably not meta or whatever. Uh, unseated from the seat of victory, of course. Because I won like nine duels in a row against Baphomet. But it's okay. Baphomet has always put up a good fight. And this is, and, and to be fair, Baphomet is way more knowledgeable on this game and often playing experimental builds. So, you know, I don't, I don't do it. The illusory rings, they're just cosmetic in PvE. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. <sighs> yeah, definitely need to rest soon. I don't want to get a headache again tonight. Oh, I forgot to burn my thing.
Okay, now I gotta decide whether I wanna go up or down. Let's go down, let's see what's down this way. Weakness, dash. Oversight. <laughs> oh, I bet a bunch of people run into there and die, I guess. It's locked. Okay. Yeah, I don't wanna have any headaches. Last night, was I was miserable. I hate migraines. I don't get them nearly as commonly as I used to, but when I get them, it's game over, man. It's fucking game over. Try horse. Oh. No, stop it. Why'd you do that? Oh boy, here we go. Oh boy, here we go. Which one is this asshole? Spooky ghost came out of the wall. What the fuck was that? But also, where do I get the guy to try luring it out? Try luring it out in short, try door. Enemy ahead, but ring. Enemy ahead, but try luring it out. Oh. Do ahead, in short, try fleeing. Ah, I see. Come on, asshole. Okay, I'll kill one, and then the other one I'll bring over here. Okay, this one I'm gonna bring over here. Ow, stop it. That's right. Based. These are kind of cool. So these guys are made to fight the giants? Ah, there we go. That's how we get the la the elevator. Uh-oh. No. Old Knight Hammer. Well, I was trying to read the thing, but whatever. Kathas Chime, Soul Greatsword. Be wary of beast. Sellsword Lewitt! Hey, our buddy! I remember Sellsword Lewitt from the beginning of the game! Oh. Oh. Hey, it's the horse from before. Why are they doing so many repeats? Why are there so many repeats? What's with this? What's with this repeating shit, huh? What's going on? Dark Souls 2, what are you doing, buddy? Are you good? Are you okay? Ah! Wait, he turned against me! Why is he turned against me? Wait, whoa, 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 Okay, never mind. Maybe he wasn't? Ouch.
Ow. 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 Okay. Gower's Ring of Protection. What the hell is a Gower Ring of Protection? Where'd it go? Oh. Reduces damage taken from behind. Okay. Okay, so there's a guy up here. Hello, dude. Oh, man. One thing that Dark Souls 2 kind of has a funny thing going on with it is that it loves its really big guys. And it kind of reminds me of like, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like World of Warcraft. Where like in World of Warcraft, they just kind of like make a lot of guys kind of bigger, you know? It's like, oh, that's an orc, but he's a big orc because he's scary or something. I mean, in the Dark Souls series, there's lots of lanky and weird proportioned guys. But specifically in this game, there's just big guys. They don't even have weird proportions. They're just giant dudes. Oh, shit. Ouch. Yeah, I could, but I'm also liking to kill these. I'm doing a lot of damage to these guys, so. There we go. Yeah, see, I got him. I got him. I cooked him. Cooked. Easy style. Visions of back. Therefore, be wary of giant. Already got him. Fire ahead. It's going to shoot fire. Nope. Firestorm. Okay, I see him. I see him. Maybe you will, and I, I, I wish you the best of luck, Levi. Now get the other chest. Hmm, I wonder what could be wrong with this one. Ah, look at that. It has a buckle on the front. It has a buckle on the front. I know what that is, and I need to use one of these. <laughs> Petrified dragon bone and another washing pole. Based. All right, now I can go like this. Wait, there's another item in there. Uh-oh. Ah! Ah! Whoa! Hold on a second. I didn't fucking open him. How did he do that? How did he fucking do that shit? Whoa! The, f the fuck? The fuck is this shit? Yeah, but why'd he do the grab? How'd he do the grab like I opened him? That's fucked up. Just so you know, I was rooting for the mimic while well, I know where you stand now. It all checks out now. Bullshit. Alright, let me summon you. You can help me through this area. Boo, 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 boo. Where's your sign? I don't see your sign. I don't see your sign. I don't see it. Where is it? I'm going to read Dune, maybe, after this. And I'm going to snooze. 
I'm getting so tired right now. And then I'm going to snooze. Oh, sleeping sounds so good right now. Sleep feels so good when you can sleep normally and regularly and sleep well. I can't see it. It's weird. Hmm. It's not showing up. All right. It's okay. I'll go forward for now. It's probably a soul level thing, right? Because I have a... I'm probably a different soul level, right? The way forward is up the elevator. Yeah, but I didn't get the other thing, right? What's my soul memory? Uh, 1,116,672. Yeah, that makes sense. Somebody said I needed to check something, though, didn't they? I find these guys so funny that they're like, they don't have heads. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Right. Didn't somebody say I needed to check underneath here? Visions of Dwarf. Somebody said I need to check the stairs. Hey, hello, Cell Sword Lewitt. Thanks for making a cool stance at me or whatever. Dude, Cell Sword Lewitt, you're really just going to take it like that? Okay, I mean, he is made of shield, so I guess he's kind of good at that. Ah! Oh, really, dude? That's all he sticks around for? He's like two dudes? Gotcha, asshole. Revenge is mine. Revenge is mine. He kind of voted a little bit late. What's this place go to? Oh, this is that shortcut, right? Oh, no. Woman and then beating to a pulp required? Huh? Whoa! Why are these here? So wait, you can farm their outfits here too, right? That's kind of crazy, right? Try dwarf. D does I got a second sorceress? Oh my god, second sorceress skirt. That's fucking based. 
An Estus Flask Shard, too. Wow, I'm glad I went here. Death ahead. An invader, huh? Oh, I see. Well, this is no honor battle. So I don't have to worry about playing nice at all. I can just kill you, or you can kill me, one of the two. here. Uh, Ow! That was tough. That was tough. I wouldn't have been able to do it without some healing, though. That bleed is too scary. Ladder, by the way, left. Oh, cool. What? Oh, God damn it. Why can't I lock onto this asshole? Bullshit. God damn it. I was so fucking close. That enemy is very difficult to read.
Damn, they gave her the jiggle physics. <laughs> they gave the desert sorceress his jiggle physics. That's kind of crazy. Pull that off. That's a funny angle to hit me at. That's a fucking funny angle to get me with. Desert Sorceress top? Really? Another skirt and another top. That's crazy. I'm not complaining at all. Not even a little bit. That's awesome. Well, yeah, but he, but I'm shooting with a normal bow, and he was shooting with a great bow, which is just like, wow, dude. Ow, ow. Got you. You might have gotten me once, but I got you the second time, bastard. Little dick. Plunging attack ahead in short boulder. What are you talking about, dude? What are you what are you what are you fucking talking about? In short boulder? What are you fucking what? What does that even mean? Plunging attack ahead in short boulder? I don't get it. Your jokes are confusing to me. Dark Souls 2 players. It's g No, I'm not jumping there. Fuck that. No way. No fucking way. No way. That's absurd. Here? They're saying you need to be bold and jump. Wrong! 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 Stop! Stop trying to get me killed! Why are you all trying to get me killed? It's so mean! Oh, there's the creepy ghost making the funky noise. Something I can, listen, there's something I can applaud Dark Souls 2 for. They made a lot of enemies, and some of them they don't use very much. These ghosts, I've only ever encountered two of them. They made a tie, an entire ass enemy that just gets used in just this area. That's kind of funny. I gotta say, that's pretty funny. Whee! Oh, God damn it. You're at me again? All right, here we go. That's okay. I'll get back the river again. It's not that there's going to be enemies out here. Ah! Did you really reset that? Hello, Voldo. No key to the embedded in inventory. There's a lady in there. Key to King's Passage. S 
soul vessel and fire seed. I don't know what a soul vessel is. What's soul vessel? What's a soul vessel? Is that isn't that a spell? Oh no, it's this. Oh. Oh, I don't even know what that. Oh, that's the respec item. That's right. Strong magic shield. Okay. So I'll have to come back here at some point. That's kind of creepy. I mean, that's really creepy. But it's also kind of cool. Thank you so much, Glitch, Glitch Dash. Oh, great. How did I know you were going to be on here? God damn it. The what, this game's fucking drop attacks suck. I'm gonna say it right now. The drop attacks in Dark Souls 2, th fucking thumbs down for me. It's easier to hit in Dark Souls 1, and it's way easier to hit in Dark Souls 3. That was terrible. How could I have ever predicted that doing a basic, just barely nudging myself off the end, would, would send me flying forward? I barely walked over the edge and it was like, whoo, you just have like a glide applied to you when you're falling. I swear to God, even hitting NPCs with fall attacks in this game is really hard. In Dark Souls 1, you drop like a freaking rock. Hey, where'd my souls go? God damn it, are they all the way up there? Oh, hey, there's a secret area. Oh, there's multiple secret areas. Oh, wait, never mind. That's where I was before. Never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind. Never mind. You better get your ass back in here and invade again. This is your last chance of the night. That was some that was some motherfucking bullshit. So I want a rematch. Some fucking Dark Souls 2 bull bullshit ass f Oh, I'm on invasion cooldown. Oh, okay. All right then. Never never mind. Next time then. Alright, I am going to go upgrade my weapon though before we, before I, before I log off. I'm getting so tired. I'll upgrade my weapon though. At, at Majula. Yeah, I'll do a big, I'll do a fight arena when we do Elden Ring. I'll do a proper ass fight arena. We'll all fight. It'll be great. Yeah, it was fun as hell. I love PvPing. I like co-oping and PvPing with you. It's been great. Is that a shot? Here to see. However. <sighs> Fight clubs don't really work in Elden Ring. You can do the arenas. Remember they added the arenas. So they do. You can just set up the arena. You can just you can just do the arenas. You just have to put a put passcode in now, and then you can do all that. And you can do crazy rules and stuff too, because they actually were like, "Let's do it," which is pretty good. All 
All right, let's go upgrade our little our little spear. I knew you. Ah! There's my cool spear. Cool spear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we need a million more dragon bones now, but that's okay. We now have a level I'll four be boss weapon, which is pretty sick. So now we can use this. And it's going to be so much fun to use. I love this weapon. The dragon so dragon rider sword spear. Or the dragon rider spear. Dragon slayer spear. Dragon slayer spear. And then in the next game, we get the dragon rider sword spear, which is the fucking sickest weapon ever. I love it so goddamn much. Let me go test this on an enemy real quick. Thank you, Glitch Dash. Glitch Dash says, I love this channel. Yay, thank you. I do my best. I want to try this out on an enemy and see how much damage I can do. Lots of damage. I went the wrong way. I forgot, there's like not that many guys this way. Oh, that's cool. Oh! Whoa! Yeah, that's right. That's fucking right. Oh, this 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 is gonna this is gonna kick ass at max level. <laughs> oh, don't use that. That eats all your fucking... Why does it do that? Why does it eat so much durability? That's terrible. <laughs> the finisher is sick. Did you just see that finisher? What the hell? That's awesome. Boom. Oh, that's so fucking cool. That is so cool. That was awesome. That is the coolest. I'm gonna be so, ow, ow. Wait, these guys are still active? God damn it. You wanna fight right here on these goddamn stairs? No, I guess we could fight right here. Let me top off. All right, I'll 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 honorable fight you this time, okay? I'll honorable fight. No healing this time. No healing. And I'll do the fancy bow. Wait, yeah, I'll do the honorable bow here. Where are you? Oh, hello. God, the range on that is so stupid. <laughs> yeah, that thing's scary. I think I found my weapon. Oh, we are reunited once again. Oh, I should have known. I never, I never should have doubted you. Dragon Slayer Spear, you carried me through, you carried me all the way to the Dragon Rider Sword Spear in Dark Souls 3. I should have never doubted you. I should have never, ever doubted you. Look at how good you're um, you're gonna carry me through all of Dark Souls 2, aren't you? Oh man. That was beautiful. What a beautiful weapon. What an amazing weapon. Oh, it's bringing good memories back to me. 
See, this is giving me hard time. If I... If I... Oh, sorry, it's lagging. When we... There, I'm back. When we do Dark Souls 3... Oh, my goodness. Dark Souls... When we do Dark Souls 3... Hold on. Um, Can I see the screenshots? Oh, they're not here. Oh, they're on my other side. They're on my other computer. Wait, no, wait, I think I uploaded this, didn't I? Didn't I? No, hold on, let me see. Maybe I did. How do I check what I've, what images I've uploaded to my... Screenshots. Look at this. Okay, behold, okay? I want you I want you to witness this okay how do I get the full version here huh how do you how do you open this in here we go behold okay here's my here's me I took this screenshot immediately after defeating Madeir in Dark Souls 3 which is really funny because I was wearing the Desert Sorcerer leggings with the uh, with the Ring Knight the Ring Knight chest and the weird tricorn hat. I had a really weird combo because I wanted to buff my um, my resistance to dark, and this was the ideal. Uh, the ideal combo. And this was right after I beat Madeir for the first time. Cheese lightning? Oh, you mean like nacho cheese. I was going to say, that was not a... There was no cheesing going on here. This was one of the hardest fights of my entire goddamn life. Okay? It was... It was brutal. I was... I was fighting for my fucking life. Here's the here's the here's the picture I took immediately after. This was when I won. I beat I beat Madeir and I screenshot it immediately because I was so excited. And then I took that one with the lightning immediately afterwards. And this is my baby right here. That weapon that you see me holding is the Dragon Slayer Sword Spear. And it is just Oh my god. First of all, what a cool looking weapon. But secondly, it's a spear that's, that has long slashing strikes. And then you have one big stab. And then you do slashes. Which is just like, uh, it's peak spear fantasy to me. Oh, mm, so amazing. Oh, beautiful. True story, I actually platinum Dark Souls 3 in part by getting summoned for Medir by people looking for help on Xbox Live and beating him for them. I was, Xbox has let me solo her for a while back then. That's amazing, Chariot! That's so cool! That is so pog. I've showed the meme on here. Oh, I can't play it because it gets me copyright hit every single time. And also, I don't know, oh, it's not, it's not here, but, oh my god, oh, I have other screenshots on here. Oh my god, oh, memories! Oh my goodness! What, what good memories! Oh my god! One of my Warframe, sh one of my Warframe screenshots! From back in the day! Oh, look at that! With my beautiful Saren. Oh my god. Look at how sexy my Saren was. I, I, I play, I went so hard into Warframe. There's my little mice too. Oh, oh I was so good at Warframe. So... I wanted to, I'll, I'll, this is the last thing I'll do before I go rest, okay? But 
I went really hard into Warframe, okay? To the point that I got so good at Warframe that I would play the Riven market like really hard. So I, I got enough plat, and I did this in WoW too. Two games that I went really hard into to the degree that, um, but but I went, I was like arguably harder into um, into Warframe as far as how good I was at getting money. In, in Warframe, a lot of people will pay very good money for certain rare items in the game. And so I would go and find these items. What I would do is I would pay the premium currency to get, um, uh, un, uh, they're, they're called like, I can't remember what they're called. They're called like unidentified ribbons or something like that. And I would buy them for really cheap on mass. And then I would go and do the challenges to unlock them. I got really good at doing the challenges. There were certain challenges that people hated to do. And so they would sell the ribbons for incredibly low cost. I'm talking pennies. And I would buy them and then I would sell them for dollars. So there was, for example, there was a challenge in um, in uh, one of the ribbons. It, what you would have to do is you would have to shoot two guys um, out of their plane and kill them before they hit the ground. And that was fairly annoying and difficult to do unless you were a fucking ace shooter like me and I would just knock these guys out, brap, 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 take them right out. And so I, those ribbons would sell for nothing. I would go unlock them and then sell them for a ton. And sometimes you'd get really rare ribbons from doing the hard challenges. And so I made tons of money. I would... I took care of both Fawn and my partner Gynotype. I loaded them up with fancy stuff. I had, my Warframe account has so much fancy crap in it. It's actually crazy. Sometimes I miss it. Sometimes I really miss it. I used to play that market so hard. I, I had an account on this uh, Riven Market website. Oh, here's my Neza. Oh my God. Here's my, here's the little femboy dancer character. Not a very good shot though. That's not a great screenshot, but still cool character. Let me see if I have any other cool characters on here. Oh, this is my, oh, what's her name? What's this robot's name? Oh. Oh. What's this character's name? Um Mag no, not Mag. Um The one with the gun. Oh, well, regardless, you can see her. I made her look cool. As you can see, I had a favor. I had, at that time, I had a strong favor favor towards the pale pink, the purple, and the dark pink was what a, I, I did a lot of mine with. Anyway, I really liked Warframe. Unfortunately, Warframe has some critical flaws uh, that make it a game that I will not and do not recommend to anyone. Oh yeah, I also had this guy. This was my Atlas, by the way. Atlas is so cool. He's a boxer. His like his his uh his whole thing is that he's like a stone boxer. So he has like a move set of like punches and he could punch huge rocks at people and then he summons uh these little stone golems that fight for him. Yeah. And I made this one look, he had like blood on his face and blood on his knuckles. Super, and he has these like weird little meat flaps. Super cool. Warframe has such incredible style. It's actually unbelievable. Um, and that's still true, even though it's a really messed up game that has a lot of problems. All right, I can't rant about Warframe all night. Thank you all so much for watching.
Thank you for having a good time with me. I hope you had a wonderful stream with me. I had a great time. And uh, that's all for tonight. I'll see you all very soon. Remember, rule number one, do not fucking die. Good night.